Chapter 1 of The Fall of Troy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fall of Troy by Smyrnanius Quintus. Translated by Arthur S. Way. Born 13 February 1847. Died 25 December 1930. Chapter 1 When godlike Hector by Pleiades slain passed, and the pyre had ravened up his flesh, and earth had veiled his bones, the Trojans then tarried in Priam's city, sore afraid before the might of stout-heart Aeacus' son, as kind they were, that midst the copses shrink from faring forth to meet a lion grim, but in dense thickets terror huddled cower. So in their fortress shivered these to see that mighty man. Of those already dead, they thought, of all whose lives he reft away, as by Scamander's outfall on he rushed, and all that in mid-flight to that high wall he slew, how he quelled Hector, how he held his course round Troy, yea, and of all beside laid low by him since that first day, whereon o'er restless seas he brought the Trojans' doom. Aye, all these they remembered, while they stayed thus in their town, and o'er them anguished grief hovered, dark winged as though that very day all troy with shrieks were crumbling down in fire then from thermodon from broad sweeping streams came clothed upon with beauty of goddesses penthesilea came a thirst indeed for groan resounding battle but yet more fleeing aboard reproach and evil fame lest they of her own folk should rail on her because of her own sister's death for whom ever her sorrows waxed Hippolyte, whom she had struck dead with her mighty spear, not of her will, was at a stag she hurled. So came she to the far-famed land of Troy. Yea, and her warrior spirit pricked her on, of murder's dread pollution thus to cleanse her soul, and with such sacrifice to appease the awful ones, the Arrhenaeus, who in wrath for her slain sister straightway haunted her, unseen, for ever round the sinner's steps they hover. None may escape those goddesses. And with her followed twelve beside, Each one a princess, Hot for war and battle grim, Far famous each, Yet had maidens unto her. Penthesilea far outshone them all. As when in the broad sky amidst the stars The moon rides over all preeminent, When through the thunder clouds the cleaving heavens open, When sleep the fury breathing winds, so peerless was she mid that charging host. Clone was there, Palamusa, Doenoe, Evandra, and Antandre, and Ramusa, Hepothoe, dark-eyed Homothoe, Alcibe, Taramachia, Antebrote, and Thermodosa, glorying with the spear. All these to battle fared with warrior-souled Penthesilea. Even as when descends dawn from Olympus' crest of adamant, Dawn, heart exulting in her radiant steeds amidst the bright-haired hours, and o'er them all, how flawless fair soever these may be, her splendor of beauty glows preeminent. So peerless mid all the Amazons unto Troy town, Penthesilea came. To right, to left, from all sides hurrying thronged the Trojans, greatly marveling when they saw the tireless war god's child, the mailed maid, like to the blessed gods, for in her face glowed beauty glorious and terrible. Her smile was ravishing. Beneath her brows, her love-enkindling eyes shone like two stars, and with the crimson rose of shamefastness bright were her cheeks, and mantled over them unearthly grace with battle prowess clad. Then joyed Troy's folk, despite past agonies, as when, far gazing from a height, the hinds behold a rainbow spanning the wide sea, when they be yearning for the heaven-sent shower, when the parched field be craving for the rain. Then the great sky is at last overgloomed, and men see that fair sign of coming wind and imminent rain, and seeing they are glad, who for their cornfields plate sore sighed before. Even so the sons of Troy, when they beheld there in their land Penthesilea dread, a fire for battle were exceeding glad. For when the heart is thrilled with hope of good, all smart of evil's past is wiped away. So, after all his sighing and his pain, 
gladdened a little while was Priam's soul, as when a man who hath suffered many a pang from blinded eyes, sore longing to behold the light, and, if he may not, fain would die, then at the last, by a cunning leech's skill, or by a god's grace, sees the dawn rose flush, sees the mist rolled back from before his eyes. Yea, though clear vision come not as of old, yet, after all his anguish, joys to have some small relief, albeit the stings of pain prick sharply yet beneath his eyelids. So joyed the old king to see that terrible queen, the shadowy joy of one in anguish whelmed for slain sons. Into his halls he led the maid, and with glad welcome honoured her, as one who greets a daughter to her home returned from a far country in the twentieth year, and set a feast before her, sumptuous as battle-glorious kings who have brought low nations of foes, arrayed in splendour of pomp, with hearts in pride of victory triumphing. And gifts he gave her, costly and fair to see, and pledged him to give many more, so she would save the Trojans from the imminent doom. And she, such deed she promised as no man had hoped for, even to lay Achilles low, to smite the wide host of the Argive men, and cast the brands red flaming on the ships. Ah, fool! But little she knew him, the lord of ashen spears. How far Achilles might in warrior-wasting strife are past her own! But when Andromache, the stately child of King Etion, heard the wild queen's vaunt, lo, to her own soul bitterly murmured she, Ah, hapless! Why with arrogant heart dost thou speak such great swelling words? No strength is thine to grapple in fight with Peleus' all his son. Nay, doom and swift death shall he deal to thee. Alas for thee! What madness thrills thy soul! Fate and the end of death stand hard by thee. Hector was mightier far to wield the spear than thou, yet was for all his prowess slain, slain for the bitter grief of Troy, whose folk the city through looked on him as a god. My glory, and his noble parents' glory, was he yet while he lived. Oh, that the earth over my dead face had been mounded high, or ever through his throat the breath of life followed the cleaving spear. But now I have looked, woe is me, on grief unutterable, when round the city those fleet-foot steeds held him, steeds of Achilles, who made me widowed of mine hero husband, made my portion bitterness through all my days. So spake Etion's lovely ankled child, low to her own soul, thinking on her lord, so evermore the faithful-hearted wife nurseth for her lost love undying grief. Then in swift revolution sweeping round, into the ocean's deep stream sank the sun, and daylight died. So when the banqueters ceased from the wine cups and the goodly feast, then did the handmaiden spread in Priam's hall for Penthesilea dauntless souled the couch, heart cheering, and she laid her down to rest, and slumber, mist-like, overveiled her eyes like sweet dew dropping round. From heaven's blue depths slid down the might of a deceitful dream at palace hest, so that the warrior maid might see it, and become a curse to Troy, and to herself, when strained her soul to meet the whirlwind of the battle. In this wise the trito born, the subtle-souled contrived. Stood o'er the maiden's head that baleful dream, in likeness of her father, kindling her fearlessly front to front to meet in fight, fleet-foot Achilles. And she heard the voice, and all her heart exulted, for she weened that she should on that dawning day achieve a mighty deed in battle's deadly toil. Ah, fool, who trusted for her sorrow a dream out of the sunless land, such as beguiles full off the travel-burdened tribes of men, whispering mocking lies in sleeping years, and to the battle's travail lured her then. But when the dawn rosy ankled, leapt up from her bed, then, clad in mighty strength of spirit, suddenly from her couch uprose Penthesilea. Then did she array her shoulders in those wondrous-fashioned arms given her of the war-god. First she laid beneath her silver-gleaming knees the greaves, fashioned of gold, close clipping the strong limbs. Her rainbow-radiant corslet clasped she then about her, and around her shoulders slung, with glory in her heart, 
the massy brand whose shining length was in a scabbard sheathed of ivory and silver. Next her shield, unearthly splendid, caught she up, whose rim swelled like the young moon's arching chariot rail, when high o'er ocean's fathomless flowing stream she rises, with the space half filled with light betwixt her bowing horns. So did it shine, unutterably fair. Then on her head she settled the bright helmet, overstreamed with a wild mane of golden glistering hairs. So stood she, lapped about with flaming mail, in semblance like the lightning, which the might, the never-wearied might of Zeus, to earth hurleth, what time he showeth forth to men, fury of thunderous roaring rain, or swoop resistless of his shouting host of winds. Then in hot haste, forth of her bower to pass, caught she two javelins in the hand that grasped her shield hand, but her strong right hand laid hold on a huge halberd, sharp of either blade, which terrible Eris gave to Ares' child to be her titan weapon in the strife that raveneth souls of men. <laughs> Laughing for glee thereover, swiftly flashed she forth the ring of towers. Her coming kindled all the sons of Troy to rush into the battle forth which crowneth men with glory. Swiftly all hearkened to her gathering cry, and thronging came, champions, Yea, even such as theretofore shrank back from standing in the ranks of war against Achilles the all-ravager. But she, in pride of triumph on she rode, thrown it on a goodly steed and fleet, the gift of Orathaea, the wild north wind's bride, given to her guest the warrior maid, what time she came to Thrace, a steed whose flying feet could match the harpy's wings. Riding thereon, Penthesilea in her goodly head left the tall palaces of Troy behind and ever were the ghastly-visaged fates thrusting her on into the battle, doomed to be her first against the Greeks, and last. To right, to left, with unreturning feet, the Trojan thousands followed to the fray, the pitiless fray that death-doomed warrior made, followed in throngs, as follow sheep the ram that by the shepherd's art strides before all. So followed they, with battle-fury filled, strong Trojans and wild-hearted Amazons. And like Tritonis seemed she, as she went to meet the giants. Or as flasheth far through war-host, Eris, waker of onset, shouts. So mighty in the Trojans' midst she seemed, Penthesilea of the flying feet. Then unto Cronos' son, Laomedon's child, upraised his hands, his sorrow-burdened hands, turning him toward the sky-encountering fane of Zeus of Ida, who with sleepless eyes looks ever down on Ilium. And he prayed, Father, give ear! Vouchsafe that on this day Achaea's host may fall before the hands of this, our warrior queen, the war-god's child. And do thou bring her back unscathed again unto mine hall. We pray thee, by the love thou bearest to Ares of the fiery heart thy son, Yea, to her also. Is she not most wondrous like the heavenly goddess is? And is she not the child of thine own seed? Pity my stricken heart withal. Thou knowest all the agonies I have suffered in the deaths of dear sons, whom the fates have torn from me by Argive hands in the devouring fight. Compassionate us, while a remnant yet remains of noble Dardanus' blood, while yet the city stands unwasted, let us know from ghastly slaughter and strife one breathing space. So in passionate prayer he spake. Lo, with shrill scream, swift to left an eagle darted by, and in his talons bare a gasping dove. Then round the heart of Priam all the blood was chilled with fear. Lo, to his soul he said, Never shall I see return alive from war, Penthesilea. On that self-same day the fates prepared his boding to fulfill, and his heart break with anguish of despair. Marveled the Argives, far across the plain, seeing the host of Troy charge down upon them, and midst them Penthesilea, Ares' child. These seemed like ravening beasts that mid the hills bring grimly slaughter to fleecy flocks, and she, as a rushing blast of flame she seemed, that maddeneth through the copses summer scorched, when the wind drives it on, and in this wise spake one to other in their mustering host. 
who shall this be who thus can rouse to war the Trojans now that Hector hath been slain? These, who we said, would never more find heart to stand against us. Lo, now suddenly forth they are rushing, madly afire for fight. Sure in their midst some great one kindleth them to battle's toil. Thou verily would say this were a god, of such great deeds he dreams. Go to, with all this courage let us arm our own breast. Let us summon up our might in battle fury. We shall not lack help of gods this day to close in fight with Troy. So cried they, and their flashing battle gear cast they about them. Forth the ships they poured, clad in the rage of fight as with a cloak. Then front to front their battles closed, like beasts of ravin, locked in tangle of gory strife. Clang their bright mail together, clash the spears, the corslets, and the stubborn welded shields and adamant helms. Each stabbed at other's flesh with a fierce brass, was neither ruth nor rest, and all the Trojan soil was crimson red. Then first Penthesilea smote and slew Molion. Now Personius falls, and now Ilius, reeled Antiphius neath her spear. The pride of Lemnos quelled she. Down she bore a palmness neath her horse hooves. Hamion's son died, withered stalwart Alasippus strength. And Doenoe laid low Laogonus, and Clone Menippus, him who sailed long since from Phales, led by his lord Protosilaus to the war with Troy. Then was Pedarses, son of Iphiclus, heart wrung with ruth and wrath to see him lie dead, of all battle comrades best beloved. Swiftly at Clone he hurled, the maid fair as a goddess. Plunged the unswerving lance twixt hip and hip, and rushed the dark blood forth after the spear, and all her bowels gushed out. Then wroth was Penthesilea, through the brawn of his right arm she drave the long spear's point. She shore a twain the great blood-brimming veins, and through the wide gash of the wound the gore spirited, a crimson fountain. With a groan, backward he sprang, his courage wholly quelled by bitter pain, and sorrow and dismay thrilled as he fled his men of Phales. A short while from the fight he reeled aside, and in his friend's arms died in little space. Then with his lance Idominius thrust out, and by the right breast stabbed Bermusa. Stilled for ever was the beating of her heart. She fell, as falls a graceful shafted pine, hewn mid the hills by woodmen. Heavily, sighing through all its boughs, it crashes down. So with a wailing shriek she fell, and death unstrung her every limb, her breathing soul mingled with multitudinous sighing winds. Then... As Evandre through the murderous fray with Thermodosa rushed, stood Moronis, a lion in the path, and slew. His spear right through the heart of one he drave, and one stabbed with a lightning sword thrust twixt the hips, let through the wounds the life, and fled away. Oelius' fiery son smote to Winnie twixt throat and shoulders with his ruthless spear, and on Alcibe Tidius' terrible son swooped, and on Dermachia, Head with neck clean from the shoulders of these twain he shore with ruin reeking brand. Together down fell they, as young calves by the massy axe of brawny flesher felled, that shearing through the sinews of the neck lops life away. So by the hands of Tydeus' son laid low upon the Trojan plains, far, far away from their highland home fell they. Nor these alone died. For the might of Stentalus down on them hurled Cabiris course, who came from Sestos, keen to fight the Argive foe, but never saw his fatherland again. Then was the heart of Paris filled with wrath for a friend slain. Full upon Stentalus aimed he a shaft death winged, yet touched him not, despite his thirst for vengeance. Otherwhere the arrow glanced aside, and carried death whither the stern fates guided its fierce wing, and slew Evenor, brazen tasleted who from Dilichium came to war with Troy. For his death fury kindled was the son of haughty Pylus, as a lion leaps upon the flock, so swiftly rushed he, all shrank huddling back before that terrible man. If Imonus he slew, and Hippasus' son Agalus, from Miletus brought they war against the Danian men, by Nastus led, the godlike, and Aphomachus mighty souled. On Machaele they dwelt, Beside their home rose Latmus' snowy crest, stretched the long glens of branches and Parnomus' water meads. Meander's flood deep rolling swept thereby, 
which from the Phrygian uplands, pastured o'er by myriad flocks, from a thousand forelands curls, swirls, and drives his hurrying ripples on, down to the vine-clad land of Carian men. These mid the storm of battle Megas slew, nor these alone, but whomsoe'er his lance black-shafted touched were dead men, for his breast the glorious Trito born with courage thrilled to bring to all his foes the day of doom. And Polypoetes, dear to Ares, slew Jasaeus, whom the nymph Nia bare to passing wise Theodemus. For these was spread the bed of love, beside the foot of Sapylus the mountain, where the gods made Niobe a stony rock, wherefrom tears ever stream. High up the rugged crag bows as one weeping, weeping waterfalls cry from far echoing Hermes, wailing moan of sympathy. The sky encountering crest of Sapylus, where always floats a mist, hated of shepherds, echo back the cry. Weird marvel seems that rock of Niobe to men that pass with feet fear goaded. There they see the likeness of a woman bowed in depths of anguish sobbing, and her tears drop as she mourns grief stricken endlessly. Yea, thou wouldst say that verily so it was, viewing it from afar. But when hard by thou standest, all the illusion vanishes. And lo, a steep browed rock, a fragment rent from Sapylus. Yet Niobe is there, treeing her weird, the debt of wrath divine, a broken heart in guise of shattered stone. All through the tangle of that desperate fray stalk slaughter and doom. The incarnate onset shout rave through the rolling battle. At her side paced death, the ruthless, and the fearful faces, the fates beside them strode, and in red hands bare murder, and the groans of dying men. That day the beating of full many a heart, Trojan and Argive, was forever stilled, while roared the battle round them, while the fury of Penthesilea fainted not nor fell. But as mid long ridges of lone hills a lioness, stealing down a deep ravine, springs on the kine with lightning leap, a thirst for blood wherein her fierce heart reveleth, so on the Danians leapt that warrior maid, and they, their souls were cowed, backward they shrank, as fast she followed, as a towering surge chases across the thunder-booming sea a flying bark, whose white sails strain beneath the wind's wild buffeting, and all the air maddens with roaring as the rollers crash on the black foreland, looming on the lee, where the long reefs fringe the surf-tormented shores. So chased she, and so dashed the ranks asunder, triumphant souled, and hurled fierce threats before. Ye dogs, this day for outrage unto Priam shall ye pay. No man of you shall from my hands deliver his own life, and win back home to gladden parents' eyes, or comfort wife or children. Ye shall lie dead, ravened on by vultures and by wolves, and none shall heap the earth mound o'er your clay. Where sulketh now the strength of Tydeus' son, and where the might of Aeacus' Scion? Where is Aeas' bulk? Ye vaunt them mightiest men of all your rabble. Ha! They will not dare with me to close in battle, lest I drag forth from their fainting frames their craven souls. Then, heart uplifted, leapt she on the foe, resistless as a tigeress, crashing through ranks upon ranks of archives, smiting now with that huge halberd, massy-headed, now hurling the keen dart, while her battle-horse flashed through the fight, and on his shoulder bare quiver and bow, death speeding close to her hand, if mid that revel of blood she willed to speed the bitter biting shaft. Behind her swept the charging lines of men fleet-footed, friends and brethren of the man who never flinched from close death grapple, Hector, panting all the hot breath of the war-god from their breast, all slaying Danians with the ashen spear, who fell as frost-touched leaves in autumn fall, one after other, or as drops of rain, and I went up a moaning from the earth's breast, all blood bedrenched, and heaped with course on course. Horses pierced through with arrows, or impelled on spears, were snorting forth their last of strength with screaming neighs. 
men with gnashing teeth biting the dust lay gasping while the steeds of trojan charioteers stormed in pursuit trampling the dying mingled with the dead as oxen trample corn in threshing floors then one exulting boasted mid the host of troy beholding penthesilea rush on through the foes array like the black storm that maddens o'er the sea what time the sun allies his might with winter's goat-horned star and thus puffed up with vain hope shouted he o friends in manifest presence down from heaven one of the deathless gods this day hath come to fight the archives all of love of us yea and with sanction of almighty zeus he whose compassion now remembereth haply strong-hearted priam who may boast for his a lineage of immortal blood nay surely she shall be athene or the mighty solino haply eris or the child of leto world-renowned o oh, yea i look to see her hurl mid yon argive men mad shrieking slaughter see her set aflame yon ships wherein they came long years agone bringing us many sorrows yea they came bringing us woes of war intolerable ha to the homeland hellas ne'er shall these with joy return since gods on our side fight in overweening exultation so vaunted a trojan fool he had no vision of ruin onward rushing upon himself and troy and penthesilea self withal for not as yet had any tidings come of that wild fray to aeas stormy souled nor to achilles waster of tower and town but on the grave mound of minoetius son they twain were lying with sad memories of a dear comrade crushed and echoing each one the other's groaning one it was of the blessed gods who still was holding back these from the battle tumult far away till many greeks should fill up the measure of woeful havoc slain by trojan foes and glorious penthesilea who pursued with murderous intent their rifled ranks while ever waxed her valour more and more and waxed her might within her never in vain she hurled the unswerving spear thrust ay she pierced the backs of them that fled the breasts as such as charged to meet her all the long shaft dripped with steaming blood swift were her feet as wind as down she swooped her aweless spirit fell for weariness nor fainted but her might was adamantine the impending doom which roused unto the terrible strife not yet achilles clothed her still with glory still aloof the dread power stood and still would shed splendour of triumph o'er the death ordained but for a little space ere it should quell that maiden neath the hands of aeacus son in darkness ambushed with invisible hand ever it thrust her on and drew her feet destructionward and lit her path to death with glory while she slew foe after foe as when within a dewy garden close longing for its green springtide freshness leaps a heifer and there ranges to and fro when none is by to stay her treading down all its green herbs and all its wealth of bloom devouring greedily this and marring that with trampling feet so reigned she ares child through reeling squadrons of achaea's sons slew these and hunted those in panic rout from troy afar the women marvelling gazed at the maid's battle prowess suddenly a fiery passion for the fray hath seized antimachus daughter neoptolemus wife the Saphone. her heart waxed strong and filled with lust of fight she cried to her fellows all with desperate daring words to spur them on to woeful war by recklessness made strong friends let a heart of valour in our breast awake let us be like our lords who fight with foes for fatherland for babes and us and never pause for breath in that stern strife let us too throne war spirit in our hearts let us too face the fight which favoureth none for we we women be not creatures cast in diverse mould from men to us is given such energy of life as stirs in them eyes have we like to theirs and limbs throughout are we fashioned alike one common light we look on and one common air we breathe with like food we are nourished nay wherein have we been dowered of god more niggardly than men 
then let us shrink not from the fray. See ye not yonder a woman far excelling men in grapple of fight? Yet is her blood nowise akin to ours, nor fighteth she for her own city. For an alien king she warreth of her own heart's prompting, fears the face of no man, for her soul is thrilled with valor, and her spirit invincible. But we, to right, to left, lie woes on woes about our feet. This mourns beloved sons, and that a husband who for hearth and home hath died. Some well for fathers now no more, some grief for brethren and for kinsmen lost. None but hath some share in sorrow's cup. Behind all this a fearful shadow looms, the day of bondage. Therefore flinch ye not from war, O sorrow-laden. Better far to die in battle now, than afterwards hence be held into captivity to alien folk, we and our little ones in the stern grip of fate, leaving behind a burning city and our husbands' graves. So cried she, and with passion for stern war thrilled all those women, and with eager speed they hastened to go forth without the wall, mail-clad, a fire to battle for their town and people. All their spirit was aflame, as when within a hive, when winter tide is over and gone, loud hum the swarming bees, what time they make them ready forth to fare to bright flower pastures, and no more endure to linger there within, but each to other crieth the challenge cry to sally forth. Even so bestirred the women of Troy, and kindled each her sister to the fray. The weaving wool, the distaff far they flung, and two grim weapons stretched their eager hands. And now, without the city, had these died in that wild battle, as their husbands died, and the strong Amazons died, had not one voice of wisdom cried to stay their maddened feet. When, with dissuading words, Theano spake, Wherefore, ah, wherefore to the toil and strain of battle's fearful tumult do ye yearn, infatuate ones? Never your limbs have toiled in conflict yet. In utter ignorance, panting for labor unendurable, ye rush on all unthinking. For your strength can never be as that of Danian men, men trained in deadly battle. Amazons have joyed in ruthless fight, in charging steeds from the beginning. All the toil of men do they endure. And therefore evermore the spirit of the war-god thrills them through. They fall not short of men in anything. Their labor-hardened frames make great their hearts for all achievement. Never faint their knees nor tremble. Rumor speaks their queen to be a daughter of the mighty lord of war. Therefore no woman may compare with her in prowess. If she be a woman, not a god come down in answer to our prayers. Yea, of one blood be all the race of men. Yet unto diverse labors still they turn, and that for each is evermore the best, whereto he bringeth skill of use and want. Therefore do ye from the tumult of the fray hold you aloof, and in your woman's powers before the loom pace ye still to and fro, and war shall be the business of our lords. Lo, a fair issue is their hope. We see the Achaeans falling fast, we see the might of our men waxing ever. Fear is none of evil issue now. The pitiless foe beleaguer not the town. No desperate need is there that women should go forth to war. So cried she, and they hearkened to the words of her who had garnered wisdom from the years. So from afar they watched the fight. But still Penthesilea break the ranks, and still before her quell the Achaeans. Still they found nor screen nor hiding place from imminent death. As bleating goats are by the blood-stained jaws of a grim panther torn, so slain were they. In each man's heart all lust of battle died, and fear alone lived. This way and that fled the panic-stricken. Some to earth had flung their armor from their shoulders, some in dust groveled in terror neath their shields. The steeds fled through the rout, unreined of charioteers. In rapture of triumph charged the Amazons, with groan and scream of agony died the Greeks. Withered their manhood was in that sore strait. Brief was the span of all whom that fierce maid mid the grim jaws of battle overtook. As when, with mighty roaring, bursteth down a storm upon the forest trees, and some uprendeth by the roots, 
and on earth dashes them down, the tall stems blossom crowned, and snappeth some athwart the trunk, and high whirls them through the air, till all confused they lie, a ruin of splintered stems and shattered sprays. So the great Danian host lay, dashed to dust by doom of fate, by Penthesilea's spear. But when the very ships were now at point to be by hands of Trojans set aflame, then battle bider Aeas heard afar the panic cries, and spake to Aeacus' son, Achilles, the air about mine ears is full of multitudinous cries, is full of thunder of battle rolling near our eye. Let us go forth then, ere the Trojans win unto the ships, and make great slaughter there of Argive men, and set the ships aflame. Foulest reproach such thing on thee and me should bring, for it beseems not that the seed of mighty Zeus should shame the sacred blood of hero fathers, who themselves of old with Hercules the battle-eager sailed to Troy, and smote her even at her height of glory when my Amadon was king. Ay, and I ween that our hands even now shall do the like. We too are mighty men. He spake. The aweless strength of Aeacus' son hearkened thereto, for also to his ears by this the roar of bitter battle came. Then hastened both, and donned their warrior gear, all splendor gleaming. Now in these arrayed, facing that stormy tossing bout they stand, loud clash their glorious armor, in their souls a battle fury like the war god's wrath maddened. Such might was breathed into these trained by a tritone, shaker of the shield, as on they pressed. With joy the Argives saw the coming of that mighty twain. They seemed in semblance like Aeolus' giant sons, who in the old time made that haughty vaunt of piling on Olympus' brow the height of Asa, steeply towering, and the crest of sky-encountering Peleon, so to rear a mountain stair for their rebellious rage to scale the highest heaven. Huge as these the sons of Aeacus seemed, as forth they strode to stem the tide of war, a gladsome sight to friends who have fainted for their coming. Now onward they press to crush triumphant foes. Many they slew with their resistless spears. As when two herd-destroying lions come on sheep mid the copses feeding, far from help of shepherds, and in heaps on heaps slay them, till they have drunk into the full of blood, and fill their maws and satiate with flesh, so those destroyers twain slew on, spreading wide havoc through the hosts of Troy. There Diochus and gallant Hylus fell by Aeas slain. Fell Eurynomus, lover of war, and goodly Aeneas died. But Peleus' son burst on the Amazons, smiting Antandre, Palamusa then, Antabrote, fierce-souled Hippothoe, hurling Hippothoe down on sisters slain. Then hard on all their reeling ranks he pressed with Telamon's mighty-hearted son, and now before their hands battalions dense and strong crumbled as weakly and as suddenly as when in mountain folds the forest breaks shrivel before a tempest-driven fire. When battle-eager Penthesilea saw these twain, as through the scourging storm of war like ravening beasts they rushed, to meet them there she sped as when a leopard grim whose mood is deadly, leaps from forest covers forth, lashing her tail on hunters closing round, while these, in armor clad, and putting trust in their long spears, await her lightning leap. So did those warriors twain, with spears upswung, wait Penthesilea. Clang the brazen plates about their shoulders as they moved, and first leapt the long-shafted lance, sped from the hand of goodly Penthesilea. Straight it flew to the shield of Aeacus' son, but glancing thence, this way and that, the shivered fragment sprang as from a rock face, of such temper were the cunning-hearted fire-god's gifts divine. Then in her hand the warrior maid swung up a second javelin, fury-winged, against Aeas, and with fierce words defied the twain. Pa! From mine hand in vain one lance hath leapt, but with this second, look I suddenly to quell the strength and courage of two foes. 
ay though ye vaunt ye mighty men of war amid your danians die ye shall and so lighter shall be the load of war's affliction that lies upon the trojan chariot lords draw nigh come through the press to grips with me so shall ye learn what might wells up in breast of amazons with my blood is mingled war no mortal man begat me but the lord of war insatiate of the battle cry therefore my might is more than any man's with scornful laughter spake she then she hurled her second lance but they in utter scorn laughed now as swiftly flew the shaft and smote the silver greave of aeas and was foiled thereby and all its fury could not scar the flesh within for fate had ordered not that any blade of foes should taste the blood of aeas in the bitter war but he wrecked of the Amazon naught, but turned him thence to rush upon the Trojan host, and left Penthesilea unto Peleus' son alone. For well he knew his heart within, that she, for all her prowers, none the less would cost Achilles' battle toil as light, as effortless as doth the dove the hawk. Then groaned she an angry groan, that she had sped her shafts in vain, and now, with scoffing speech, to her in turn the son of Peleus spake. Woman, with what vain vauntings triumphing hast thou come against us, all athirst to battle with us, who be mightier far than earth-born heroes? We from Kronos' son, the thunder-roller, boast our high descent. Ay, even Hector quelled the battle swift before us, e'en though far away he saw our onrush to battle grim. Yea, my spear slew him for all his might. But thou, thine heart is utterly mad, that thou hast dared to greatly threaten us with death this day. On thee thy latest hour shall swiftly come, is come. Thee not thy sire the war-god now shall pluck out of mine hand, but thou the debt shall pay of a dark doom as when mid mountain folds a pricket meets a lion waster of herds what woman hast thou not heard of the heaps of slain that into xantho's rushing streams were thrust by these mine hands or hast thou heard in vain because the blessed ones have stolen wit and discretion from thee to the end that doom's relentless gulf might gape for thee he spake he swung up in his mighty hand and sped the long spear warrior slaying wrought by chiron and above the right breast pierced the battle-eager maid the red blood leapt forth as a fountain wells and all at once fainted the strength of penthesilea's limbs dropped the great battle-axe from her nerveless hand a mist of darkness overveiled her eyes and anguish thrilled her soul yet even so still she drew difficult breath still dimly saw the hero even now in act to drag her from the swift steed's back confusedly she thought or shall i draw my mighty sword and bide achilles fiery onrush or hastily cast me from my fleet horse down to earth and kneel unto this godlike man and with wild breath promise for ransoming great heaps of brass and gold which pacify the hearts of victors never saw a thirst for blood if so haply the murderous might of aeacus son may hearken and may spare or peradventure may compassionate my youth and vouchsafe me to behold mine home again for oh i long to live so surged the wild thoughts in her but the gods ordained it otherwise even now rushed on in terrible anger peleus son he thrust with sudden spear and on its shaft impelled the body of her tempest-footed steed even as a man in haste to sup might pierce flesh with a spit above the glowing hearth to roast it or as in a mountain glade a hunter sends the shaft of death clear through the body of a stag with such winged speed that the fierce dart leaps forth beyond to plunge into the tall stem of an oak or pine so that death ravening spear of peleus son clear through the goodly steed rushed on and pierced penthesilea straightway fell she down into the dust of earth the arms of death in grace and comeliness fell for naught of shame dishonoured her fair form face down she lay on the long spear outgasping her last breath stretched upon that fleet horse 
as on a couch. Like some tall pine, snapped by the icy mace of Boreas, Earth's forest fosterling, reared by a spring to stately height, Amidst long mountain glens, a glory of Mother Earth. So from the once fleet steed, low fallen, lay Penthesilea, All her shattered strength brought down to this, and all her loveliness. As when on the wide sea, neath buffetings of storm-blast, Castaways whose ship is wrecked escape, a remnant of a crew, For spent with desperate conflict with the cruel sea, Late and at last appears the land hard by, appears a city. Faint and wearied limbed with that grim struggle, Through the surf they strain to land, sore grieving for the good ship lost, And shipmates whom the terrible surge dragged down to nether gloom. So Troyward as they fled from battle, all those Trojans wept for her, The child of the resistless war-god, wept for friends who died in groan-resounding fight. Then over her, with scornful laugh, the son of Peleus vaunted. In the dust lie there, a prey to teeth of dogs, to raven's beaks, thou wretched thing. Who cousin thee to come forth against me? And thoughtest thou to fare home from the war alive, to bear with thee right royal gifts from Priam the old king, thy guerdon for slain Argives? Ta! Twas not the immortals who inspired thee with this thought, who know that I, of heroes mightiest, am the Danians light of safety, but a woe to Trojans and to thee, O evil starred. Nay, but it was the darkness shrouded fates, and thine own folly of soul that pricked thee on to leave the works of women, and to fare to war from which strong men shrink shuddering back. So spake he, and his ashen spear the son of Peleus drew from that swift horse, and from Penthesilea in death's agony. Then steed and rider gasped their lives away, slain by one spear. Now from her head he plucked the helmet, splendor flashing like the beams of the great sun, or Zeus' own glory light. Then, there as fallen in dust and blood she lay, rose like the breaking of the dawn, to view neath dainty penciled brows a lovely face, lovely in death. The Argives thronged around, and all they saw and marvelled, for she seemed like an immortal. In her armor there upon the earth she lay, and seemed the child of Zeus, the tireless huntress Artemis sleeping. What time her feet forwearied are with following lions with her flying shafts over the hills far stretching. She was made a wonder of beauty, even in her death, by Aphrodite glorious crowned the bride of the strong war-god, to the end that he, the noble son of Peleus, might be pierced by the sharp arrow of repentant love. Yea, and Achilles' heart was wrung with love's remorse, to have slain a thing so sweet, who might have borne her home, his queenly bride, to chariot glorious Pythia, for she was flawless, a very daughter of the gods, divinely tall, and most divinely fair. Then Ares' heart was thrilled with grief and rage for his child slain. Straight from Olympus down he darted, swift and bright as thunderbolt, terribly flashing for the mighty hand of Zeus, far leaping o'er the trackless sea, or flaming o'er the land, while shuddereth all wide Olympus as it passeth by. So through the quivering air with heart of flame swooped Ares, armor-clad, soon as he heard the dread doom of his daughter. For the gales, the north wind's fleet-winged daughters, bare to him, as through the wide halls of the sky he strode, the tidings of the maiden's woeful end. Soon as he heard it, like a tempest blast, down to the ridges of Ida leapt he, quaked under his feet the long glens and ravines deep scored, all Ida's torrent beds, and all far-stretching foothills. Now had Ares brought a day of mourning on the Myrmidons, but Zeus himself from far Olympus sent mid shattering thunders terror of levin bolts, which thick and fast leapt through the welkin down before his feet, blazing with fearful flames. 
and ere he saw and knew the stormy threat of the mighty thundering father and he stayed his eager feet now on the very brink of battle's turmoil as when some huge crag thrust from a beetling cliff brow by the winds and torrent rains or lightning lance of zeus leaps like a wild beast and the mountain glens fling back their crashing echoes as it rolls in mad speed on as with resistless swoop of bound on bound it rushes down until it cometh to the levels of the plain and there perforce its stormy flight is stayed so ares battle-eager son of zeus was stayed how loath so e'er for all the gods to the ruler of the blessed needs must yield seeing he sits high throned above them all clothed in his might unspeakable yet still many a wild thought surged through ares soul urging him now to dread the terrible threat of Cronos' wrathful son, and to return heavenward, and now to reck not of his sire, but with Achilles' blood to stain those hands, the battle tireless. At the last his heart remembered how that many and many a son of Zeus himself in many a war had died, nor in their fall had Zeus availed them aught. Therefore he turned him from the Argives, else down smitten by the blasting thunderbolt with titans in the nether gloom had he lain who dared defy the eternal will of zeus then did the eager sons of argos strip with eager haste from corpses strown all round the blood-stained spoils but ever peleus son gazed wild with all regret still gazed on her the strong the beautiful laid in the dust and all his heart was wrung was broken down with sorrowing love, deep, strong as he had known when that beloved friend Patroclus died. Loud jeered Thersites, mocking to his face, Thou sorry-souled Achilles, art not ashamed to let some evil power beguile thy heart to pity a pitiful Amazon, whose furious spirit purposed naught but ill to us and ours? Ha! Woman mad art thou! and thy soul lust for this thing, as she were some lady wise in household ways, with gifts and pure intent for honoured wedlock wooed. Good had it been her spear reached thine heart, the heart that sighs for woman creatures still. Thou carest not, unmanly soul, not thou, for valour's glorious path, when once thine eye lights on a woman. Sorry wretch, where now was all thy goodly prowess, where thy wit? and where the might that should be seem a king all stainless. Dost thou not know what misery this self-same woman madness wrought for Troy? Nothing there is more ruinous for men than lust for woman's beauty. It maketh fools of wise men, but the toil of war attains renown. To him that is a hero indeed, glory of victory, and the war-god's works are sweet. Tis but the battle blencher craves the beauty, and the bed as such as she so railed he long and loud the mighty heart of peleus son leapt into flame of wrath a sudden buffet of his resistless hand smote neath the railer's ear and all his teeth were dashed to the earth he fell upon his face forth of his lips the blood in torrent gushed swift from his body fled the dastard soul of that vile nittering achaea's sons rejoiced thereat for i he wont to rail on each and all with venomous gibes himself a scandal and the shame of all the host then mid the warrior argives cried a voice not good is it for baser men to rail on kings or secretly or openly for wrathful retribution swiftly comes the lady of justice sits on high and she who heapeth woe on woe on humankind even at a punisheth the shameless tongue so mid the danians cried a voice nor yet within the mighty soul of Peleus' son lulled was the storm of wrath, but fiercely he spake. Lie there in dust, thy follies all forgot. Tis not for knaves to bear their betters. Once thou didst provoke Odysseus' steadfast soul, babbling with venomous tongue a thousand gibes, and didst escape with life. But thou hast found the son of Peleus not so patient souled who with one only buffet from his hand unkennels thy dog soul a bitter doom hath swallowed thee by thine old rascalry thy life is sped hence from achaean men and mouth out thy revilings midst the dead 
So spake the valiant-hearted aweless son of Aeacus. But Tydeus' son alone of all the Argives was with anger stirred against Achilles for Thersites slain, seeing these twain were of the selfsame blood, the one proud Tydeus' battle-eager son, the other seed of godlike Agrius. Brother of noble Oneus Agrius was, and Oneus in the Danian land begat Tydeus the battle-eager, son to whom was stalwart Diomedes. Therefore wroth was he for slain Thersites, yea, had raised against the son of Peleus vengeful hands, except the noblest of Achaea's sons had thronged round him, and besought him sore, and held him back therefrom. With Peleus' son they also pleaded, else those mighty twain, the mightiest of all Argives, were at point to close with clash of swords, so stung were they with bitter wrath, yet hearkened they at last to prayers of comrades, and were reconciled. Then of their pity did the Atriad kings, for these two at the imperial loveliness of Penthesilea marvelled, render up her body to the men of Troy, to bear unto the burg of Ilus far renowned with all her armour. For a herald came, asking this boon for Priam. For the king yearned with deep longing of the heart to lay that battle-eager maiden with her arms and with her war-horse in the great earth-mound of old Laomedon. And so he heaped a high broad pyre without the city wall. Upon the height thereof that warrior queen they laid, and costly treasures did they heap around her, all that well beseems to burn around a mighty queen in battle slain. And so the fire god's swift upleaping might, the ravening flame consumed her. All around the people stood on every hand, and quenched the pyre with odorous wine. Then gathered they the bones, and poured sweet ointment over them, and laid them in a casket. Over all shed they the rich fat of a heifer, chief among the herds that grazed on Ida's slope. And, as for a beloved daughter, rang all round the Trojan men's heart-stricken well, as by the stately wall they buried her, on an outstanding tower, beside the bones of old Laomedon, a queen beside a king. This honour for the war-god's sake they rendered, and for Penthesilea's own. And in the plain beside her buried they the Amazons, even all that followed her to battle, and by Argive spears were slain. For Atreus' sons begrudged not these the boon of tear-besprinkled graves, but let their friends, the warrior Trojans, draw their corpses forth, yea, and their own slain also, from amidst the swarth of darts or that grim harvest field. Wrath strikes not at the dead, pitied our foes when life has fled, and left them foes no more. Far across the plain the while, uprose smoke from the pyres whereon the Argives laid the many heroes, overthrown and slain by Trojan hands, what time the sword devoured. And multitudinous lamentation welled over the perished. But above the rest mourned they our brave Podarces, who in fight was no less mighty than his hero brother, Protosilaus, he who long ago fell, slain of Hector. So Podarces now, struck down by Penthesilea's spear, hath cast over all Argive hearts the pall of grief. Wherefore, apart from him, they laid in clay the common throng of slain, but over him, toiling, they heaped an earth mound far descried, in memory of a warrior all is sold. And in a several pit withal, they thrust the niddering Thersites' wretched course. Then to the ships, acclaiming Aeacus' son, returned they all. But when the radiant day had plunged beneath the ocean stream, and night, the holy, overspread the face of earth, then in the rich king Agamemnon's tent feasted the might of Peleus' son, and there sat at the feast those other mighty ones, all through the dark, till rose the dawn divine. End of chapter 1
Chapter 2 of The Fall of Troy by Smyrnanius Quintus Translated by Arthur S. Way Born 13 February 1847 Died 25 December 1930 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. When, o'er the crest of the far-echoing hills, The splendor of the tireless racing sun poured o'er the land, Still in their tents rejoiced Achaea's stalwart sons, and still acclaimed Achilles, the resistless. But in Troy still mourned her people, still from all her towers seaward they strained their gaze. For one great fear gripped all their hearts to see that terrible man at one bound overleap their high-built wall, then smite with the sword all people there within, and burn with fire fanes, palaces, and homes. And old Thymoteus spake to the anguished ones, Friends, I have lost hope. Mine heart seeth not our help or bulwark from the storm of war. Now that the aldous Hector, who was once Troy's mighty champion, is in the dust laid low. Not all his might availed to escape the fates, but overborne he was by Achilles' hands, the hands that would, I verily deem, bear down a god if he defied him to the fight, even as he overthrew this warrior queen, Pethysalea, battle revelling, from whom all of the Argives shrank in fear. Ah, she was marvellous, when at the first I looked on her, meseemed a blessed one from heaven had come down hitherward to bring light to our darkness. Oh, vain hope, vain dream. Go to, let us take counsel what to do were best for us. Or shall we still maintain a hopeless fight against these ruthless foes? Or shall we straightway flee a city doomed? I doomed, for never more may we withstand our dives in fighting field when in the front of battle pitiless Achilles storms. Then spake Laomedon's son, the ancient king. Nay, friend, and all ye other sons of Troy, and ye, our strong war helpers, flinch we not faint-hearted from defence of fatherland. Yet let us go not forth to the city gates to battle with yon foe. Nay, from our towers and from our ramparts let us make defence, till our new champion come, the stormy heart of Memnon. Lo, he cometh, leading on host numberless, Ethiopia's swarthy sons. By this I trow he is nigh unto our gates, for long ago, in sore distress of soul, I sent him urgent summons. Yea, and he promised me, gladly promised me, to come to Troy, and make all end of all our woes. And now I trust he is nigh. Let us endure a little longer then, for better far it is like brave men in the fight to die, and flee and live in shame mid alien folk. So spake the old king, but Polydamus, the prudent hearted, thought not good to war thus endlessly, and spake his patriot reed. If Memnon have, beyond all shadow of doubt, pledged him to thrust dire ruin far from us, then do I gainsay not that we await the coming of that godlike man within our walls. Ah, yet mine heart misgives me, lest, though he with all his warriors come, he come but to his death, and unto thousands more our people not but misery come thereof. For terribly against us leaps the storm of the Achaeans' might. But now go to, let us not flee afar from this our Troy, to wander in some alien land, and there, in the exile's pitiful helplessness, endure all flouts and outrage. Nor in our own land abide we till the storm of Argive war o'erwhelm us. Nay, even now, late though it be, better it were for us to render back unto the Danians Helen and her wealth, even all that glory of women brought with her from Sparta. And add other treasure. Yea, repay it twofold, so to save our Troy and our own souls while yet the spoiler's hand is laid not on our substance, and while yet Troy hath not sunk in gulfs of ravening flame. I pray you, take to heart my counsel, 
none shall while i wot be given to trojan men better than this ah would that long ago hector had hearkened to my pleading when i fain had kept him in the ancient home so spake polydamas the noble and strong and all the listening trojans in their hearts approved yet none dared utter openly the word for all with trembling held in awe their prince and helen though for her sole sake daily they died but on that noble man turned paris and reviled him to his face thou dastard battle ventured polydamus not in thy craven bosom beats a heart that bides the fight but only fear and panic yet dost thou vaunt thee quotha still our best in counsel no man's soul is base as thine go to thyself shrink shivering from the strife cower coward in thine halls but all the rest we men will still go armor girt until we rest from this our truceless war a peace that shall not shame us tis with travail and toil of strenuous war that brave men win renown but flight weak women choose it and young babes thy spirit is like to theirs no wit i trust thee in the day of battle thee the man who maketh faint the hearts of all the host so fiercely he reviled polydamas wrathfully answered for he shrank not he from answering to his face a caitiff hound a reptile fool is he who fawns on men before their faces while his heart is black with malice and when they be gone his tongue backbites them openly polydamas flung back upon the prince his taunt and scoff o oh, thou of living men most mischievous thy valour quotha brings us misery thine heart endures and will endure that strife should have no limit save an utter ruin of fatherland and people for thy sake ne'er may such what with valour craze my soul be mine to cherish wise discretion i a warder that shall keep mine house in peace indignantly he spake and paris found no word to answer him for conscience woke remembrance of all woes he had brought on troy and should bring for his passion fevered heart would rather hail quick death than severance from helen the divinely fair although for her sake was it that the sons of troy even then were gazing from their towers to see the argives and achilles drawing nigh but no long time thereafter came to them memnon the warrior king and brought with him a countless host of swarthy ethiops from all the streets of troy the trojans flocked glad-eyed to gaze on him as seafarers with ruining tempest utterly forspent see through the wide parting clouds the radiance of the eternal wheeling northern wane so joyed the troy folk as they thronged around and more than all laomedon's son for now leapt in his heart a hope that yet the ships might by those ethiop men be burned with fire so giant-like their king was and themselves so huge a host and so athirst for fight therefore with all observance welcomed he the strong son of the lady of the dawn with goodly gifts and with abundant cheer so at the banquet king and hero sat and talked this telling of the Dadian chiefs and all the woes himself had suffered that telling of that strange immortality by the dawn goddess given to his sire telling of the unending flow and ebb of the sea mother of the sacred flood of ocean fathomless rolling of the bounds of earth that wearieth never of her travail of where the sun steeds leap from orient waves telling withal of all his wayfaring from ocean's verge to priam's wall and spurs of ida yea he told how his strong hand smote the great army of the solomy who barred his way whose deed presumptuous brought upon their own heads crushing ruin and woe so told he all that marvellous tale and told of countless tribes and nations seen of him and priam heard 
and ever glowed his heart within him and the old lips answering spake memnon the gods are good who have vouchsafed to me to look upon thine host and thee here in mine halls oh that their grace would so crown this their boon that i might see my foes all thrust to one destruction by thy spears that well may be for marvellous like art thou to some invincible deathless one yea more than any earthly hero wherefore thou i trust shalt hurl wild havoc through their host but now i pray thee for this day do thou cheer at my feast thine heart and with the morn shalt thou go forth to battle worthy of thee then in his hands a chalice deep and wide he raised and memnon in all love he pledged in that huge golden cup a gift of gods for this the cunning godsmith brought to zeus his masterpiece what time the mighty in power to hephaestus gave for bride the cyperian queen and zeus on dardanus his godlike son bestowed it he on erichthonius erichthonius to troas the great of heart gave it and he with all his treasure store bequeathed it to ilus and he gave that wonder to laomedon and he to priam who had thought to leave the same to his own son fate ordered otherwise and memnon clasped his hands about that cup so peerless beautiful and all his heart marvelled and thus he spake unto the king beseems not with great swelling words to vaunt amidst the feast and lavish promises but rather quietly to eat in hall and to devise deeds worthy whether i be brave and strong or whether i be not battle wherein a man's true might is seen shall prove to thee now would i rest nor drink the long night through the battle-eager spirit by measureless wine and lack of sleep is dulled marvelled at him the old king and he said as seems thee good touching the banquet do after thy pleasure i for thou art loath will not constrain thee yea unmeet is it to hold him back who fain would leave the board or hurry from one's halls who fain would stay so is the good old law with all true men then rose that champion from the board and passed thence to his sleep his last and with him went all others from the banquet to their rest and gentle sleep slid down upon them soon but in the halls of zeus the lightning lord feasted the gods the while and chronos son all father of his deep foreknowledge spake amidst them of the issue of the strife be it known unto you all to morn shall bring by yonder war affliction swift and sore for many mighty horses shall ye see and i their host beside their chariots slain and many heroes perishing therefore ye remember these my words howe'er ye grieve for dear ones let none clasp my knees in prayer since even to us relentless are the fates so warned he them which knew before that all should from the battle stand aside howe'er heart wrung that none petitioning for a son or dear one should to olympus vainly come so at that warning of the thunderer the son of chronos all they steeled their hearts to bear and spake no word against their king for in exceeding awe they stood of him yet to their several mansions and their rest with sore hearts went they o'er their deathless eyes the blessing bringer sleep his light veil spread when o'er precipitous crest of mountain walls leapt up broad heaven the bright morning star who rouseth to their toils from slumber sweet the binders of the sheep then his last sleep unclasped the warrior son of her who brings light to the world the child of mist of night now swelled his mighty heart with eagerness to battle with the foe forthright and dawn with most reluctant feet began to climb heaven's broad highway 
Then did the Trojans gird their battle harness on. Then armed themselves the Ethiop men, and all the mingled tribes of those war helpers that from many lands to Priam's aid were gathered. Forth the gates swiftly they rushed, like darkly lowering clouds, which Cronos' son, when storm is rolling up, herdeth together through the welkin wide. Swiftly the whole plain filled. Onward they streamed like harvest-ravening locusts, drifting on in fashion of heavy brooding rain-clouds o'er the wide plains of earth. An irresistible host, bringing wan famine on the sons of men. So in their might and multitude they went. The city streets were all too straight for them. Marching, up soared the dust from underfoot. From far the Argives gazed, and marvelling saw their onrush, but with speed arrayed their limbs in brass, and in the might of Peleus' son put their glad trust. Amidst them rode he on, like to a giant titan, glorying in steeds and chariot, while his armour flashed splendour around in sudden lightning gleams. It was as when the sun from utmost bounds of earth-encompassing ocean comes, and brings light to the world, and flings his splendour wide through heaven, and earth and air laugh all around. So, glorious mid the Argives, Peleus' son rode onward. Mid the Trojans rode the while Memnon the hero, even such to see as Ares, furious-hearted. Onward swept the eager host, arrayed about their lord. Then, in the grapple of war, on either side closed the long lines, Trojan and Danian. But chief in prowers still the Ethiops were. Crash they together, as when surges meet on the wild sea, when, in a day of storm from every quarter, winds to battle rush. Foe hurled at foe the ashen spear, and slew. Screams and death groans went up like roaring fire. As when down thundering torrents shout and rave on pouring seaward, when the maddened rains stream from God's cisterns, when the huddling clouds are hurled against each other ceaselessly, and leaps their fiery breath in flashes forth, so neath the fighter's trampling feet the earth thundered, and leapt the terrible battle yell through the frenzied air, for mad the war cries were. For first fruits of death's harvest, Peleus' son slew Thalius, and Mentus, nobly born. Men of renown, and many a head beside, dashed he to dust. As in his furious swoop a whirlwind shakes dark chasms underground, and earth's foundations crumble and melt away around the deep roots of the shuddering world, so the ranks crumbled in swift doom to the dust before the spear and fury of Peleus' son. But on the other side, the hero child of the dawn goddess slew the Argive men, like to a baleful doom which bringeth down on men a grim and ghastly pestilence. First he slew Pharon, for the bitter spear plunged through his breast, and down on him he hurled goodly Aruthus, battle revellers both, dwellers in Thyrus by Alpha's streams which followed Nestor to the god built burg of Ilium. But when he had laid these low, against the son of Neleus pressed he on, eager to slay. God-like Antilochus strode forth to meet him, sped the long spear's flight, yet missed him, for a little he swerved, but slew his Ethiop comrade, son of Parhasis. Wroth for his fall, against Antilochus he leapt, as leaps a lion mad of mood upon a boar, the beast that flincheth not from fight with man or brute, whose charge is a flash of lightning, so was his swift leap. His foe, Antilochus, caught a huge stone from the ground, hurled, smote him, but unshaken abode his strength, for the strong helm crest fenced his head from death, but rang the morion round his brows. His heart kindled with terrible fury at the blow, more than before, against Antilochus. Like seething cauldron, 
spoiled his maddened might he stabbed for all his cunning offence the son of nestor above the breast the crashing spear plunged to the heart the spot of speediest death then upon all the danians at his fall came grief but anguish stricken was the heart of nestor most of all to see his son slain in his sight for no more bitter pang smiteth the heart of man than when a son perishes and his father sees him die therefore albeit unused to melting mood his soul was torn with agony for the son by black death slain a wild cry hastily to Phasimedes did he send afar hither to me Phasimedes, war renowned help me to thrust back from thy brother's course yea mine hapless son his murderer that so ourselves may render to our dead all dues of mourning if thou flinch for fear no son of mine art thou nor of the line of periclinus who dared withstand hercules self Come to the battle toil, for grim necessity oft times inspires the very coward with courage of despair. Then at his cry that brother's heart was stung with bitter grief. Swift for his help drew nigh Pharius, on whom for his great prince's fall came anguish. Charge these warriors twain to face strong Memnon in the gory strife. As when two hunters mid a forest mountain folds eager to take the prey rush on to meet a wild boar or a bear with hearts of fire to slay him but in furious mood he leaps on them and holds at bay the might of men so swelled the heart of memnon nigh drew they yet vainly essayed to slay him as they hurled the long spears but the lances glanced aside far from his flesh the dawn queen turned them thence yet fell their spears not vainly to the ground the lance of fiery-hearted pharius winged with eager speed dealt death to meges son polymnius laomedon was slain by the wrath of nestor's son for a brother dead the dear one memnon slew in battle rout and whom the slayer's war unwearied hands now stripped of all his brazen battle-gear not recking he of thrasymedes might nor of stout pharius who are unto him but weaklings a great lion seemed he there standing above a heart as jackals they that how so hungry dare not come too nigh but hard thereby the father gazed thereon in agony and cried the rescue cry to other his war comrades for their aid against the foe himself too burned to fight from his war car for yearning for the dead goaded him to the fray beyond his strength ay and himself had been on his dear son laid numbered with the dead had not the voice of memnon stayed him even in act to rush upon him for he reverenced in his heart the white hairs of an age mate of his sire ancient he cried it were my shame to fight with one so much mine elder i am not blind unto honour verily i ween that this was some young warrior when i saw thee facing thus the foe my bold heart hoped for contest worthy of mine hand and spear nay draw thou back afar from battle toil and bitter death go lest bold so e'er i smite thee of sore need nay fall thou not beside thy son against a mightier man fighting lest men with folly thee should charge for folly it is that braves our mastering might he spake and answered him that warrior old nay memnon vain was that last word of thine none would name fool the father who essayed battling with foes for his son's sake to thrust the ruthless slayer back from that dear corpse but ah that my strength were whole in me that thou mightst know my spear now canst thou vaunt proudly enow a young man's heart is bold and light his wit uplifted is thy soul in vain thy speech if in my strength of youth thou hadst met me ta thy friends had not rejoiced for all thy might 
But me a grievous weight of age bows down, Like an old lion, whom a cur may boldly Drive back from the fold, for that he cannot In his wrath's despite maintain his own cause, Being toothless now, and strengthless, And his strong heart tamed by time. So well the springs of olden strength no more in my breast. Yet am I stronger still than many men. My gray hairs yield to few that have within them all the strength of youth. So drew he back a little space, and left lying in the dust his son, since no more lived in the once lithe limbs the old in strength, for the year's weight lay heavy on his head. Back left Thrasymedes likewise, spearmen good and battle-eager Phereus, and the rest their comrades, for that slaughter-dealing man pressed hard on them. As when, from mountains high, a shouting river with wide-echoing din sweeps down its fathomless whirlpool through the gloom, when God, with tumult of mighty storm, hath palled the sky in cloud from verge to verge. When thunders crash all round, when thick and fast gleam lightnings from the huddling clouds, when fields are flooded as the hissing rain descends, and all the air is filled with awful roar of torrents pouring down the hill ravines. So Memnon, toward the shores of Hellespont before him, hurled the Argives, following hard behind them, slaughtering ever. Many a man fell in the dust, and left his life in blood neath Ethiop hands. Stained was the earth with gore, as Danians died, Exalted Memnon's soul, as on the ranks of foemen ever he rushed, And heaped with dead was all the plain of Troy, And still from fight refrained he not. He hoped to be a light of safety unto Troy, And bane to Danians. But all the while stood baleful doom beside him, And spurred on to strife with flattering smile. To right, to left, his stalwart helpers wrought in battle toil, Alcinous and Nicias, and the son of Asius, furious soul, Menecleus' spear, Clydon and Alexippus. Yea, a host eager to chase the foe, men who in fight quick them like men, exulting in their king. Then, as Menecleus on the Danians charged, the son of Neleus slew him. Wroth for his friend, Whole throngs of foes fierce-hearted Memnon slew. As when a hunter midst the mountains drives swift deer with the dark lines of his toils, the eager ring of beaters closing in presses the huddled throng into snares of death. The dogs are wild with joy of the chase, ceaselessly giving tongue, the while his darts leaped winged with death on brocket and on hind. So Memnon slew, and ever slew. His men rejoiced, the while in panic-stricken rout, Before that glorious man the Argives fled. As when from a steep mountain's precipice bough Leaps a huge crag, which all resistless Zeus By stroke of thunderbolt hath hurled from the crest. Crash oakwood copses, echo long ravines, Shudders the forest to its rattle and roar, And flocks therein, and herds and wild things flee, Scattering, as bounding, whirling, it descends with pitiless onrush. So his foes fled from the lightning flash of Memnon's spear. Then to the side of Aeacus' mighty son came Nestor. Anguish for his son he cried, Achilles! Thou great bulwark of the Greeks, slain is my child. The armor of my dead hath Memnon, and I fear me lest his course be cast a prey to dogs. Haste to his help. True friend is he who still remembereth a friend though slain, and grieves for one no more. Achilles heard, and his heart was thrilled with grief. He glanced across the rolling battle, saw Memnon, Saw where in throngs the Argives fell beneath his spear. Forthright he turned away from where the rifted ranks of Troy fell fast before his hands, and, 
Thirsting for the fight, wroth for Antilochus And the others slain, came face to face With Memnon. In his hands That godlike hero caught up from the ground A stone, a boundary mark Twixt the fields of wheat, and hurled. Down on the shield of Peleus' son it crashed. But he, the invincible, shrank not before the huge rock shard, but, thrusting out his long lance, rushed to close with him afoot, for his steed stayed behind the battle rout. On the right shoulder above the shield he smote and staggered him, but he, despite the wound, fought on with heart unquelling. Swiftly he thrust, and pricked with his long spear Achilles' arm. Forth gushed the blood, rejoicing with vain joy to Aeacus' son with arrogant words, he cried, Now shalt thou in thy death fill up, I trow, thy dark doom, overmastered by mine hands. Thou shalt not from this fray escape alive. Fool, wherefore hast thou ruthlessly destroyed Trojans, and vaunted thee the mightiest man of men, a deathless nerid son. Ha! Now thy doom hath found thee. Of birth divine am I, the dawn queen's mighty son, nurtured afar by lily slender Hesperid maids beside the ocean river. Therefore, not from thee, nor from grim battle shrink I knowing well how far my mother goddess doth transcend a nerid, whose child thou vauntest thee. To gods and men my mother bringeth light. On her depends the issue of all things. Works great and glorious in Olympus wrought, whereof comes blessing unto men. But thine, she sits in the barren crypts of brine, she dwells, Glorying mid dumb sea monsters, mid fish, deedless, unseen. Nothing I reck of her, nor rank her with the immortal heavenly ones. In stern rebuke spake Aeacus all his son. Memnon, how wast thou so distraught of wit that thou shouldst face me, and to fight defy me, who in might in blood, in stature far surpass thee. From supremest Zeus I trace my glorious birth, And from the strong sea-god Nerys, Begetter of the maids of the sea, the Nerids, Honoured of the Olympian gods. And chiefest of them all is Thetis, Wise with wisdom world-renowned. For in her bowers she sheltered Dionysus, Chased by might of murderous Lycurgus from the earth, Yea, and the cunning godsmith welcomed she within her mansion, when from heaven he fell. Ay, and the lightning lord once she released from bounds. The all-seeing dwellers in the sky remember all these things, and reverence my mother Thetis in divine Olympus. Ay, that she is a goddess shalt thou know, when to thine heart a brazen spear shall pierce sped by my might patroclus death avenged i on hector and antilochus on thee will i avenge no weakling's friend thou hast slain but why like witless children stand we here babbling our parents fame and our own deeds now is the hour when prowers shall decide then from the sheath he flashed his long keen sword and memnon his and swiftly in fiery fight closed they, and rained the never-ceasing blows upon the bucklers, which, with craft divine, Hephaestus' self had fashioned. Once and again clashed they together, and their cloudy crests touched, mingling all their tossing storm of hair. And Zeus, for that he loved them both, inspired with prowers each, and mightier than their wont he made them made them tireless, nothing like to men but gods, and gloated o'er the twain the queen of strife. In eager fury these thrust swiftly out the spear, with fell intent to reach the throat, twixt buckler rim and helm, thrust many a time and oft. Hard and fast they lunged, 
and on their shoulders clash the arms divine roared to the very heavens the battle shout of warring men of trojans ethiops and argives mighty hearted while the dust rolled up from beneath their feet tossed to the sky in stress of battle travail great and strong as when a mist enshrouds the hills what time roll up the rain clouds and the torrent beds roar as they fill with rushing floods and howls each gorge with fearful voices shepherds quake to see the waters downrush and the mist scream to dear wolves and all the wild fierce things nursed in the wide arms of the forest around the fighters feet the choking dust hung hiding the fair splendour of the sun and darkening all the heaven sore distressed with dust and deadly conflict were the folk then with a sudden hand some blessed one swept the dust pall aside and the gods saw the deadly fates hurling their charging lines together in the unending wrestle locked of that grim conflict saw where never ceased ares from hideous slaughter saw the earth crimsoned all around with rushing streams of blood saw where dark havoc gloated o'er the scene saw the wide plain with corpses heaped even all bounded twixt simois and xanthos where they swept from ida down to hellespont but when long lengthened out the conflict was of those two champions and the might of both in that strong tug and strain was equal matched then gazing from olympus far off heights the gods joyed some in the invincible son of peleus others in the goodly child of old tithonus and the queen of dawn thundered the heavens on high from east to west and roared the sea from verge to verge and rocked the dark earth neath the hero's feet and quaked proud nerus daughters all round thetis thronged in grievous fear for mighty achilles sake and trembled for her son the child of mist as in her chariot through the sky she rode marvelled the daughters of the sun who stood near her round that wondrous splendour ring traced for the race course of the tireless sun by zeus the limit of all nature's life and death the daily round that maketh up the eternal circuit of the rolling years and now amongst the blessed bitter feud had broken out but by behest of zeus the twin fates suddenly stood beside these twain one dark her shadow fell on memnon's heart one bright her radiant haloed peleus son and with a great cry the immortals saw and filled with sorrow they of the one part were they of the other with triumphant joy still in the midst of blood-stained battle rout those heroes fought unknowing of the fates now drawn so nigh but each at the other hurled his whole heart's courage all his bodily might thou hadst said that in the strife of that dread day huge tireless giants or strong titans ward so fiercely blazed the wildfire of their strife now when they clashed with swords now when they leapt hurling huge stones nor would either give back before the hail of blows nor quelled they stood like storm-tormented headlong steadfast clothed with might past words unearthly for the twain alike could boast their lineage of high zeus therefore twixt these eno lengthened out the ever ballad strife while ever they in that grim wrestle strained their uttermost they and their dauntless comrades round their kings with ceaseless fury toiling till their spears stood shivered all in shields of warriors slain and of the fighters woundless none remained but from the limbs streamed down into the dust the blood and sweat of that unresting strain of fight and earth was hidden with the dead as heaven is hidden with clouds when meets the sun the goat-star 
and the shipman dreads the deep. As charge the lines, the snorting chariot steeds trample the dead, as are the myriad leaves ye trample in the woods at entering in of winter, when the autumn tide is past. Still mid the corpses and the blood fought on those glorious sons of gods, nor ever ceased from wrath of fight. But here is, now incline the fatal scales of battle, which no more were equal poised. Beneath the breastbone then of godlike Memnon plunged Achilles' sword. Clear through his body all the dark blue blade leapt. Suddenly snapped the silver cord of life. Down in a pool of blood he fell and clashed his massy armor, and earth rang again. Then turned to flight his comrades, panic-struck, and of his arms the Myrmidon stripped the dead, while fled the Trojans, and Achilles chased, as whirlwind swift and mighty to destroy. Then groaned the dawn, and Paul herself in clouds, and earth was darkened, at their mother's hest, all the light breathings of the dawn took hands, and slid down one long stream of sighing wind to Priam's plain, and floated round the dead, and softly, swiftly caught they up, and bare through silver mist the dawn queen's son, with hearts sore aching for their brother's fall while moaned around them all the air. As on they passed, fell many blood gouts from those pierced limbs down to the earth, and these were made a sign to generations yet to be. The gods gathered them up from many lands, and made thereof a far resounding river, named of all that dwell beneath long Ida's flanks, Paphlagonium, as its waters flow twixt fertile acres, once a year they turn to blood, when comes the woeful day whereon died Memnon. Thence a sick and choking reek steams, thou wouldst say that from a wound unhealed, corrupting humours breathed an evil stench. Ay, so the gods ordained. But now flew on, bearing dawn's mighty sun, the rushing winds, skimming earth's face, and palled about with night. Nor were his Ethiopian comrades left to wander of their king forlorn. A god suddenly winged those eager souls with speed, such as should be theirs for ever, changed to flying fowl, the children of the air. Wailing their king in the wind's track they sped. As when a hunter mid the forest breaks is by a boar or grim-jawed lion slain, and now his sorrowing friends take up the course and bear it, heavy-hearted, and the hounds follow low whimpering, pining for their lord in that disastrous hunting lost, so they left far behind that stricken field of blood, and fast they followed after those swift winds with multitudinous moaning, veiled in mist unearthly. Trojans over all the plain, and Danians marveled, seeing that great host vanishing with their king. All hearts stood still in dumb amazement, but the tireless winds Sighing, set hero Memnon's giant corpse down by the deep flow of Esopus' stream. Where is a fair grove of the bright-haired nymphs? The which round his long barrow afterward, Esopus' daughters planted, screening it with many and manifold trees. And long and loud well those immortals, chanting his renown, the son of the dawn goddess, splendor throned. Now sank the sun, the lady of the morn, 
wailing her dear child from the heavens came down. Twelve maidens, shining tressed, attended her. The warders of the high paths of the sun were ever circling, warders of the night and dawn, and each world ordinance framed of Zeus, around whose mansions everlasting doors from east to west they dance, from west to east, whirling the wheels of harvest-laden years, while rolls the endless round of winter's cold, and flowery spring, and lovely summer-tide, and heavy-clustered autumn. These came down from heaven, for Memnon wailing wild and high, and mourned with these the Pleiades, echoed round far-stretching mountains and a sopish stream. Ceaseless uprose the keen, and in their midst, fallen on her son, and clasping, well the dawn. Dead art thou, my dear, dear child, and thou hast clad thy mother with a pall of grief. O oh, I, now thou art slain, will not endure to light the immortal heavenly ones. No. I will plunge down to the dread depths of the underworld, where thy lone spirit flitteth to and fro, and will to blind night leave earth, sky and sea, till chaos and formless darkness brood o'er all. That Kronos' son may also learn what means anguish of heart, for not less worship worthy than Nerys' child by Zeus's ordinance am I, who look on all things, I, who bring all to their consummation. Recklessly my light Zeus now despiseth, therefore I will pass into the darkness. Let him bring up to Olympus Thetis from the sea, to hold for him light forth to gods and men. My sad soul loveth darkness more than day, lest I pour light upon thy slayer's head. Thus as she cried, the tears ran down her face immortal, like a river brimming eye. Drenched was the dark earth round the course. The night grieved in her daughter's anguish, and the heaven drew over all his stars a veil of mist and cloud of love unto the Lady of Light. Meanwhile, within their walls the Trojan folk for Memnon sorrowed sore, with vain regret, yearning for that lost king and all his host. Nor greatly joyed the Argives, where they lay, camped in the open plain amidst the dead. There, mingled with Achilles' praise, uprose wails for Antilochus, joy clasped hands with grief. All night, in groans and sighs most pitiful, the Dawn Queen lay. A sea of darkness moaned around her. Of the day spring naught she wrecked. She loathed Olympus spaces. At her side, fretted and whinnied still her fleet foot steeds, trampling the strange earth, gazing at their queen grief stricken, yearning for the fiery course. Suddenly, Crashed the thunder of the wrath of Zeus, Rocked round her all the shuddering earth, And on immortal Eos trembling came. Swiftly the dark-skinned Ethiopes from her sight Buried their lord, lamenting. As they wailed unceasingly, The dawn queen, lovely-eyed, Changed them to birds, Sweeping through air around the barrow of the mighty dead. And these still do the tribes of men the Memnons call. And still, with wailing cries, they dart and wheel above their king's tomb. And they scatter dust down on his grave. Still shrill the battle cry in memory of Memnon, each to each. But he, in Hades' mansion, or perchance amid the blessed on the Elysian plain, laugheth. 
divine dawn comforteth her heart beholding them but theirs is toil of strife unending till the weary victors strike the vanquished dead or one and all fill up the measure of their doom around his grave so by command of eos lady of light the swift birds dree their weird but dawn divine now heavenward soared with all the fostering hours who drew her to zeus threshold sorely loath yet conquered by their gentle pleadings such as salve the bitterest grief of broken hearts nor the dawn queen forgot her daily course but quelled before the unbending threat of zeus of whom are all things even all comprised within the encircling sweep of ocean's stream earth and the palace dome of burning stars before her went her pleiad harbingers then she herself flung wide the ethereal gates and scattering spray of splendour flashed there through end of chapter two chapter three of the fall of troy by smyrnanius quintus translated by arthur s way born thirteen february eighteen forty seven died twenty five december nineteen thirty this librivox recording is in the public domain when shone the light of dawn the splendor throned then to the ships the pelian spearmen bore antilochus course sore sighing for their prince and by the Hellespont they buried him with aching hearts. Round him, groaning, stood the battle sons of Argives, all of love for Nestor, shrouded o'er with grief. But that grey hero's heart was nowise crushed by sorrow, for the wise man's soul endures bravely, and cowers not under affliction's stroke. But Peleus' son, wroth by Antilochus, his dear friend, armed for vengeance terrible upon the Trojans, yea, and these withal, despite their dread of mighty Achilles' spear, poured battle-eager forth their gates, for now the fates with courage filled their breast, of whom many were doomed to Hades to descend. Whence there is no return, thrust down by hands of Aeacus' son, who also was foredoomed that day to perish by Priam's wall. Swift meant the fronts of conflict, all the tribes of Troy's host, and the battle-biding Greeks, a fire with that new kindled fury of war. Then through the foe the son of Peleus made wide havoc. All around the earth was drenched with gore, and choked with corpses with the streams of Simois and Xanthus. Still he chased, still slaughtered, even to the city's walls, for panic fell on all the host. And now all had he slain, had dashed the gates to earth, rending them from their hinges, or the bolts hurling himself against them had he snapped, and for the Danians into Priam's burg had made a way, had utterly destroyed that goodly town. But now was Phoebus wroth against him with grim fury, when he saw those countless troops of heroes slain of him. Down from Olympus with a lion leap he came, his quiver on his shoulders lay, and shafts that deal the wounds incurable. Facing Achilles he stood, round him clasped quiver and arrows, blazed with quenchless flame his eyes, and shook the earth beneath his feet. Then, with a terrible shout, the great god cried, so to turn back from war Achilles, awed by the voice divine, and save from death the Trojans. Back from the Trojans, Peleus' son, it seems not that longer thou deal death unto thy foes, lest an Olympian god abase thy pride. But nothing quelled the hero at the voice immortal, for that round him even now hovered the unrelenting fates. He recked not of the god, and shouted his defiance, Phoebus, why dost thou in mine own despite stir me to fight with gods, and wouldst protect the arrogant Trojans? Heretofore hast thou by thy beguiling turned me from the fray, when from destruction thou at first didst save Hector, whereat the Trojans all through Troy exulted. Nay, thou get thee back, Return unto the mansion of the blessed, lest I smite thee, I, immortal though thou be. Then on the god he turned his back, and sped after the Trojans fleeing cityward, and harried still their flight. But wroth at heart, 
Thus Phoebus spake to his indignant soul, Out on this man, he is sense bereft. But now not Zeus himself nor any other power Shall save this madman who defies the gods. From mortal sight he vanished into a cloud, And cloaked with mist a baleful shaft he shot, Which leapt to Achilles' ankle. Sudden pangs with mortal sickness made his whole heart faint. He reeled, and like a tower he fell, That fall smit by a whirlwind When an earthquake cleaves a chasm For rushing blast from underground. So fell the goodly form of Aeacus' son. He glared a murderous glance to right, To left upon the Trojans. And a terrible threat shouted, A threat that could not be fulfilled. Who shot me a stealthy smiting shaft? Let him but dare to meet me face to face. So shall his blood and all his bowels gush out about my spear, And he be hellward sped. I know that none can meet me man to man, And quell in fight of earth-born heroes none, Though such a one should bear within his breast a heart unquelling, And have thews of brass. But dastard still in stealthy ambush lurk for lives of heroes. Let him face me then, I, though he be a god whose anger burns against the Danians, Yea, mine heart forebodes that this my smiter was Apollo, cloaked in deadly darkness. So in days gone by my mother told me how that by his shafts I was to die before the Scaean gates, a piteous death. Her words were not vain words. Then with unflinching hands from out the wound incurable he drew the deadly shaft in agonized pain. Forth gushed the blood, his heart waxed faint beneath the shadow of coming doom. Then, in indignant wrath, he hurled from him the arrow. A sudden gust of wind swept by and caught it up. And, even as he trod Zeus' threshold, to Apollo gave it back. For it beseemed not that a shaft divine, sped forth by an immortal, should be lost. He unto high Olympus swiftly came to the great gathering of immortal gods, where all assembled watched the war of men, these longing for the Trojans' triumph, those for Danian victory. So with diverse wills watched they the strife, the slayers and the slain. Him did the bride of Zeus behold, and straight upbraid with exceeding bitter words. What deed of outrage, Phoebus, hast thou done this day, forgetful of that day whereon to godlike Peleus' spousals gathered all the immortals? Yea, amidst the feasters thou sangest how Thetis silver-footed left the sea's abysses to be Peleus' bride, and as thou harpest all the earth's children came to hearken, beast and birds, high craggy hills, rivers, and all deep-shadowed forest came. All this thou hast forgotten, and hast wrought a ruthless deed, hast slain a godlike man, albeit thou with other gods didst pour the nectar, praying that he might be the son by Thetis given to Peleus. But that prayer thou hast forgotten, favoring the folk of Tyrannus Laomedon, whose kind thou keepest. He, a mortal, did despite to thee the deathless. O oh, thou art wit bereft! Thou favorest Troy, thy sufferings all forgot! Thou wretch! And doth thy false heart know not this? What man is an offense and meriteth its suffering? And who is honored of the gods? Ever Achilles showed us reverence. Yea, was of our race. Ha! But the punishment of Troy I ween shall not be lighter, Though Aeacus' son have fallen, For his son right soon shall come From Skyros to the war To help the Argive men, No less in might than was his sire, A bane to many a foe. But thou, thou for the Trojans Dost not care, but for his valor Envied Peleus' son, Seeing he was the mightiest of men. Thou fool! How wilt thou meet the Nereid's eyes When she shall stand in Zeus's hall Midst the gods, who praised thee once, and loved thee as her own son. So Hera spake in bitterness of soul, upbraiding, but he answered her not a word, of reverence for his mighty father's bride, nor could he lift his eyes to meet her eyes, but sat abashed, aloof from all the gods eternal, while in unforgiving wrath scowled on him the immortals who maintained the Danians' cause, but such as fain would bring triumph to Troy, these with exultant hearts extolled him, hiding it from Hera's eyes, before whose wrath all heaven abiders shrank. But Peleus' son the while forgot not yet war's fury, 
Still in his invincible limbs the hot blood throbbed, and still he longed for fight. Was none of all the Trojans dared draw nigh the stricken hero, but at a distance stood, as round a wounded lion hunters stand mid forest breaks afraid, and, though the shaft stands in his heart, yet faileth not in him his royal courage, but with terrible glare roll his fierce eyes and roar his grimly jaws. So wrath and anguish of his deadly hurt to fury stung Pleiades' soul. But I, his strength ebbed through the god-envenomed wound. Yet leapt he up, and rushed upon the foe, and flashed the lightning of his lance. It slew the goodly Arithion, comrade stout of Hector, through his temples crashing clear. His helm stayed not the long lance fury sped, which leapt there through, and won within the bones the heart of the brain, and spilt his lusty life. Then stabbed neneath the brows Hipponous, even to the eye roots, that the eyeball fell to earth, his soul to Hades flitted forth. Then through the jaw he pierced Alcalthous, and shore away his tongue. In dust he fell, gasping his life out, and the spear had shot out through his ear. These, as they rushed on him, that hero slew, but many a fleer's life he spilt, for in his heart still leapt the blood. But when his limbs grew chill, and ebbed away his spirit, leaning on his spear he stood, while still the Trojans fled in huddled out of panic, and he shouted unto them, Trojan and Dardan cravens, ye shall not even in my death escape my merciless spear, but unto my avenging spirit ye shall pay, I, one and all, destruction's debt. He spake, they heard and quelled, as mid the hills fawns tremble at a lion's deep mouth roar, and terror stricken flee the monster. So the ranks of Trojan chariot lords, the lines of battle helpers drawn from alien lands, quelled at the last shout of Achilles, deemed that he was woundless yet. Yet neath the weight of doom his aweless heart, his mighty limbs at last were o'erborne. Down midst the dead he fell as falls a beetling mountain cliff. Earth rang beneath him, clanged with thunderous crashes arms, as Peleus' son the princely fell. And still his foes with most exceeding dread stared at him, even as when some murderous beast lies slain by shepherds, trembles still the sheep eyeing him, as beside the fold he lies, and shrinking as they pass him far aloof, and, even as he were living, fear him dead. So feared they him, Achilles, now no more. Yet Paris strove to kindle those faint hearts, for his own heart exulted, and he hoped now Peleus' son the Danian strength had fallen, wholly to quench the Argive battle-fire. Friends, if ye help me truly and loyally, let us this day die, slain by Argive men, or live and hell to Troy with Hector's steeds in triumph, Peleus' son thus fallen dead, the steeds that, grieving, yearning for their lord to fight, have borne me since my brother died. Might we with these but hail Achilles slain, glory were this for Hector's horses, yea, for Hector, if in Hades men have sense of righteous retribution. This man I devise but mischief for the sons of Troy, and now Troy's daughters with exultant hearts from all the city streets shall gather round, as pantheresses, wroth for stolen clubs, or lionesses might stand around a man whose craft in hunting vexed them while he lived. So round Achilles, a dead corpse at last. In hurrying throngs Troy's daughters then shall come, in unforgiving, unforgetting hate, for parents' wrath, for husbands slain, for sons, for noble kinsmen. Most of all shall joy my father, and the ancient men whose feet unwillingly are chained within the walls by Eld, if we shall hail him through our gates, and give our foe to fowls of the air for meat. Then they, which feared him theretofore, in haste closed round the corpse of strong Hartiacus' son, Glaucus, Aeneas, battle-famed Agenor, and other cunning men in deadly fight, eager to hail him thence to Ilium, the god-built burg. But Aeas failed him not, Swiftly that godlike man bestrode the dead. Back from the corpse his long lance thrust them all. Yet ceased they not from onslaught, thronging round. Still with swift rushes fought they for the prize. 
one following other like to long-lit bees which hover round their hive in swarms on swarms to drive a man thence but he recking not of all their fury carveth out the combs of nectarous honey harassed sore are they by smoke reek and the robber spite of all ever they dart against him naught cares he so not of all their onslaughts aeas wrecked but first he stabbed agalus in the breast and slew that son of mehion thestor next alcinous he smote agastratus agonippus zorus nessus eurymus the war-renowned who came from like your land with mighty-hearted Clacus, from his home in Malanipion on the mountain ridge, Athena's fane, which Mysakaithon fronts anigh Chaldonia's headland, dreaded sword of scared seafarers, when its lowering crags must needs be double. For his death the blood of fame to Polycus' son was horror-chilled, for this was his dear friend. With one swift thrust he pierced the sevenfold hides of Aeas' shield, yet touched his flesh not, stayed the spearhead was by those thick hides and by the corslet plate which lapped those battle tireless limbs but still from that stern conflict Clocus drew not back burning to vanquish aeas aeacus son and in his folly vaunting threatened him aeas men name thee mightiest man of all the archives hold thee in passing high esteem even as achilles therefore thou i wot by that dead warrior Dead this day shalt lie. So hurled he forth a vain word, Not knowing how far and might above him Was the man whom his spear threatened. Battle by the Aeas darkly, And scornfully glaring on him, said, Thou craven wretch, and knowest thou not this, How much was Hector mightier than thou in warcraft? Yet before my might, my spear he shrank, I with his valour there was blent discretion. Thou, thy thoughts are deathward set, who darest defy me to the battle. Me, a mightier far than thou. Thou canst not say that friendship of our fathers thee shall screen, nor me thy gifts shall wile to let thee pass scatheless from war, as once did Tydeus' son. Though thou didst escape his fury, I will not suffer thee to return alive from war. Ha! And thy many helpers thou dost trust, who with thee, like so many worthless flies, flit around the noble Achilles' corpse. To these, death and black doom shall my swift onset deal. Then on the Trojans this way and that he turned, as mid a long forest glen a lion turns on hounds, and Trojans many and Lycians slew, that came for honour hungry, till he stood mid a wide ring of flinchers, like a shoal of darting fish, when sails into their midst a dolphin or shark, a huge sea fosterling. So shrank they from the might of Telamon's son, as I he charged mid the rout. But still swarmed fighters up, till round Achilles' corpse, to right, to left, lay in dust the slain, countless as boars around a lion at bay, and evermore the strife waxed deadlier. Then to Hippolochus' war-wise son was slain by Aeas of the heart of fire. He fell backward upon Achilles, as falls a sapling on a sturdy mountain oak. So quelled by the spear on Peleus' son he fell. But for his rescue Anchises' stalwart son strove hard, with all his comrades battle fain, and held the course forth, and to sorrowing friends gave it, to bear to Ilium's hallowed burg. Swiftly leapt he back from murderous war, and hastened thence to Troy. There for his healing cunning leeches wrought, who staunched the blood rush, and laid on the gash balms, such as solve war stricken warriors' pangs. But Aeas still fought on, here, there he slew with thrust like lightning flashes his great heart ached sorely for his mighty cousin slain and now the warrior king laertes son fought at his side before him blenched the foe as he smote down piasander's fleetfoot son the warrior meanalus who left his home in far-renowned abydos down on him he hurled atimnius the goodly son whom Pegasus the bright-haired nymph had borne to strong Amethion by Granicus' stream. Dead by his side he laid Orestius' son Proteus, who dwelt neath lofty Ida's folds. 
Ah, never did his mother welcome home that son from war, Panacea, beauty famed. He fell by Odysseus' hands, who spilt the lives of many more, whom his death-hungering spear reached in that fight around the mighty dead. Yet Alcon, son of Megacles, battle-swift, hard by Odysseus' right knee, drave the spear home, and about the glittering greave the blood-dark crimson welled. He recked not of the wound, but was unto his smiter sudden death, for clear through his shield he stabbed him with his spear amidst his battle-fury. To the earth! Backward he dashed him by his giant might and strength of hand, clashed round him in the dust his armor, and his corslet was disdained with crimson life-blood. Forth from flesh and shield the hero plucked the spear of death. The soul followed the lance-head from the body forth, and life forsook its mortal mansion. Then rushed on his comrades in his wounds despite Odysseus, nor from that stern battle-toil refrained him. And by this a mingled host of Danians, eager-hearted, fought around the mighty dead, and many and many a foe slew they with those smooth-shafted ashen spears. Even as the winds drew down upon the ground the flying leaves, when through the forest glades sweep the wild gust, as waneth autumn tide, and the old year is dying, so the spears of dauntless Danians strewed the earth with slain, for loyal to dead Achilles were they all and loyal to hero Aeas to the death. For, like black doom, he blasted the ranks of Troy. Then against Aeas Paris strained his bow, but he was ware thereof, and sped a stone swift to the archer's head. That bolt of death crashed through his crested helm, and darkness closed around him. In dust down he fell, nor availed his shafts their eager lord. But this way and that, scattered in dust, empty his quiver lay flew from his hand the bow. In haste his friends upcaught him from the earth, and Hector's steeds hurried him thence to Troy, scarce drawing breath, and moaning in his pain. Nor left his men the weapons of their lord, but gathered up all from the plain, and bare them to the prince, while Aeas sent after him a wrathful shout. Dog, thou hast scaped the heavy hand of death to-day, but swiftly thy last hour shall come, by some strong Argive's hands, or by my own. But now have I a nobler task at hand, from murder's grip to rescue Achilles' course. Then turned he on the foe, hurling swift doom on such as fought around the Aedes yet. These saw how many yielded up the ghost neath his strong hands, and with hearts failing them for fear, against him could they stand no more. As rascal vultures were they, which the swoop of an eagle, king of birds, scares far away from carcasses of sheep that wolves have torn. So this way, that way, scatter they before the hurtling stones, the sword, the might of Aeas. In utter panic from the war they fled, in huddled rout, like starlings from the swoop of a death-dealing hawk, when, fleeing bane, one drives against another, as they dart all terror huddled in tumultuous flight. So from the war to Priam's burb they fled, wretchedly clad in terror, as a cloak, quelling from mighty Aeas' battle shout, as with hands dripping blood gouts he pursued. Yea, all, one after other had he slain, had they not streamed through the city gates, flung wide, hard panting, pierced to the very heart with fear. Pent there within he left them, as a shepherd leaves folded sheep, and strode back o'er the plain. Yet never touched he with his feet the ground, but I he trod on dead men, arms and blood, for countless corpses lay on that wide stretch, even from the broad wayed Troy to Hellespont, bodies of strong men slain, the spoil of doom, as when the dense stalks of sun-ripened corn fall neath the reaper's hands, and the long swaths heavy with full ears all spread the field, and joys the heart of him who oversees the toil, lord of the harvest. Even so, by baleful havoc overmastered, lay all around face downward, men remembering not the death-denouncing war-shout. But the sons of fair Archaea left their slaughtered foes in dust and blood, unstripped of arms awhile, till they should lay upon the pyre the son of Peleus, 
who in battle's shock had been their banner of victory, charging in his might. So the kings drew him from that stricken field, straining beneath the weight of giant limbs. And with all loving care they bore him on, and laid him in his tent before the ships. And round him gathered that great host, and wailed heart anguished him who had been the Achaean strength. And now, forgotten all the splendor of spears, lay mid the tents by moaning Hellespont, in stature more than human, even as lay Tityos, who sought to force Queen Leto when she fared to Pytho. Swiftly in his wrath Apollo shot, and laid him low, who seemed invincible. In a foul lake of gore there lay he, covering many a root of ground, on the broad earth his mother, and she moaned over her son, of blessed gods aboard, but Lady Leto laughed. So grand of mould, there in the foeman's land lay Aeacus' son, for joy to Trojans, but for endless grief to Achaean men lamenting. Moaned the air with sighing from the abysses of the sea, and passing heavy grew the hearts of all, thinking, Now shall we perish by the hands of Trojans. Then by those dark ships they thought of white-haired fathers left in halls afar, of wives new-wedded, who by the couches cold mourned, waiting, waiting with their tender babes for husbands unreturning. And they groaned in bitterness of soul. A passion of grief came o'er their hearts, they fell upon their faces on the deep sand flung down, And wept as men all comfortless round Peleus' mighty son, And clutched, and plucked out by the roots their hair, And cast upon their faces defiling sand. Their cry was like the cry that goeth up from folk That after battle by their walls are slaughtered, When their maddened foes set fire to a great city, And slay in heaps on heaps her people, And make spoil of all her wealth. So wild and high they wailed beside the sea, Because the Danian's champion, Aeacus' son, Lay, grand in death, by a god's arrow slain, As Ares lay, when she of the mighty father With that huge stone down dashed him on Troy's plain. Ceaselessly wailed the Myrmidon's Achilles, A ring of mourners round the kingly dead. That kind heart, Friend alike to each and all, to no man arrogant, nor hard of mood, but ever tempering strength with courtesy. Then Aeas first, deep groaning, uttered forth his yearning o'er his father's brother's son, God-stricken. I, no man had smitten him of all upon the wide weight earth that dwell. Him glorious Aeas, heavy-hearted, mourned. Now wandering to the tent of Peleus' son, Now cast down all his length, A giant form on the sea-sands, And thus lamented he, Achilles, shield and sword of Argive men, Thou hast died in Troy, From Pythias' plains afar, Smitten unawares by that accursed shaft, Such thing as weakling dastards aim in fight, for none who trust in wielding the great shield, None who for war can skill to set the helm upon his brows, And sway the spear in grip, And cleave the brass about the breast of foes, Warreth with arrows, shrinking from the fray. Not man to man he met thee, who so smote, Else woundless never had he scaped thy lance. But haply Zeus purposed to ruin all, And maketh all our toil and travail vain. I... Now will grant the Trojans victory, Who from Achaea now hath reft her shield. Ah, me! How shall old Peleus in the halls Take up the burden of a mighty grief In his joyless age? His heart shall break at the mere rumor of it. Better so, thus in a moment to forget all pain. But if these evil tidings slay him not, Ah, laden with sore sorrow, Eld shall come upon him, Eating out his heart with grief, by a lone hearth. Peleus, so passing dear once to the blessed, but the gods vouchsafe no perfect happiness to hapless men. So he in grief lamented Peleus' son. 
Then ancient Phoenix made heart-stricken moan, Clasping the noble form of Aeacus' seed, And in wild anguish well the wise of heart. Thou art reft from me, dear child, And cureless pain hast left me. Oh, that upon my face the valling earth had fallen, Ere I saw thy bitter doom! No pang more terrible hath ever stabbed mine heart. No, not that hour of exile when I fled from fatherland and noble parents, fleeing Hellas through, till Peleus welcomed me with gifts, and lord of his Dolopians made me. In his arms thee through his halls one day he bare, and sat upon my knees, and bade me foster thee, his babe, with all love as mine own dear child. I hearkened to him, Blithely didst thou cling about my heart, And babbling wordless speech didst call me father oft, And didst bedew my breast and tunic with thy baby lips. Oft times with soul that laughed for glee I held thee in my arms, For my heart whispered me, This fosterling through life shall care for thee, Staff of thine aid shall be. And that mine hope was for a little while fulfilled, But now thou hast vanished into darkness. And to me is left long a heartache, wild with all regret. Ah, my sorrow slay me, ere the tale to noble Peleus come. When on his ears falleth the heavy tidings, He shall weep and wail without surcease. Most piteous grief we twain for thy sake shall inherit I, Thy sire and I, who, ere our day of doom, Mourning shall go down to the grave for thee. I, better this than life unholpen of thee. So moaned his ever-swelling tide of grief, And Atreus' son beside him mourned and wept, With heart on fire with inly smouldering pain. Thou hast perished, chiefest of the Danian men, Hast perished, and hast left the Achaean host fenceless. Now thou art fallen, they are left an easier prey to foes. Thou hast given joy to Trojans by thy fall, Who dreaded thee as sheep a lion. These with eager hearts even to the ships will bring the battle now. Zeus, father, thou too with deceitful words beguilest mortals. Thou didst promise me that Priam's burg should be destroyed. But now that promise given dost thou not fulfil. But thou didst cheat mine heart. I shall not win the war's goal. Now Achilles is no more. So did he cry heart-anguished, Mourned all round with wails multitudinous for Peleus' son. The dark ships echoed back the voice of grief, And sighed, and sobbed the immeasurable air. And as when long sea-rollers, Driven onward by a great wind, Heave up far out at sea, And strandward sweep with terrible rush, And I, headland and beach, with shattered spray are scourged, and roar unceasingly. So a dread sound rose of moaning of the Danians round the course, ceaselessly wailing Peleus' aweless son. And on their morning soon black night had come, but spake unto Atreides Neleus' son, Nestor, whose own heart bare its load of grief, remembering his own son, Antilochus. O oh, mighty Agamemnon, scepter lord of Argives, from wide shrilling lamentation refrain we for this day. None shall withhold hereafter these from their heart's desire of weeping and lamenting many days. But now go to, from all this Aeacus' son, wash we the foul blood gouts, and lay we him upon a couch. Unseemly it is to shame the dead by leaving them untended long. So counseled Neleus' son, the passing wise. Then hasted he his men, and bade them set cauldrons of cold spring water o'er the flames, and wash the course, and clothe it in vesture fair, sea purple, which his mother gave her son at his first sailing against Troy. With speed they did their lord's command, with loving care, all service meetly rendered, on a couch they laid the mighty fallen, Peleus' son. The Trito born, the passing wise, beheld and pitied him, and showered upon his head ambrosia, which hath virtue eye, 
to keep taintless men say the flesh of warriors slain like softly breathing sleeper dewy fresh she made him over that dead face she drew a stern frown even as when he lay with wrath darkening his grim face clasping his slain friend patroclus and she made his frame to be more massive like a war god to behold and wonder seized the argives as they thronged and saw the image of a living man where all the stately length of peleus son lay on the couch and seemed as though he slept around him all the woeful captive maids whom he had taken for a prey what time he had ravaged hallowed lemnos and scaled the towering crags of thebes etion's town welled as they stood and rent their fair young flesh and smote their breast and from their hearts bemoaned that lord of gentleness and courtesy who honoured even the daughters of his foes and stricken most of all with heart-sick pain Briseis, hero achilles couchmate bowed o'er the dead and tore her fair young flesh with ruthless fingers shrieking her soft breast was reached with gory wheels so cruelly she smote it thou hadst said that crimson blood had dripped on milk yet in her grief's despite her winsome loveliness shone out and grace hung like a veil about her as she welled woe for this grief passing all griefs beside never on me came anguish like to this not when my brethren died my fatherland was wasted like this anguish for thy death thou wast my day my sunlight my sweet life mine hope of good my strong defence from harm dearer than all my beauty yea more dear than my lost parents thou wast all in all to me thou only captive though i be thou tookest from me every bondmaid's task and like a wife didst hold me ah but now me some new achaean master shall bear to fertile sparta or to thirsty argos the bitter cup of thraldom i shall drain severed ah me from thee oh that the earth had veiled my dead face ere i saw thy doom so for slain peleus son did she lament with woeful handmaidens and heart anguished greeks mourning a king a husband never dried her tears were ever to the earth they streamed like sunless water trickling from a rock while rime and snow yet mantle o'er the earth above it yet the frost melts down before the east wind and the flame shafts of the sun now came the sound of that upringing well to nereus daughters dwellers in the depths unfathomed with sore anguish all their hearts were smitten piteously they moaned their cries shivered along the waves of Hellespont. Then with dark mantles over Paul they sped swiftly to where the Argive men were thronged. As rushed their troops up the silver paths of sea, the flood disported round them as they came. With one wild cry they floated up. It rang, a sound as when the fleet-flying cranes forebode a great storm. Moaned the monsters of the deep, plaintively, round that train of mourners fast on they sped to their goal with awesome cry wailing the while their sister's mighty son swiftly from helicon the muses came heart burdened with undying grief for love and honour of the nerid starry-eyed then zeus with courage filled the argive men that eyes of flesh might undismayed behold that glorious gathering of goddesses then those divine ones round achilles course pealed forth with one voice from immortal lips a lamentation rang again the shores of hellespont as rain upon the earth their tears fell round the dead man aeacus son for out of depths of sorrow rose their moan and all the armour yea the tents the ships of that great sorrowing multitude were wet with tears from ever-swelling springs of grief. 
his mother cast upon him, clasping him, and kissed her son's lips, crying through her tears. Now let rosy vesture dawn in heaven exult. Now let broad-flowing Axius exult, and for Astropaeus dead put by his wrath. Let Priam's seed be glad, but I unto Olympus will ascend, and at the feet of everlasting Zeus will cast me, bitterly plaining that he gave me, an unwilling bride unto a man, a man whom joyless eld soon overtook, to whom the fates are near with death for gift. Yet not so much for his lot do I grieve as for Achilles. Zeus promised me to make him glorious in Achaean halls, in recompense for the bridal I so loathed, that into wild wind I changed me, now to water, now in fashion as a bird I was, now as a blast of flame. Nor might a mortal win me for his bride, who seemed all shapes in turn that heaven and earth contain, until the Olympian placed him to bestow a godlike son on me, a lord of war. Yea, in a manner this he did fulfill faithfully, for my son was mightiest of men, but Zeus made brief his span of life unto my sorrow. Therefore up to heaven will I, to Zeus's mansion will I go, and well my son, and will put Zeus to mind of my travail for him and his sons in their sore stress, and sting his soul with shame. So in her wild lament the sea-queen cried. But now to Thetis spake Calliope, she in whose heart was steadfast wisdom throned. From lamentation Thetis now forbear, and do not, in the frenzy of thy grief for thy lost son, provoke to wrath the lord of gods and men. Lo, even sons of Zeus, the thunder king, have perished, overborne by evil fate. Immortal though I be, mine own son Orpheus died, whose magic song drew all the forest trees to follow him, and every craggy rock and river stream and blasts of wind shrill piping stormy breathed, and birds that dart through air on rushing wings. Yet I endured mine heavy sorrow. Gods ought not with anguish grief to vex their souls. Therefore make end of sorrow-stricken well for thy brave child. For to the sons of earth minstrels shall chant his glory and his might by mine and by my sister's inspiration. Unto the end of time. Let not thy soul be crushed by dark grief, Nor do thou lament like those frail mortal women. Knowest thou not that round all men which dwell upon the earth Hovereth irresistible, deadly fate, Who wrecks not even of the gods? Such power she only hath for heritage. Yea, she soon shall destroy gold-wealthy Priam's town, and Trojans many, and Argives doomed to death, whomso she will. No god can stay her hand. So in her wisdom spake Calliope. Then plunged the sun down into ocean's stream, and sable-vestured night came floating up o'er the wide firmament, and brought her boon of sleep to sorrowing mortals. On the sands there slept they, all the Achaean host, with heads bowed neath the burden of calamity. But upon Thetis sleep laid not his hand, still with the deathless Nereids by the sea she sate. On either side the muses spake one after other comfortable words, to make that sorrowing heart forget its pain. But when, with a triumphant laugh, the dawn soared up the sky, and her most radiant light shed over all the Trojans and their king. Then, sorrowing sorely for Achilles still, the Danians woke to weep. Day after day for many days they wept. Around them moaned the far-reaching beaches of the sea, and mourned great Nerus for his daughter Thetis' sake, and mourned with him the other sea-gods all for dead Achilles. Then the Argives gave the corpse of great Pleiades to the flame. A pyre of countless tree-trunks built they up, which, 
all with one mind toiling, from the heights of Ida they brought down. For Atreus' sons sped on the work, and charged them bring thence wood without measure, that consumed with speed might be Achilles' body. All around piled they about the pyre much battle gear of strong men slain, and slew and cast thereon full many goodly sons of Trojan men, and snorting steeds, and mighty bulls withal, and sheep, and fatling swine thereon they cast. And wailing captive maids from coffers brought mantles untold, all cast they on the pyre. Gold heaped they there, and amber, all their hair the Myrmidon shore, and shrouded with the same the body of their king. Briseis laid her own shorn tresses on the corpse, her gift, her last unto her lord. Great jars of oil full many pour they out thereon, with jars of honey and of wine, rich blood of the grape that breathed an odour as of nectar, yea, cast incense-breathing perfumes manifold, marvellous sweet, the precious things put forth by earth, and treasures of the sea divine. Then, when all things were set in readiness about the pyre, all footmen, charioteers, compass that woeful bell, clashing their arms. While from the viewless heights Olympian, Zeus rained down ambrosia on dead Aeacus' son. For honor to the goddess, Nerys' child, he sent to Aeolus Hermes, bidding him to summon the sacred might of his swift winds, for that the corpse of Aeacus' son must now be burned. With speed he went, and Aeolus refused not. The tempestuous north in haste he summoned, and the wild blast of the west. To Troy they sped on their whirlwind wings. Fast in mad onrush, fast across the deep they darted. Roared beneath them as they flew the sea, the land, above crashed thunder-voiced clouds, headlong hurtling through the firmament. Then by decree of Zeus, down on the pyre of slain Achilles, like a charging host swooped they. Up leapt the fire guard's maddening breath, up rose a long well from the Myrmidons. Then through the whirlwind rushes toiled the winds. All day, all night they needs must fan the flames ere that death pyre burned out. Up to the heavens vast volume rolled the smoke. The huge tree trunks groaned, writhing, bursting in the heat, and dropped the dark gray ash all round. So when the winds had tirelessly fulfilled their mighty task, Back to their cave they rode cloud-charioted. Then, when the fire had last of all consumed that hero-king, When all the steeds, the men, slain round the pyre, Had first been raffined up, With all the costly offerings laid around the mighty dead By Achaea's weeping sons, The glowing embers did the Myrmidons quench with wine. Then clear to be discerned were seen his bones, for no wise like the rest were they, but like an ancient giant's. None beside with these were blent, for bulls and steeds and sons of Troy, with all that mingled hecatomb, lay in a wide ring round his course. And he amidst them, flame-devoured, lay there alone. So his companions groaning gathered up his bones, and in a silver casket laid, messy and deep, and banded and bestarred with flashing gold. And Nerys' daughters shed ambrosia over them, and precious nards for honor to Achilles. Fat of kine, and amber honey poured they over all. A golden vase his mother gave, a gift in old time of the wine-god, glorious work of the craftmaster fire-god, in which they laid the casket that enclosed the bones of mighty-souled Achilles. All around the Argives heaped a barrow, a giant sign, Upon a foreland's uttermost end, Beside the Hellespont's deep waters, Wailing loud farewells unto the Myrmidon's hero-king. Nor stayed the immortal steeds of Aeacus' son Tearless beside the ships. 
they also mourned their slain king. Sorely loath were they to abide longer mid mortal men, our Argive steeds, bearing a burden of consuming grief. But fain were they to soar through air, afar from wretched men, over the ocean streams, over the sea queen's caverns, unto where divine Padarje bare that storm foot twain, begotten of the west wind, clarion voiced. Yea, and they had accomplished their desire, but the gods' purpose held them back until from Skyros Isle Achilles' fleetfoot son should come. Him waited they to welcome when he came unto the war host. For the fates, daughters of holy chaos, at their birth had spun the life threads of those deathless foals, even to serve Poseidon first, and then Peleus the dauntless king, Achilles then the invincible, and after these the fourth, the mighty-hearted Neoptolemus, whom after death to the Elysian plain they were to bear, unto the blessed land by Zeus' decree. For which cause, though their hearts were pierced with bitter anguish, they abode still by the ships, with spirits sorrowing for their old lord, and yearning for the new. Then from the surge of heavy plunging seas rose the earth-shaker, no man saw his feet pace up the strand, but suddenly he stood beside the nerid goddesses, and spake to Thetis, yet for Achilles bowed with grief. Refrain from endless mourning for thy son. Not with the dead shall he abide, but dwell with gods, as doth the might of Heracles, and Dionysus ever fair. Not him dread doom shall prison in darkness evermore, nor Hades keep him. To the light of Zeus soon shall he rise, and I will give to him a holy isle for my gift. It lies within the Uxine Sea. There evermore a god thy son shall be. The tribes that dwell around shall as mine own self honor him with incense and with steam of sacrifice. Hush thy laments, vex not thine heart with grief. Then, like a wind-breath, he passed away over the sea when that consoling word was spoken, and a little in her breast revived the spirit of Thetis. And the god brought this to pass thereafter. All the host moved moaning thence, and came unto the ships that brought them o'er from Hellas, then returned to Helicon the Muses. Neath the sea, wailing the dear dead, Neris' daughters sank. End of chapter 3《Chapter 4 of the Fall of Troy by Smyrnanius Quintus Translated by Arthur S. Way Born 13 February 1847, died 25 December 1930. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Nor did the hapless Trojans leave unwept the warrior king Hippolochus' hero son, but laid in front of the Dardanian gate, upon the pyre, that captain war renowned. But him Apollo's self caught swiftly up out of the blazing fire, and to the winds gave him to bear away to Lycia land. And fast and far they bear him, leap the glens of high Talandrus, to a lovely glade, and for a monument above his grave upheaved a granite rock. The nymphs therefrom made gush the hallowed water of a stream, for ever flowing, which the tribes of men still call fair fleeting Glaucus. This the gods wrought for an honor to the Lycian king. But for Achilles still the Argives mourned beside the swift ships. Heart sick were they all with dolorous pain and grief. Each yearned for him as for a son. No eye in that wide host was tearless. But the Trojans with great joy exulted, seeing their sorrow from afar, and the great fire that spake their foe consumed. And thus a vaunting voice amidst them cried, 
Now hath Cronian from his heaven vouchsafed a joy past hope unto our longing eyes, to see Achilles fallen before Troy. Now he is smitten down, the glorious host of Troy, I trow, shall win a breathing space from blood of death and from the murderous fray. Ever his heart devised the Trojans' bane. In his hands maddened I the spear of doom with gore besprent, and none of us that faced him in the fight beheld another dawn. But now, I wot, Achaia's valorous son shall flee unto the galley's shapely proud, since slain Achilles lies. Ah, that the might of Hector still were here, that he might slay the Argives one and all amidst their tents. So in unbridled joy a Trojan cried, but one more wise and prudent answered him. Thou deemest that yon murderous Danian host will straightway get them to the ships, to flee over the misty sea. Nay, still their lust is hot for fight, us will they nowise fear. Still are their left strong battle-eager men, as Aeas, as Tydeus, Atreus' sons. Though dead Achilles be, I still fear these. Oh, that Apollo's silver bow would end them! Then in that day were given to our prayers a breathing space from war and ghastly death. In heaven was dole among the immortal ones, even all that helped the stalwart Danians' cause. In clouds like mountains pile they their veiled heads for grief of soul. But glad those others were who fain would speed Troy to a happy goal. Then unto Cronos' son great Hera spake. Zeus, lightning father, wherefore helpest thou Troy, all forgetful of the fair-haired bride, whom once to Peleus thou didst give to wife, midst Peleon's glens? Thyself didst bring to pass those spousals of a goddess. On that day all we immortals feasted there, and gave gifts passing fair. All this dost thou forget, and hast devised for Hellas heaviest woe. So spake she, but Zeus answered not a word, for pondering there he sat with burdened breast, thinking how soon the Argives should destroy the city of Priam, thinking how himself would visit on the victors ruined dread in war, and on the great sea thunder-voiced. Such thoughts were his, ere long to be fulfilled. Now sank the sun to ocean's fathomless flood, or the dim land of the infinite darkness stole, wherein men gain a little rest from toil. Then by the ships, despite their sorrow, sup the Argives, for ye cannot thrust aside hunger's importunate craving when it comes upon the breast. But straightway heavy and faint lithe limbs become, nor is there remedy until one satisfy this clamorous guest. Therefore these ape the meat of eventide, in grief for Achilles, hard necessity constrained them all. And when they had broken bread, sweet sleep came on them, loosening from their frames care's heavy chain, and quickening strength anew. But when the starry bears had eastward turned their heads, expectant of the uprushing light of Helios, and when woke the queen of dawn, then rose from sleep the stalwart Argive men, purposing for the Trojans' death and doom. Stirred were they like the roughly ridging sea a carrion, or as sudden rippling corn in harvest field, what time the rushing winds of the cloud gathering west sweep over it. So upon the Hellespont's strand the folk were stirred, and to those eager hearts cried Tydeus' son, If we be battle-biders, friends, indeed more fiercely fight we now the hated foe, lest they take heart because Achilles lives no longer. Come, with armor, car, and steed let us beset them. Glory awaits our toil. But battle-eager Aeas, answering, spake, Brave be thy words, and nowise idle talk, Kindling the dauntless Argive men, Whose hearts before were battle-eager To the fight against the Trojan men, O Tydeus' son. But we must needs abide amidst the ships, Till goddess Thetis come forth of the sea, For that her heart is purposed to set here, 
fair athlete prizes for the funeral games. This yesterday she told me, ere she plunged into sea depths. Yea, spake to me apart from other Danians, and I trow, by this her haste hath wrought her nigh. Yon Trojan men, though Peleus' son hath died, shall have small heart for battle, while myself am yet alive, and thou, and noble Atreus' son the king. So spake the mighty son of Telamon, but knew not that a dark and bitter doom for him should follow hard upon those games by fate's contrivance. Answered Tydeus' son, O oh, friend, if Thetis come indeed this day with goodly gifts for her son's funeral games, then bide we by the ships, and keep we here all others. Meet it is to do the will of the immortals, yea, to Achilles too. Though the immortals willed it not, ourselves must render honour grateful to the dead. So spake the battle-eager Tydeus' son, and, lo, the bride of Peleus gliding came forth of the sea like the still breath of dawn, and suddenly was the Argive throng where eager face they waited, some that looked soon to contend in that great athlete strife, and some to joy in seeing the mighty strive. Amidst that gathering, Thetis, sable stoled, set down her prizes. And she summoned forth Achaea's champions, at her hest they came. But first, amidst them all, rose Neleus' son, not his desiring in the strife of fists to toil, nor strain of wrestling, for his arms and all his sinews were with grievous eld outworn, but still his heart and brain were strong. Of all the Achaeans, none could match himself against him in the folk mote's war of words. Yea, even Laertes' glorious son to him ever gave place when men for speech were met. Nor he alone, but even the kingliest of Argives, Agamemnon, lord of spears. Now in their midst he sang the gracious queen of Nerids, sang how she in winsomeness of beauty was of all the sea-maids chief. Well pleased she hearkened. Yet again he sang, Singing of Peleus' bridal of delight, Which all the blessed immortals brought to pass by Pelian crest. Sang of the ambrosial feast, When the swift hours brought in immortal hands Meets not of earth, and heaped in golden morns. Sang how the silver tables were set forth in haste By Themis, blithely laughing, Sang how breathed her fest this purest flame of fire. Sang how the nymphs in golden chalices mingled ambrosia. Sang the ravishing dance twined by the graces' feet. Sang of the chant the muses raised, and how its spell enthralled all mountains, rivers, all the forest brood. How raptured was the infinite firmament, Chiron's fair caverns, yea, the very gods. Such noble strain did Neleus' son pour out into the Argives' eager ears, and they hearkened with ravished souls. Then in their midst he sang once more the imperishable deeds of princely Achilles. All the mighty throng acclaimed him with delight. From that beginning, with fitly chosen words, did he extol the glorious hero. How he voyaged and smote twelve cities, how he marched our leagues on leagues of land, and spoiled eleven. How he slew Telephus, and Etion's might renowned in Thebe. How his spear laid Cygnus low, Poseidon's son, and godlike Polydorus, Troilus the goodly, princely Asteropaeus. And how he dyed with blood the river streams of Xanthos, and with countless corpses choked his murmuring flow. When from the limbs he tore Lycaon's life beside the sounding river, and how he smote down Hector, how he slew Penthesilea, and the godlike son of splendor throned dawn, all this he sang to Argives, which already knew the tale, sang of his giant mould, how no man's strength in fight could stand against him, nor in games where strong men strive for mastery where the swift contend with flying feet or hurrying wheels of chariots, nor in combat panoplied, 
and how in goodly head he far outshone all Danians, and how his bodily might was measureless in the stormy clash of war. Last he prayed heaven that he might see a son like that great sire from Siwa Skyros come. That noble song acclaiming Argives praised. Yea, silver footed Fetty smiled, and gave the singer fleet foot horses, given of old beside Caicus' mouth by Telephus to Achilles, when he healed the torturing wound with that same spear wherewith himself had pierced Telephus' thigh, and thrust the point clear through. These Nestor Neleus' son to his comrades gave, and, glorying in their godlike lord, they led the steeds unto his ships. Then Thetis set amidst the athlete ring ten kine, to be her prizes for the foot-race, and by each ran a fair suckling calf. These the bold might of Peleus' tireless son had driven down from slopes of Ida, prizes of his spear. To strive for these rose up two, victory fain, Terser the first, the son of Telamon, and Aeas of the Locrian archer's chief. These twain with swift hands girded them about with loincloths, reverencing the goddess bride of Peleus and the sea maids, who with her came to behold the Argives' athlete sport. And Atreus' son, lord of all Argive men, showed them the turning goal of that swift course. Then these the queen of rivalry spurred on, as from the starting line like falcons swift they sped away. Long doubtful was the race. Now as the Argives gazed would Aeas' friends shout. Now rang out the answering cheer from friends of Terser. But when their eager speed close on the end they were, then Terser's feet were trammelled by unearthly powers. Some god or demon dashed his foot against the stock of a deep-rooted tamarisk. Sorely wrenched was his left ankle. Round the joint upswelled the veins high-ridged. A great shout rang from all that watched the contest. Aeas darted past exultant, ran his Locrian folk to hail their lord with sudden joy in all their souls. Then to his ships they drave the kine, and cast fodder before them. Eager helpful friends led Terser, halting thence. The leeches drew blood from his foot. Then over it they laid soft shredded linen, ointment smeared, and swathed with smooth bands round, and charmed away the pain. Then swiftly rose two mighty-hearted ones, eager to match their strength in wrestling strain, the son of Tydeus and the giant Aeas. Into the midst they strode, and marvelling gazed the Argives on men shapen like to gods. Then grappled they, like lions, famine-stung, fighting amidst the mountains or a stag, whose strength is even-balanced, no whit less is one than other in their deadly rage. So these, long time in might, were even matched, till Aeas locked his strong hands round the son of Tydeus, straining hard to break his back. But he, with wrestling craft and strength combined, shifted his hip neath Telamon's son, and heaved the giant up, with a side twist wrenched free from Aeas' ankle lock his thigh. And so that with one huge shoulder heaved to earth he threw that mighty champion, and himself came down astride him. Then a mighty shout went up. But battle-stormer Aeas, chafed in mind, sprang up, hot eager to assay again that grim encounter. From his terrible hands he dashed the dust, and challenged furiously with a great voice Tydeus. Not a whit that other quelled, but rushed to close with him. Rolled up the dust in clouds from neath their feet, Hurtling they met like battling mountain bulls that clashed to prove their dauntless strength and spurn the dust, while with their roaring all the hills re echo. In their desperate fury, these dashed their strong heads together, straining long against each other with their massive strength, hard panting in the fierce rage of their strife, while from their mouths dripped foam flakes to the ground. So strained they twain with gravel of brawny hands. Neath that hard grip their backs and sinewy necks cracked, even as when in mountain glades the trees dash storm-tormented boughs together. Off Tydeus clutched at Aeas' brawny thighs, but could not stir his steadfast rooted feet. Oft Aeas hurled his whole weight on him, bowed his shoulders backward, 
strove to press him down, And to new grips their hands were shifting aye. All round the gazing people shouted, Some cheering on glorious Tydeus' son, And some the might of Aeas. Then the giant swung the shoulders of his foe To right, to left, then gripped him neath the waist. With one fierce heave, the giant effort Hurled him like a stone to earth. The floor of Troyland rang again as fell Tydeus. Shouted all the folk, yet leapt he up, All eager to contend with giant Aeas For the third last fall. But Nestor rose and spake unto the twain, From grapple of wrestling noble sons forbear, For all we know that ye be mightiest of Argives Since the great Achilles died. Then these from toil refrained, and from their brows wiped with their hands the plenteous streaming sweat. They kissed each other, and forget their strife. Then Thetis, queen of goddesses, gave to them four handmaidens, and those strong and aweless ones marvelled beholding them, for these surpassed all captive maids in beauty and household skill, save only lovely Tresperseus. These Achilles captive brought from Lesbos' isle, and in their service joyed. The first was made stewardess of the feast, and lady of meats. The second to the feasters poured the wine. The third shed water on their hands thereafter. The fourth bare all away the banquet done. These tidiest son and giant Aeas shared. And, parted two and two, Unto their ship sent they those fair and serviceable ones. Next, for the play of fist, Idomeneus rose, For cunning was he in all athlete lore, But none came forth to meet him, Yielding all to him, the elder born, With reverent awe. So in their midst gave Thetis unto him A chariot and fleet steeds, Which theretofore mighty Patroclus From the ranks of Troy drave, when he slew Sarpedon, seed of Zeus. These unto his henchmen gave Idomeneus to drive unto the ships. Himself remained, still sitting in the glorious athlete ring. Then Phoenix to the stalwart Argives cried, Now to Idomeneus the gods have given a fair prize uncontested, free of toil of mighty arms and shoulders. Honoring the elder born with bloodless victory. But lo, ye younger men, another prize awaiteth the swift play of cunning hands. Step forth then, gladden great Pleiades' soul. He spake, they heard, but each on other looked, and, loath to assay the contest, all sat still. Till Neleus' son rebuked those laggard souls. Friends, it were shame that men should shun the play of clenched hands, Who in that noble sport have skill, Wherein young men delight, which links glory to toil. Ah, that my thews were strong, As when we held King Peleus' funeral feast. I and Acastus, kinsmen joining hands, when I with godlike Polydeuces stood in gauntlet strife, in even balance fray, and when Ancaeus in the wrestler's ring, mightier than all beside, yet feared and shrank from me, and dared not strive with me that day, for that ere then amidst the Apaean men, no battle blenches they, I had vanquished him for all his might, and dashed him to the dust by dead Amaranchus' tomb and thousands round sat marvelling at my prowess and my strength. Therefore against me not a second time raised he his hands, strong wrestler though he were. And so I won an uncontested prize. But now old age is on me, and many griefs. Therefore I bid you, whom it well beseems, to win the prize, for glory crowns the youth who bears away the meed of athlete strife. Stirred by his gallant chiding, a brave man rose, Son of haughty god like Canopius, The man who framed the horse, the bane of Troy, Not long thereafter. None dared meet him now in play of fist, Albeit in deadly craft of war, 
when Ares rusheth through the field, he was not cunning. But for strife of hands, the fair prize uncontested had been won by stout Apeius. Yea, he was at point to bear it thence unto the Achaean ships. But one strode forth to meet him, Theseus' son, the spearman Achimus, the mighty of heart, bearing already on his swift hands girt the hard hide gauntlets, which even our son Agalus on his prince's hands had drawn with courage kindling words. The comrades then of Penopius' princely son for Apeius raised a heartening cheer. He, like a lion, stood forth in the midst, his strong hands gauntleted with bull's hide, hard as horn. Loud rang the cheers from side to side of that great throng to fire the courage of the mighty ones to clash hands in the gory play. Sooth, little spur needed they for their eagerness to fight, but ere they closed, they flashed out proving blows to what if still as theretofore their arms were limber and lithe, unclogged by toil of war. Then faced each other and upraised their hands with ever watching eyes and short quick steps a tiptoe and ever shifting feet each still eluding others crushing might then with a rush they closed like thunder clouds hurled on each other by the tempest blast flashing forth lightnings while the welkin thrills as clash the clouds and hollow roar the winds so neath the hard hide gauntlets clash their jaws down streamed the blood and from their brows the sweat-blood streaked, made on the flushed cheeks crimson bars. Fierce without pause they fought, and never flagged Apeius, but threw all his stormy strength into his onrush. Yet did Theseus' son never lose heart, but baffled the straight blows of those strong hands, and by his fighting craft, flinging them right and left, leapt in, brought home a blow to his eyebrow, cutting to the bone. Even then, with counterstroke, Apeius reached Achimus' temple and hurled him to the ground. Swift he sprang up, and on his stalwart foe rushed, smote his head. As he rushed in again, the other, slightly swerving, sent his left clean to his brow, his right with all his might behind it to his nose. Yet Achimus still warded and struck with all the manifold shifts of fighting craft. But now the Achaeans all bade stop the fight though eager still were both to strive for coveted victory. Then came their henchmen, and the gory gauntlets loosed in haste from those strong hands. Now drew they breath from that great labor, as they bathed their brows with sponges myriad poured. Comrades and friends with pleading words then drew them face to face, and prayed, In friendship straight forget your wrath. So to their comrades' suasion hearkened they. For wise men ever bear a placable mind. They kissed each other, and their hearts forget that bitter strife. Then Thetis, sable stoled, gave to their glad hands two great silver bowls, the which Unius, Jason's warrior son, in Siwas Lemnos to Achilles gave, to ransom strong Lycaon from his hands. These had Hephaestus fashioned for his gift to glorious Dionysus, when he brought his bride divine to Olympus, Minos' child, far famous, whom in the sea-washed Dia's isle Theseus unwitting left. The wine-god brimmed with nectar these, and gave them to his son, and Thoas, at his death to Hypsipyle, with great possessions left them. She bequeathed the bowls to her godlike son, who gave them up unto Achilles for Lycaon's life. The one the son of lordly Theseus took, and goodly Epius sent to his ships with joy the other. Then their bruises and their scars did Pavalirius tend with loving care. First pressed he out black humours, then his hands deftly knit up the gashes. Salves he laid thereover, given him by his sire of old, such as had virtue in one day to heal the deadliest hurts, yea, seeming cureless wounds. Straight was the smartest sage, and healed the scars upon their brows and neath their clustering hair. Then for the archery test Oleus' son stood forth with Tercer, they which in the race erewhile contended. Far away from these, Agamemnon, lord of spears, set up a helm crested with plumes, and spake, 
The master shot is that which shears the hair crest clean away. Then straightway Aias shot his arrow first, and smote the helm ridge. Sharply rang the brass. Then Tursa second, with most earnest heed shot. The swift shaft hath shorn the plume away. Loud shouted all the people as they gazed, and praised him without stint. For still his foot halted in pain, yet nowise marred his aims when with his hands he sped the flying shaft. Then Peleus' bride gave unto him the arms of godlike Troilus, the goodliest of all fair sons whom Hecuba had borne in hallowed Troy. Yet of his goodly head no joy she had. The prowess and the spear of fell Achilles reft his life from him, as when a gardener with a new-wetted scythe mows down, ere it may seed, a blade of corn or poppy, in a garden dewy fresh and blossom flushed, which by a watercourse crowdeth its blooms, mows it ere it may reach its goal of bringing offspring to the birth, and with his scythe sweep makes its life work vain and barren of all issue, never more now to be fostered by the dews of spring. So did Pleiades cut down Priam's son, the godlike beautiful, the beardless yet, and virgin of a bride, almost a child. Yet the destroyer fate lured him on to war, upon the threshold of glad youth, when youth is bold, and the heart feels no void. Forthwith a bar of iron, massy and long, from the swift-speeding hand did many a say to hurl. But not an Argive could prevail to cast that ponderous mass. Aeas alone sped it from his strong hand, as in the time of harvest might a reaper fling from him a dry oak bough when all the fields are parched. And all men marvelled to behold how far flew from his hand the bronze which scarce two men hard straining had uplifted from the ground. Even this Antaeus might was wont to hurl erstwhile ere the strong hands of Hercules o'ermastered him. This, with much spoil beside, Hercules took, and kept it to make sport for his invincible hand, but afterward gave it to valiant Peleus, who with him had smitten fair-towered Ilium's burg renowned. And he to Achilles gave it, whose swift ships bare it to Troy, to put him high in mind of his own father, as with eager will he fought the stalwart Trojans, and to be a worthy test wherewith to prove his strength. Even this did Aeas from his brawny hand fling far. So then the Nered gave to him the glorious arms from godlike Memnon stripped. Marvelling the Argives gazed on them. They were a giant's war gear. Laughing a glad laugh that man renowned received them. He alone could wear them on his brawny limbs. They seemed as they had been moulded to his frame, the great bar thence he bore withal to be his joy when he was fain of athlete toil. Still sped the contest on, and many rose now for the leaping. Far beyond the marks of all the rest, brave Agapenor sprang. Loud shouted all for that victorious leap. And Thetis gave him the fair battle gear of mighty Cygnus, who had smitten first Protesilaus that had reft the life from many more, till Peleus' son slew him, first of the chiefs of brief and shrouded Troy. Next, in the javelin cast, Euryalus hurled far beyond all rivals, while the folk shouted aloud, no archer, so they deemed, could speed a winged shaft farther than his cast. Therefore the Aeacid hero's mother gave to him a deep, wide silver oil flask, tamed by Achilles in possession when his spear slew Minius, and he spoiled Larnessus' wealth. Then fiery-hearted Aeas eagerly rose, challenging to strife of hands and feet the mightiest hero there. But marvelling, they marked his mighty thews, and no man dared confront him. Chilling dread had palsied all their courage. From their hearts they feared him, lest his hands invincible should all to break his adversary's face, and naught but pain be that man's need. But at the last all men made signs for battle by her Euryalus, for well they knew him skilled in fighting craft. But he too feared that giant, and he cried, Friends, any other Achaean whom ye will, 
blithe will I face, but mighty Aias, no, far doth he overmatch me. He will rend mine heart if in the onset anger rise within him. From his hands invincible I trow I should not win to the ships alive. Loud laughed they all, but glowed with triumph joy the heart of Aias. Gleaming talents twain of silver he from Thetis' hands received, his uncontested prize. His stately height called to her mind her dear son, and she sighed. They which had skill at chariot driving then rose at the contest summons eagerly. Menelaus first, Eurypylus bold in fight, Eumelus, Thoas, godlike Poepoetes, harnessed their steeds and led them to the cars all panting for the joy of victory. Then rode they in glittering chariot rank out to one place, to a stretch of sand, and stood ranged at the starting line. The reins they grasped in strong hands quickly, while the chariot steeds shoulder to shoulder fretted, all afire to take the lead at starting, pawed the sand, pricked ears, and o'er their frontlets flung the foam. With sudden stiffened sinews those car lords lashed with their whips the tempest footed steeds. Then, swift as harpies, sprang they forth. They strained furiously at the harness, onward whirling, the chariots bounding ever from the earth. Thou couldst not see a wheel track, no, nor print of hoof upon the sand. They verily flew. Up from the plain the dust clouds to the sky soared, like the smoke of burning, or a mist rolled round the mountain forelands by the might of a dark south wind or the west, when wakes a tempest, when the hillsides stream with rain. Burst to the front Eumelius' steeds, behind close pressed the team of godlike Thoas, shouts still lancered shouts that cheered each chariot, while onward they swept across the wide wayed plain. Section of Manuscript Missing From hallowed Ellis, when he had achieved a mighty triumph, in that he outstripped the swift ear of Oanomaeus, evil soul, the ruthless slayer of youths, who sought to wed his daughter Hippodomeia, passing wise. Yet even he, for all his chariot lore, had no such fleet-foot steeds as Atreus' son. Far slower. The wind is in the feet of these. So spake he, giving glory to the might of those good steeds, and to Atreides' self. And filled with joy was Menelaus' soul. Straightway his henchmen from the yoked bands loose the panting team, and all those chariot lords who in the race had striven now unyoked their tempest-footed steeds. Podalerius then hastened to spread salves over all the wounds of Thoas and Eurypylus. Gashes scored upon their frames when from the cars they fell. But Menelaus, with exceeding joy of victory, glowed when Thetis, lovely tressed, gave him a golden cup, the chief possession once of Etion the godlike ere Achilles spoiled the far-famed burg of Thebes. Then horsemen, riding up on horses, came down to the course. They grasped in hand the whip, and bounding from the earth, bestrode their steeds, the while with foaming mouths the courses champed the bits and pawed the ground, and fretted high to dash into the course. Forth from the line swiftly they darted, eager for the strife, wild as the blast of roaring Boreas, or shouting notice, when with hurricane swoop he heaves the wide sea high, when in the east uprises the disastrous altar-star, bringing calamity to seafarers. So swift they rushed, spurning with flying feet the deep dust on the plain. The riders cried, each to his steed, and ever plied the lash, and shook the reins about the clashing bits. On strained the horses, from the people rose a shouting, like the roaring of a sea. On, on across the level plain they flew, and now the flashing-footed Argive steed by Stentalus bestridden had won the race, but from the course he swerved, and o'er the plain once and again rushed wide. Nor Capania's son, good horseman though he were, could turn him back by rein or whip, because that steed was strained still to the race-course. Yet of lineage noble was he, for in his veins the blood of swift Arion ran, the foal begotten by the loud piping west wind upon a harpy, the fleetest of all earth-born steeds, whose feet could race against his father's swiftest blast. Him did the blessed to address us give, and from him sprang the steed of Stentalus, which Tydeus' son had given unto his friend in hallowed Troyland. 
filled with confidence in those swift feet his rider led him forth unto the contest of the steeds that day looking his horsemanship should surely win renown yet victory gladdened not his heart in that great struggle for achilles prizes nay swift albeit he was the king of men by skill outraced him shouted all the folk glory to agamemnon yet they acclaimed the steed of valiant stentilus and his lord for that the fiery flying of his feet still won him second place albeit oft wide of the course he swerved then thetis gave to atreus son while laughed his lips for joy god sprung polydorus breastplate silver wrought to stentilus astropaeus massy helm two lances and a taslet strong she gave yea and to all the riders who that day came at achilles funeral feast to strive she gave gifts but the son of the old warlord laertes inly grieved to be withheld from contest of the strong how fain soe'er by that sore wound which alcon dealt to him in the grim fight around dead aeacus son end of chapter four Chapter Five of the Fall of Troy by Smyrnanius Quintus, translated by Arthur S. Way, born thirteen February eighteen forty seven, died twenty five December nineteen thirty. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. So when all other contest had an end, Thetis the goddess laid down in the midst great souled Achilles' arms, divinely wrought and all around flashed out the cunning work wherewith the fire-god overchased the shield fashioned for aeacus son the dauntless soul inwrought upon that labour of a god were first high heaven and cloudland and beneath lay earth and sea the winds the clouds were there the moon and sun each in its several place there too were all the stars that fixed in heaven are born in its eternal circlings round above and through all was the infinite air where to and fro flit birds of slender beak thou hadst said they lived and floated on the breeze here tetis all embracing arms were wrought and ocean's fathomless flow the outrushing flood of rivers crying to the echoing hills all round to right to left rolled o'er the land round it rose league-long mountain ridges haunts of terrible lions and foul jackals there fierce bears and panthers prowled with these were seen wild boars that whetted deadly clashing tusks in grimly frothing jaws there hunters sped after the hounds beaters with stone and dart to the life portrayed toiled in the woodland sport and there were man-devouring wars and all the horrors of fight slain men were falling down mid horse hooves and the likeness of the plain blood drenched was on that shield invincible panic was there and dread and ghastly eno with limbs all gore besplattered hideously and deadly strife and the avenging spirits fierce-hearted she still goading warriors on to the onset they outbreathing breath of fire around them hover the relentless fates beside them battle incarnate onward pressed yelling and from their limbs streamed blood and sweat there were the ruthless gorgons through their hair horrible serpents coiled with flickering tongues a measureless marvel was that cunning work of things that made men shudder to behold seeming as though they verily lived and moved and while here all war's marvels were portrayed yonder all the works of lovely peace the myriad tribes of much enduring men dwelt in fair cities Justice watched o'er all. To diverse toils they set their hands. The fields were harvest laden. Earth her increase bore. Most steeply rose on that god labored work the rugged flanks of holy honors mount. And there upon a palm tree throned she sat, exalted, and her hands reached up to heaven. All round her, paths broken by many rocks thwarted the climber's feet. By those steep tracks daunted ye saw returning many folk, few won by sweat of toil the sacred height. And there were reapers, moving down long swaths, swinging the wetted sickles. 
Neath their hands the hot work sped to its close. Hard after these, many sheaf-binders followed, and the work grew passing great. With yoke bands on their necks, oxen were there, whereof some drew the wains heaped high with foliage sheaths, and further on were others ploughing, and the gelb showed black behind them. Youths with ever busy goads followed. A world of toil was there portrayed. And there a banquet was, with pipe and harp, dances of maids, and flashing feet of boys, all in swift movement, like to living souls. Hard by the dance and its sweet winsomeness out of the sea was rising lovely crowned Cyprus, foam blossoms still upon her hair, and round her hovered, smiling witchingly, desire, and danced the graces lovely tressed. And there were lordly Neris' daughters shown, leading their sister up from the wide sea to her espousals with the warrior king. And round her all the immortals banqueted on Pelion's ridge far-stretching. All about lush dewy water-meads there were, bestarred with flowers innumerable, grassy groves, and springs with clear transparent water bright. There ships with sighing sheets swept o'er the sea, some beating up to windward, some that sped before a following wind, and round them heaved the melancholy surge. Seared shipmen rushed this way and that, a dreadful tempest gust, hauling the white sails in to scape the death. It all seemed real, some tugging at the oars, while the dark sea on either side the ship grew hoary neath the swiftly plashing blades. And there, triumphant, the earth-shaker rode amid sea monsters. Stormy-footed steeds drew him, and seemed alive, as o'er the deep they raced, off smitten by the golden whip. Around their path of flight the waves fell smooth, and all before them was unrippled calm. Dolphins on either hand about their king swarmed, in wild rapture of homage, bowing backs, and seemed like live things o'er the hazy sea swimming, albeit of silver wrought. Marvels of untold craft were imaged there by cunning soul to Festus' deathless hands upon the shield. An ocean's fathomless flood clasped like a garland all the outer rim, and compassed all the strong shield's curious work. And there beside the massy helm lay. Zeus in his wrath was set upon the crest, thrown in on heaven's dome. The immortals all around, fierce battling with the titans, fought for Zeus. Already were their foes enwrapped with flame, for thick and fast as snowflakes poured from heaven the thunderbolts. The might of Zeus was roused, and burning giants seemed to breathe out flames. And there beside the fair strong corslet lay, unpierceable, which clasped Pleiades once. There were the greaves close lapping, light alone to Achilles, massy of mould and huge they were. And hard by flashed the sword, whose edge and point no male could turn, with golden belt, and sheath of silver, and with haft of ivory, brightest among those wondrous arms it shone. Stretched on the earth thereby was that dread spear, long as the tall tressed pines of Pelion, still breathing out the reek of Hector's blood. Then mid the Argives Thetis, sable stoled in her deep sorrow for Achilles' spake. Now all the athlete prizes have been won which I set forth in sorrow for my child. Now let that mightiest of Argives come, who rescued from the foe my dead. To him these glorious immortal arms I give, which even the blessed deathless joyed to see. Then rose in rivalry, each claiming them, Laertes' seed and godlike Telamon's son, Aeas, the mightiest far of Danian men. He seemed the star that in the glittering sky outshines the host of heaven, Hesperus, so splendid by Pleiades' arms he stood. And let these judge, he cried, Idomeneus, Nestor, and kingly counseled Agamemnon. For these he weened would surelyest know the truth of deeds wrought in that glorious battle toil. To these I also trust most utterly, Odysseus said, for prudent of their wit be these, and princeliest of all Danian men. But to Idomeneus and Atreus' son spake Nestor apart, and willingly they heard. Friends, 
the great woe and unendurable this day the careless gods have laid on us in that into this lamentable strife aias the mighty hath been thrust by them against odysseus passing wise for he to whitsoe'er god gives the victor's glory oh yea he shall rejoice but he that loseth all for the grief in all the danaeans hearts for him and ours shall be the deepest grief of all for that man will not in the war stand by us as of old a sorrowful day it shall be for us whitsoe'er of these shall break into fierce anger seeing they are of our heroes chiefest this in war and that in council hearken then to me seeing i am older far than ye not by a few years only with mine age is prudence join for i have suffered and wrought much and in council ever the old man who knoweth much excelleth younger men therefore let us ordain to judge this cause twixt godlike aeas and warfane odysseus our trojan captives they shall say who most our foes dread and who saved pleiades course from that most deadly fight lo in our midst be many spear won trojans thralls of faith and these will pass true judgment on these twain to neither showing favour since they hate alike all authors of their misery he spake replied agamemnon lord of spears ancient there is none other in our midst wiser than thou of danians young or old in that thou sayest the unforgiving wrath will burn in him to whom the gods herein deny the victory for these which strive are both our chiefest therefore mine heart too is set on this that to the thralls of war this judgment we commit the loser then shall against troy devise his deadly work of vengeance and shall not be wroth with us he spake and these three being of one mind in hearing of all men refused to judge judgment so thankless they would none of it therefore they set the high-born sons of troy there in the midst spear thralls although they were to give just judgment in the warrior strife then in hot anger aias rose and spake odysseus frantic soul why hath a god deluded thee to make thee hold thyself my peer in might invincible darest thou say that thou when slain achilles lay in dust when round him swarmed the trojans didst bear back that furious throng when i amidst them hurled death and thou cowardest away thy dam bear thee a craven and a weakling wretch frail in comparison of me as is a cur beside a lion thunder-voiced no battle-biding heart is in thy breast but wiles and treachery be all thy care thou hast forgotten how thou didst shrink back from faring with achaea's gathered host to ilium's holy burg till atreus sons forced thee the cowering craven how loath so e'er to follow them would god thou hadst never come for by thy counsel we left in lemnos isle groaning in agony peoeus son renowned not for him alone was ruin devised of thee for godlike palamedes too didst thou contrive destruction ha he was alike in battle and council better than thou and now thou darest rise up against me neither remembering my kindness nor having respect unto the mightier man who rescued thee erewhile when thou didst quaff in fight before the onset of thy foes when thou forsaken of all greeks beside midst tumult of the fray was fleeing too oh that in that great fight zeus self had stayed my dauntless might with thunder from his heaven then with their two-edged swords the trojan men had hewn thee limb from limb and to their dogs had cast thy carrion then thou hadst not presumed to meet me trusting in thy trickeries wretch wherefore if thou vauntest thee in might beyond all others hast thou set thy ships in the line's centre screened from foes nor dared as i on the far wing to draw them up because thou wast afraid not thou it was who savest from devouring fire the ships but i with heart unquailing there stood fast facing the fire and hector i even he gave back before me everywhere in fight thou thou didst fear him i with deadly fear oh had this our contention been but set amidst that very battle 
when the roar of conflict rose around Achilles slain, then had thine own eyes seen me bearing forth out from the battle's heart and fury of foes that goodly armor and its hero lord unto the tents. But here thou canst but trust in cunning speech and covetest the place among the mighty. Thou, thou hast not strength to wear Achilles' arms invincible, nor sway his massy spear in thy weak hands. But I, they are verily moulded to my frame. Yea, seemly it is I wear those glorious arms, who shall not shame a god's gift passing fair. But wherefore for Achilles' glorious arms with words this courteous wrangling stand we here? Come, let us try in strife with brazen spears who of us train is best in murderous right. For silver-footed Thetis set in the midst this prize for prowess, not for pestilent words. In folk mode may men have use for words. In pride of prowess, I know me above thee far, and great Achilles' lineage is mine own. He spake with scornful glance and bitter speech. Odysseus the resourceful chode with him. Hey, ass, unbridled tongue, why these vain words to me? Thou hast called me pestilent, nittering, and weakling, yet I boast me better far than thou in wit and speech, which things increase the strength of men. Lo, how the craggy rock, adamantine though it seem, the hewers of stone amid the hills by wisdom undermine full lightly, and by wisdom shipmen cross the thunderous plunging sea when mountain high it surgeth, and by craft do hunters quell strong lions, panthers, boars, yea, all the brood of wild things. Furious-hearted bulls are tamed to bear the yoke bands by device of men. Yea, all things are by wit accomplished. Still it is the man who knoweth that excels the witless man, alike in toils and counsels. For my keen wit did Aeonius' valiant son choose me of all men with him to draw nigh to Hector's watchmen. Yea, and mighty deeds we twain accomplished. I it was who brought to Atreus' sons Pleiades, far-renowned, their battle-helper. Whensoe'er the host needed some other champion, not for the sake of thine hands will he come, nor by the reed of other Argives. Of Achaeans I alone will draw him with soft, suasive words to where strong men are warring. Mighty power the tongue hath over men when courtesy inspires it. Valor is a deedless thing, and bulk and big assemblage of a man cometh to naught by wisdom unattended. But unto me the immortals gave both strength and wisdom, and unto the Argive host made me a blessing. Nor, as thou hast said, hast thou in time past saved me when in flight from foes. I never fled, but steadfastly withstood the charge of all the Trojan host. Furious the enemy came on like a flood, but I by might of hands cut short the thread of many lives. Herein thou sayest not true, me in the fray thou didst not shield nor save, but for thine own life roughest, lest thy spear should pierce thy back if thou shouldst turn and flee from war. My ships, I drew them up midline, not dreading the battle fury of any foe, but to bring healing unto Atreus' sons of war's calamities. And thou didst set far from their help thy ships. Nay more, I seemed with cruel stripes my body, and entered so the Trojans' burg, that I might learn of them all their devisings for this troublous war. Nor ever I dreaded Hector's spear. Myself rose mid the foremost, eager for the fight, when, prowess confident, he defied us all. Yea, in the fight round Achilles, I slew foes far more than thou. Twas I who saved the dead king with this armor. Not a whit I dread thy spear now, but my grievous hurt with pain still vexeth me. The wound I gat in fighting for these arms and their slain lord. In me, as in Achilles, is Zeus' blood. He spake. Strong Aias answered him again. Most cunning and most pestilent of men. Nor I, nor any other Argive saw thee toiling in that fray, when Trojans strove fiercely to hale away Achilles slain. 
Thy might it was that with the spear unstrung the knees of some in fight, and others thrilled with panic as they pressed on ceaselessly. Then fled they in dire straits, as geese or cranes flee from an eagle, swooping as they feed along a grassy meadow. So in dread the Trojans, shrinking back from my spear and lightning sword, fled into Ilium to scape destruction. If thy might came there ever at all, not anywhere nigh me with foes thou foughtest, somewhere far aloof, mid other ranks thou toiledest, nowhere nigh Achilles, where one great battle raged. He spake, replied Odysseus the shrewd heart, Aias, I hold myself no worse than thou in wit or might, how goodly an outward show thou be so e'er. Nay, I am keener far in wit than thou in all the Argive eyes. In battle prowess do I equal thee, haply surpass. And this the Trojans know, who tremble when they see me from afar. I, thou too knowest, and others know my strength by that hard struggle in the wrestling match, when Peleus' son set glorious prizes forth beside the barrow of Patroclus slain. So spake Laertes' son, the world-renowned. Then on that strife disastrous of the strong, the sons of Troy gave judgment. Victory and those immortal arms awarded they, with one consent, to Odysseus, mighty in war. Greatly his soul rejoiced, but one deep groan brake from the Greeks. Then Aias' noble might stood frozen stiff, and suddenly fell on him dark wilderment. All blood within his frame boiled, and his gall swelled, bursting forth in flood. Against his liver heaved his bowels, his heart with anguished pangs was thrilled. Fierce stabbing throes shot through the filmy veil twixt bone and brain, and darkness and confusion racked his mind. With fixed eyes staring on the ground he stood, still as a statue. Then his sorrowing friends closed round him, led him to the shapely ships, ay, murmuring consolations. But his feet trod for the last time with reluctant steps that path, and hard behind him followed doom. When to the ships beside the boundless sea the Argives, faint for supper and for sleep, had passed, into the great deep Thetis plunged, and all the nereids with her. Round them swam sea monsters many, children of the brine. Against the wise Prometheus bitter wroth the sea maids were, remembering how that Zeus, moved by his prophecies, unto Peleus gave Thetis to wife, a most unwilling bride. Then cried in wrath to thee Simothoe, Oh, that the pestilent prophet had endured all pangs he merited! When deep burrowing the eagle tear his liver, I renewed. So to the dark haired sea maids cried the nymph. Then sank the sun. The onrush of the night shadowed the fields. The heavens were star bestrewn. And by the long prowed ships the Argives slept, by ambrosial sleep are mastered, and by wine. The which from proud Idomeneus' realm of Crete The shipmen bear o'er foaming leagues of sea. But Aias, wroth against the Argive men, Would none of meat or drink, Nor clasped round him the arms of sleep. In fury he donned his mail, He clutched his sword, Thinking unspeakable thoughts. For now he thought to set the ships aflame, And slaughter all the Argives, now to hew with sudden onslaught of his terrible sword guileful odysseus limb from limb such things he purposed nay had soon accomplished all had pallas not with madness smitten him for over odysseus strong to endure her heart yearned as she called to mind the sacrifices offered to her of him continually Therefore she turned aside from Argive men the might of Aeas. As a terrible storm, whose wings are laden with dread hurricane blast, cometh with portents of heart-numbing fear to shipmen, 
when the Pleiades, fleeing a dread from glorious Orion, plunge beneath the stream of tireless ocean, where the air is turmoil and the sea is mad with storm. So rushed he, whithersoe'er his feet might bear. This way and that he ran, like some fierce beast which darteth down a rock-walled glen's ravines with foaming jaws and murderous intent against the hounds and huntsmen who have torn out of the cave her cubs and slain. She runs this way and that and roars, if mid the brakes haply she may see the dear ones lost. Whom, if a man meet in that maddened mood, straightway his darkest of all days hath dawned. So ruthless raving rushed he, blackly boiled his heart, as cauldron on the fire-god's hearth maddens with ceaseless hissing, or the flames from the blazing billets coiling round its sides, at bidding of the toiler, eager soul to singe the bristles of a huge fed boar. So was his great heart boiling in his breast. Like a wild sea he raved, like tempest blast, like the winged might of tireless flame amidst the mountains, maddened by a mighty wind, when the wide blazing forest crumbles down in fervent heat. So Aeas, his fierce heart with agony stabbed, in maddened misery raved. Foam frothed about his lips, a beast-like roar howled from his throat. About his shoulders clashed his armor. They which saw him trembled, all cowed by the fearful shout of that one man. From ocean then uprose dawn, golden rain, like a soft wind upfloated sleep to heaven, and there met Hera. Even then returned to Olympus back from Thetis, Unto whom but yester morn she went, And sleep swiftly flew to Pasithea's couch. From slumber woke all nations of the earth. But Aeas, like Orion the Invincible, prowled on, Still bearing murderous madness in his heart. He rushed upon the sheep, like lion fierce, Whose savage heart is stung with hunger pangs. Here, there, he smote them, laid them dead in dust, Thick as the leaves which the strong north wind's might strews When the waning year to winter turns. So on the sheep in fury Aeas fell, Deeming he dealt to Danian's evil doom. Then to his brother Menelaus came, And spake, not in the hearing of the rest, This day shall surely be a ruinous day for all, Since Aeas thus is sense distraught. It may be he will set the ships aflame, And slay us all amidst our tents, and wrath for those lost arms. Would God that Thetis ne'er had set them for the prize of rivalry. Would God Laertes' son had not presumed in folly of soul to strive with a better man. Fools were we all, for some malignant god beguiled us. For the one great war defense left us, since Aeacus' son in battle fell was Aeas' mighty strength. And now the gods will to our loss destroy him, bringing bane on thee and me that all we may fill up the cup of doom, and pass to nothingness. He spake, replied Agamemnon, lord of spears. Now nay, Menelaus, though thine heart he wrung, be thou not wroth with the resourceful king of the Cephalenian folk. But with the gods who plot our ruin, blame not him who oft hath been our blessing and our enemy's curse. So heavy-hearted spake the Danian king. But by the streams of Xanthos far away, Neath tamarisk, shepherds cowered to hide from death, As when from a swift eagle cower hares Neath tangled copses, when with sharp fierce scream, This way and that with wings wide shadowing, He wheeleth very nigh. So they, here, there, quell from the presence of that furious man. At last, Above a slaughtered ram he stood, And with deadly laugh he cried to it, Lie in the dust, be meat for dogs and kites. Achilles' glorious arms have saved not thee, For which thy folly strove with a better man. Lie there, thou cur! No wife shall fall on thee and clasp, And wail thee at her fatherless child. 
nor shalt thou greet thy parents' longing eyes, the staff of their old age. Far from thy land, thy carrion dogs and vultures shall devour. So cried he, thinking that amidst the slain Odysseus lay, blood boltered at his feet. But in that moment, from his mind and eyes, Athena tore away the nightmare fiend of madness, habit breathing, and it passed thence swiftly to the rock wall river Styx, where dwell the winged Irenaeus, they which still visit with torments overweening men. Then Aeas saw those sheep upon the earth, gasping in death. And sore amazed he stood, for he divined that by the blessed ones his senses had been cheated. All his limbs failed under him, his soul was anguish thrilled. He could not, in his horror, take one step forward or backward. Like some towering rock, fast rooted mid the mountains, there he stood. But when the wild rout of his thoughts had rallied, he groaned in misery and in anguish wailed ah me why do the gods abhor me so they have wrecked my mind have with fell madness filled making me slaughter all these innocent sheep would god that on odysseus pestilent heart mine hands had so avenged me miscreant he brought on me a fell curse Oh, may his soul suffer all the torments that the avenging fiends devise for villains. On all other Greeks may they bring murderous battle, woeful griefs, and chiefly on Agamemnon, Atreus' son. Not scatheless to home may he return so long desired. But why should I consort, I, a brave man with the abominable, Perish the Argive host, perish my life, now unendurable. The brave no more hath his due guerdon, but the baser sort are honoured most and loved, as this Odysseus hath worshipped mid the Greeks. But utterly have they forgotten me and all my deeds, all that I wrought and suffered in their cause. So spake the brave son of strong Telamon, then thrust the sword of Hector through his throat. Forth rushed the blood in torrent, in the dust outstretched he lay, like Typhon, when the bolts of Zeus had blasted him. Around him groaned the dark earth as he fell upon her breast. Then thronging came the Danians, when they saw, low laid in the dust the hero, but ere then none dared draw nigh him, but in deadly fear they watched him from afar. Now hastened they, and flung themselves upon the dead, outstretched upon their faces. On their heads they cast dust, and their wailing went up to the sky. As when men drive away the tender lambs out of the fleecy flock to feast thereon, and round the desolate pen the mothers leap, ceaselessly bleating so our aeas rang that day a very great and bitter cry wild echoes pealed from ida forest palled and from the plain the ships the boundless sea then terser clasping him was minded too to rush on bitter doom howbeit the rest held from the sword his hand anguished he fell upon the dead outpouring many a tear, more comfortless than the orphan babe that wails beside the hearth, with ashes strewn on head and shoulders, wails bereavement's day that brings death to the mother who hath nursed the fatherless child. So wailed he, ever wailed his great death-stricken brother, creeping slow around the corpse, and uttering his lament. O oh, Aeas, mighty soul! Why was thine heart distraught, that thou shouldst deal unto thyself murder and bell? Ah, was it that the sons of Troy might win a breathing space from woes, might come and slay the Greeks now thou art not? For these shall all the olden courage fail, 
when fast they fall in fight, their shield from harm is broken now. For me, I have no will to see mine home again, now thou art dead. Nay, but I long here also now to die, that so the earth may shroud me, me and thee. Not for my parents so much do I care, if haply yet they live, if haply yet spared from the grave in Salamis they dwell, as for thee, my glory and my crown. So cried he, groaning sore, with answering moan queenly Tecmessa wailed, the princess bride of noble Aeas, captive of his spear, yet tamed by him to wife, and household queen o'er all his substance, even all that wives won with a bride price rule for wedded lords. Clasped in his mighty arms, she bare to him a son, Eurysaces, in all things like unto his father, as far as a babe might be, yet cradled in his tent. With bitter moan fell she on that dear corpse, all her fair form close shrouded in her veil, and dust defiled, and from her anguished heart cried piteously alas for me for me now thou art dead not by the hands of foes in fight struck down but by thine own on me is come a grief ever abiding never i had looked to see thy woeful death day here by troy ah vision shattered by rude hands of fate Oh, that the earth had yawned wide for my grave, ere I beheld thy bitter doom. On me no sharper, more heart-piercing pang hath come. No, not when first from fatherland afar, and parents thou didst bear me. Wailing sore mid are the captives when the day of bondage had come on me, a princess theretofore. Not for that dear lost home so much I grieve, nor for my parents dead, as now for thee, for all thine heart was kindness unto me, the hapless, and thou madest me thy wife, one soul with thee. Yea, and the promise it is to throne me queen of fair towered Salamis, when home we won from Troy. The gods denied accomplishment thereof, and thou hast passed into the unseen land. Thou hast forgot me and thy child, who never shall make glad his father's heart shall never mount thy throne but him shall strangers make a wretched thrall for when the father is no more the babe is ward of meaner men a weary life the orphan knows and suffering cometh in every side upon him like a flood to me too thraldom's day shall doubtless come now thou hast died who wast my god on earth then in all kindness Agamemnon spake, Princess, no man on earth shall make thee thrall while Tursa liveth yet, while yet I live. Thou shalt have worship of us evermore, and honor as a goddess with thy son, as though yet living were that godlike man, Aeas, who was the Achaeans' chiefest strength. Ah, that he had not laid this load of grief on all in dying by his own right hand, for all the countless armies of his foe never availed to slay him in fair fight. So spake he, grieved to the inmost heart, the folk woefully wafted all round. O'er Hellespont echoes of mourning rolled, the sighing air darkened around, a widespread sorrow fall. Yea, grief laid hold on wise Odysseus' self, for the great dead, and with remorseful soul to anguish-stricken Argives, thus he spake. O friends, there is no greater curse to men than wrath, which groweth till its bitter fruit is strife. Now wrath hath goaded Aeas on to this dire issue of rage that filled his soul against me. Would to God that ne'er yon Trojans in the strife for Achilles' arms had crowned me with that victory! For which strong Telamon's brave son, in agony of soul, thus perished by his own right hand. Yet blame not me, I pray you, for his wrath. Blame the dark dolorous fate that struck him down. For, had mine heart foreboded aught of this, this desperation of soul distraught, 
Never for victory had I striven with him, Nor had I suffered any Danian else, Though ne'er so eager to contend with him. Nay, I had taken up those arms divine With mine own hands, and gladly given them to him, I, though himself desired it not. But for such mighty grief and wrath in him I had not looked, not since for a woman's sake, nor for a city, nor possessions wide I then contended, but for honour's meed, which always is for right-hearted men the happy goal of all their rivalry. But that great-hearted man was led astray by fate, the hateful fiend, for surely it is unworthy a man to be made passion's fool. The wise man's part is steadfast soul to endure all ills, and not to rage against his lot. So spake Laertes' son, the far-renowned. But when they all were weary of grief and groan, then to those sorrowing ones spake Nilius' son, O oh, friends, the pitiless-hearted fates have laid stroke after stroke of sorrow upon us, sorrow for Aeas dead, for mighty Achilles, for many an Argive, and for mine own son Antilochus. Yet all unmeet it is, day after day, with passion of grief to wail men slain in battle. Nay, we must forget laments, and turn us to the better task of rending dues, beseeming to the dead, the dues of pyre, of tomb, of bones inured. No lamentations will awake the dead. No note thereof he taketh, when the fates, the ruthless ones, have swallowed him in night. So spake he words of cheer. The godlike kings gathered with heavy hearts around the dead, and many hands upheaved the giant corpse, and swiftly bare him to the ships, and there washed they away the blood that clotted lay dust-flecked on mighty limbs and armor. Then in linen swathed him round. From Ida's heights, wood without measure did young men bring, and piled it round the corpse. Billets and logs yet more in a wide circle heap they round, and sheep they laid thereon, fair woven vest, and goodly kind, and speed triumphant steeds, and gleaming gold, and armor without stint from slain foes by that glorious hero stripped, and lucent amber drops they laid thereon, tears, they say, which the daughters of the sun, the lord of omens, shed for Phaethon slain, and by Eridanus' flood they mourn for him. These, for undying honor to his son, the god made amber, precious in men's eyes. Even this the Argives on that broad-based pyre cast freely, honoring the mighty dead, and round him, groaning heavily, they laid silver most fair, and precious ivory, and jars of oil, and whatsoe'er beside they have who heap up goodly and glorious wealth. Then thrust they in the strength of the ravening flame, and from the sea there breathed a wind, sent forth by Thetis, to consume the giant frame of Aeas. All the night and all the morn burned neath the urgent stress of that great wind beside the ships that giant form, as when in Saladas by Zeus leaven was consumed beneath the Renasia, when from all the isle smoke of his burning rose. Or like as when Hercules, trapped by Nessus' deadly guile, gave to devouring fire his living limbs, what time he dared that awful deed, when groaned all Oeta as he burned alive, and passed his soul into the air, leaving the man far famous to be numbered with the gods, when earth closed o'er his toil-tried mortal part. So huge amid the flames, all armor clad lay Aeas, all the joy of fight forgot, while a great multitude watching thronged the sands. Glad were the Trojans, but the Achaeans grieved. But when that goodly frame by ravening fire was all consumed, they quenched the pyre with wine. They gathered up the bones, and reverently laid golden casket. Hard beside Roetium's headland heaped they up a mound measureless high. Then scattered they amidst the long ships, heavy-hearted for the man whom they honored even as Achilles. 
then black night bearing unto all men sleep upfloated so they break bread and lay down waiting the child of the mist short was sleep broken by fitful starting through the dark haunted by dread lest in the night the foe should fall on them now telamon's son was dead End of chapter 5Chapter 6 of The Fall of Troy by Smyrnanius Quintus Translated by Arthur S. Way Born 13 February 1847 Died 25 December 1930 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Rose dawn from ocean and Tithonus bed And climbed the steeps of heaven Scattering round flushed flakes of splendor laughed all earth and air then turned unto their labors each to each mortals frail creatures daily dying then streamed to a folk mote all the achaean men at menelaus summons when the hosts were gathered all then in their midst he spake hearken my word ye god descended kings mine heart within my breast is burdened sore for men which perish men that for my sake came to bitter war whose home return parents and home shall welcome nevermore for fate hath cut off thousands in their prime oh that the heavy hand of death had fallen on me ere hitherward i gathered these but now hath god laid on me cureless pain in seeing all these ills who could rejoice beholding strivings struggles of despair come let us which yet be alive, in haste flee in the ships, each to his several land, since Aias and Achilles both are dead. I look not, now they are slain, that we the rest shall scape destruction. Nay, we shall fall before yon terrible Trojans for my sake and shameless Helen's. Think not that I care for her, for you I care when I behold good men in battle slain. Away with her, her and her paltry paramour. The god stole all discretion out of her false heart when she forsook mine home and marriage bed. Let Priam and the Trojans cherish her. But let us straight return. T'were better far to flee from dolorous war than perish all. So spake he, but to try the Argive men. Far other thoughts than these made his heart burn with passionate desire to slay his foes to break the long walls of their city down from their foundations, and to glut with blood Ares, when Paris mid the slain should fall. Fiercer is not than passionate desire. Thus he pondered, sitting in his place. Up rose Tydeus, shaker of the shield, and chode in fiery speech with Menelaus. O oh, coward Atreus' son, what craven fear hath gripped thee, that thou speakest so to us? as might a weakling child or woman speak. Not unto thee, Achaea's noblest sons, will hearken, ere Troy's coronal of towers be wholly dashed to the dust. For unto men valor is high renown, and flight is shame. If any man shall hearken to the words of this thy counsel, I will smite from him his head with sharp blue steel, and hurl it down for soaring kites to feast on. Up, all ye who care to enkindle men to battle, Rouse our warriors all throughout the fleet to wet the spear, to burnish corslet, helm and shield, and cause both man and horse, all which be keen to fight, to break their fast. Then in yon plain, who is the stronger, Ares shall decide. So speaking, in his place he set him down. Then rose up Thestor's son, and in the midst, where meet it is to speak, stood forth and cried, Hear me, ye sons of battle-biding Greeks. Ye know I have the spirit of prophecy. Erewhile I said that ye in the tenth year should lay waste towered Ilium. This the gods are even now fulfilling. Victory lies at the Argives' very feet. Come, let us send Tydeus and Odysseus, battle-staunch, with speed to Skyros overseas. By prayers hither to bring Achilles' hero son, a light of victory shall he be to us. So spake wise Thestius' son, and all the folk shouted for joy, for all their hearts and hopes yearned to see Calchas' prophecy fulfilled. 
Then to the Argives spake Laertes' son. Friends, it befits not to say many words this day to you in sorrow's weariness. I know that wearied men can find no joy in speech or song, though the Pierides, the immortal muses, love it. At such time few words do men desire, but now this thing that pleaseth all the Achaean host I will accomplish, so Tydeus fare with me. For if we twain go, we shall surely bring, won by our words, war fain Achilles' son. Yea, though his mother, weeping sore, should strive within her halls to keep him. For mine heart trusts that he is a hero's valorous son. Then spake out Menelaus earnestly, Odysseus, the strong Argives help at need. If mighty-souled Achilles' valiant son from Skyros, by thy suasion come to aid us who yearn for him, and some heavenly one grant victory to our prayers, and I win home to Hellas, I will give to him to wife my noble child Hermione, with gifts many and goodly for her marriage dower, with a glad heart. I trow he shall not scorn either his bride or high-born sire-in-law. With a great shout the Danians held his words. Then was the throng dispersed, and to the ships they scattered, hungering for the morning meat, which strengtheneth man's heart. So when they ceased from eating, and desire was satisfied, then with the wise Odysseus, Tydeus' son drew down a swift ship to the boundless sea, and victual and all tackling cast therein. Then stepped they abroad, and with them twenty men, men skilled to row when winds were contrary, or when the unrippled sea slept neath a calm. They smote the brine, and flashed the boiling foam. On leapt the ship, a watery way was cleft about the oars that sweating rowers tugged. As when hard toiling oxen, neath the yoke straining, drag on a massy timbered wain, while creaks the circling axle neath its load, and from their weary necks and shoulders streams down to the earth the sweat abundantly, so at the stiff oars toiled those stalwart men, and fast they laid behind them leagues of sea gazed after them the Achaeans as they went, then turned to wet their deadly darts and spears, the weapons of their warfare. In their town the aweless Trojans armed themselves the while, war-eager, praying to the gods to grant respite from slaughter, breathing space from toil. To these, while sorely thus they yearned, the gods brought present help in trouble, even the seed of mighty Hercules, Eurypylus, a great host followed him in battle skilled, all that by long Caiacus outflow dwelt, full of triumphant trust in their strong spears. Round them rejoicing thronged the sons of Troy, as when tame geese within a pen gaze up on him who cast them corn, and round his feet throng hissing uncouth love, and his heart warms as he looks down on them. So thronged the sons of Troy, as on fierce heart Eurypylus they gazed, and gladdened was his aweless soul to see those throngs. From porchways women looked, wide-eyed with wonder on the godlike man. Above all men he towered as on he strode, as looks a lion when amid the hills he comes on jackals. Paris welcomed him, as Hector honouring him, his cousin he, being of one blood with him, who was born of Astyoche, King Priam's sister fair, whom Telephus embraced in his strong arms. Telephus! whom to all is Hercules ague the bright-haired bear in secret love. That babe, a suckling craving for the breast, a swift hind fostered, giving him the teat as to her own fawn in all love. For Zeus so willed it, in whose eyes it was not meet that Hercules' child should perish wretchedly. His glorious son, with glad heart, Paris led unto his palace through the wide wade burg beside Astaracus' tomb, and stately halls of Hector, and Tritonus wholly feigned. Hard by his mansion stood, and there beside a stainless altar to home-water Zeus rose. As they went, he lovingly questioned him of brethren, parents, and of marriage kin, and all he craved to know Eurypylus told. So communed they, on pacing side by side, then came they to a palace great and rich. There, goddess-like, said Helen, clothed upon with beauty of the graces. Maidens four about her plied their task. Others apart within that goodly bower wrought the work's beseeming handmaids. 
Helen, marvelling, gazed upon Eurypylus, on Helen he. Then these in converse each with other spake in that all odorous bower. The handmaidens brought and set beside their lady high seats twain, and Paris set him down, and at his side Eurypylus. That hero's host encamped without the city, where the Trojan guards kept watch. Their armor laid they on the earth, their steeds, yet breathing battle, stood thereby, and cribs were heaped with horses' provender. Up floated night, and darkened earth and air. Then feasted they before that cliff-like wall, Cetae and men and Trojans. Babble of talk rose from the feasters. All around the glow of blazing campfires lighted up the tents. Pealed out the pipe's sweet voice, and hot boys rang their clear shrilling reeds. The witching strain of lyres was rippling round. From far away the Argives gazed and marveled, seeing the plain aglare with many fires and hearing notes of flutes and lyres, neighing of chariot steeds, and pipes, the shepherds and the banquet's joy. Therefore they bade their fellows each in turn keep watch, and ward about the tents till dawn, lest those proud Trojans, feasting by their walls, should fall on them, and set the ships aflame. Within the halls of Paris all this while, with kings and princes Telephus' hero's son feasted, and Priam and the sons of Troy, each after each, prayed him to play the man against the Argives, and in bitter doom to lay them low, and blithe he promised all. So when they had supped, each hide him to his home, but there Eurypylus laid him down to rest full nigh the feast hall, in the stately bower where Paris theretofore himself had slept with Helen, world-renowned. A bower it was most wondrous fair, the goodliest of them all. There lay he down, but otherwhere their rest took they, till rose the bright throned queen of morn. Up sprang with dawn the son of Telephus, and passed to the host with all those kings in Troy abiding. Straightway did the folk, all battle-eager, don their warrior gear, burning to strike in forefront of the fight. And now Eurypylus clad his mighty limbs in armor, that like levin flashes gleamed. Upon his shield, by cunning hands were wrought all the great labors of strong Hercules. Thereon were seen two serpents, flickering black tongues from grimly jaws. They seemed in act to dart, but Hercules' hands to right and left, albeit a babe's hands, were throttling them, for all this was his spirit, as Zeus' strength from the beginning was his strength. The seed of heaven abiders never deedless is, nor helpless, but hath boundless powers, yea, even when in the womb unborn it lies. Nemea's mighty lion there was seen, strangled by the strong arms of Hercules, his grim jaws dashed about with bloody foam. He seemed in verity gasping out his life. Thereby was wrought the hydra, many-necked, flickering its dread tongues, of its fearful head some severed lay on earth, but many more were budding from its necks, while Hercules and Iolus, dauntless-hearted twain, toiled hard. The one with lightning sickle sweeps lopped the fierce heads, his fellow seared each neck with glowing iron. The monster's soul was slain. Thereby was wrought the mighty tameless boar, with foaming jaws. Real seemed the pictured thing, as by Alcides' giant strength the brute was to Eurystheus living born on high. There fashioned was the fleet-foot stag, which laid the vineyard's waste of hapless husbandmen. The hero's hand held fast its golden horns, the while it snorted breath of ravening fire. Thereon were seen the fierce Stamphalian birds, some arrow-smitten dying in the dust, some through the grey air darting its swift flight. At this, at that one, hot in haste he seemed, Hercules sped the arrows of his wrath. A G.I.S. monstrous stable there was wrought with cunning craft on that invincible targ, and Hercules was turning through the same the deep flow of Alpheus' stream divine, while wandering nymphs looked down on every hand upon that mighty work. Elsewhere portrayed was the fire-breathing bull, the hero's grip on his strong horns wrenched round the massive neck, the straining muscles on his arms stood out. 
The huge beast seemed to bellow. Next thereto, wrought on the shield, was one in beauty arrayed as a goddess, even Hippolyta. The hero by the hair was dragging her from her swift steed, with fierce resolve to wrest with his strong hands the girdle marvellous from the Amazon queen, while quailing shrank away the maids of war. There in the Thracian land were Diomedes' grim man-eating steeds. These at their gruesome mangers he had slain, and dead they lay with their fiend-hearted lord. There lay the bulk of giant Garion, dead mid his kind. His gory heads were cast in dust, dashed down by that resistless club. Before him slain lay that most murderous hound, Orthros, in furious might like Cerebus, his brother hound. A herdsman lay thereby, Eurytion, all bedabbled with his blood. And there were the golden apples wrought, that gleamed in the Hesperides' garden undefiled. All round the fearful serpent's deadly coil lay, and shrank the maids aghast from Zeus' bold son. And there, a dread sight even for gods to see, was Cerebus, whom the loathly worm had borne to Typho in a craggy cavern's gloom, close on the borders of eternal night. A hideous monster, warder of the gate of Hades, home of wailing, jailer hound of dead folk in the shadowy gulf of doom. But lately Zeus' son with his crashing blows tamed him, and hailed him from the cataract flood of Styx with heavy drooping head, and dragged the dog, sore loath to the strange upper air, all dauntlessly. And there, at the world's end, were Caucasus' long glens, where Hercules, rending Prometheus' chains and hurling them this way and that, with fragments of the rock wherein too they were riveted, set free the mighty Titan. Arrow-smitten lay the eagle of torment there beside. There stormed the wild rout of centaurs round the hall of Pholus, goaded on by strife and wine, with Hercules the monsters fought. Amidst the pine trunks stricken to death they lay, still grasping those strange weapons in dead hands, while some with stems long shafted still fought on in fury, and refrained not from the strife. And all their heads, gashed in the pitiless fight, were drenched with gore. The whole scene seemed to live, with blood the wine was mingled, meats and bowls and tables in one ruin shattered lay. There by even his torrent, in fierce wrath for his sweet ride, he laid with the arrow low, Nessus in mid-flight. There withal was wrought Antaeus' brawny strength, who challenged him to wrestling strife. He in those sinewy arms, raised high above the earth, was crushed to death. There, where the Hellespont meets the outer sea, lay the sea monster slain by his ruthless shafts, while from his sonoe he rent her chains. A bold Alcides, many a deed beside, shone on the broad shield of Eurypylus. He seemed the war-god, as from rank to rank he sped. Rejoiced the Trojans following him, seeing his arms, and him clothed with the might of gods, and Paris hailed him to the fray, Glad am I for thy coming, for mine heart trusts that the Argives shall all wretchedly be with their ships destroyed. For such a man mid Greeks or Trojans never have I seen. Now by the strength and fury of Hercules, to whom in stature, might, and goodly head most like thou art, I pray thee, have in mind him, and resolve to match his deeds with thine. Be the strong shield of Trojans hard bestead. Win us a breathing space, thou only, I trow, from perishing Troy canst thrust the dark doom back. With kindling words he spake, that hero cried, Great-hearted Paris, like the blessed ones in goodly head. This lieth foreordained on the gods' knees, who in the fight shall fall, and who outlive it. I, as honour bids, and as my strength sufficeth, will not flinch from Troy's defence. I swear to turn from fight never except in victory or death. Gallantly he spake, with exceeding joy rejoiced the Trojans. Champions then he chose, Alexander and Aeneas, fiery-souled, Polydamus, Pemeon, and Ephibus, 
and Ithacus, of the Paphlagonian men, the staunchest man to stem the tide of war. These chose he, cunning in all battle toil, to meet the foe in forefront of the fight. Swiftly they strode before that warrior throng, then from the city cheering charged. The host followed them in their thousands, as when bees follow with bands their leaders from the hives, with loud hum on a spring day, pouring forth, so to the fight the warriors followed these. As when a rushing mighty wind stirs up the barren sea plain from its nethermost floor, and darkling to the strand roll roaring waves, belching sea tangle from the bursting surf, and wild sounds rise from beaches harvestless, so as they charged, the wide earth rang again. Now from their rampart forth the Argives poured round godlike Agamemnon, rang their shouts, cheering each other on to face the fight, and not to cower beside the ships in dread of onset shouts of battle-eager foes. They met those charging hosts with hearts as light as calves bear, when they leap to meet the kind down-faring from hill pastures in the spring unto the steading, when the fields are green with corn blades, when the earth is glad with flowers, and bowls are brimmed with milk of kine and ewes, and multitudinous lowing, far and near, uprises as the mothers meet their young, and in their midst their herdsmen joys. So great was the uproar that rose when met the fronts of battle. Dread it rang on either hand. Hard strained was then the fight. Incarnate strife stalked through the midst, with slaughter ghastly faced. Crashed bull-hide shields and spears and helmet crest meeting, the brass flashed out like leaping flames. Bristled the battle with lances, earth ran red with blood, as slaughtered heroes fell and horses mid a tangle of shattered cars, yet some with spear wounds gasping, while on them others were falling. Through the air up shrieked an awful indistinguishable roar, for on both hosts fell iron hearted strife. Here were men hurling cruel jagged stones, there speeding arrows and new wetted darts. There with an axe or tribill, hewing hard, slashing with swords, and thrusting out with spears, their mad hands clutched all manner of tools of death. At first the Argars bore the ranks of Troy backward a little, but they rallied, charged, leapt on the foe, and drenched the field with blood. Like a black hurricane rushed Eurypylus, cheering his men on, hewing Argives down awlessly. Measureless might was led to him by Zeus, for a grace to glorious Hercules. Nereus, a man in beauty like the gods, his spear long shafted stabbed beneath the ribs. Down on the plain he fell, forth streamed the blood, drenching his splendid arms, drenching the form glorious of mould and his thick clustered hair. There mid the slain in dust and blood he lay, like a young lusty olive sapling, which a river rushing down in roaring flood tearing its banks away, and cleaving wide a chasm channel hath disrooted, lo, it lieth heavy-blossomed, so lay then the goodly form, the grace of loveliness of Nereus, on earth's breast. But o'er the slain loud rang the taunting of Eurypylus. Lie in the dust! Thy beauty marvellous naught hath availed thee! I have plucked thee away from life, to which thou wast so fain to cling! Rash fool, who didst defy a mightier man unknowing, beauty is no match for strength. He spake, and leapt upon the slain to strip his goodly arms, but now against him came Machaeon, wroth for Nereus, by his side doom overtaken. With his spear he drave at his right shoulder, strong albeit he was, he touched him, and blood spurted from the gash. Yet ere he might leap back from gravel of death, even as a lion or fierce mountain boar maddens mid thronging huntsmen, furious fain to rend the man whose hand first wounded him, so fierce Eurypylus on Machaeon rushed. The long lance shot out swiftly, and pierced him through on the right haunch. Yet would he not give back, nor flinch from the onset. Fast though flowed the blood. In haste he snatched a huge stone from the ground, and dashed it on the head of Telephus' son. But his helm warded him from death or harm. Then waxed Eurypylus more hotly wroth with that strong warrior, and in fury of soul, clear through Machaean's breast he drave his spear, and through the midriff past the gory point. He fell, as falls beneath the lion's jaw a bull, and round him clasped his glancing arms. 
Swiftly Eurypolis plucked the lance of death out of the wound, and vaunting cried aloud, Wretch, wisdom was not bound in thine heart, that thou, a weakling, didst come forth to fight a mightier. Therefore art thou in the toils of doom. Much profit shall be thine, when kites devour the flesh of thee in battle slain. Ta! Dost thou hope still to return to scape mine hands? A leech art thou, and soothing salves thou knowest, and by these didst haply hope to flee the evil day. Not thine own sire on the wind's wings descending from Olympus should save thy life, not though between thy lips he should pour nectar and ambrosia. Faint breathing answered him the dying man. Eurypolis, thine own weird is to live not long. Fate is at point to meet thee here on Troy's plain, and to still thy impious tongue. So passed his spirit to Hades' hall. Then to the dead man spake his conqueror, Now on earth lie thou, what shall betide hereafter, I care not. Yea, though this day death doom stand by my feet, no man may live for ever. Each man's fate is foreordained. Stabbing the corpse he spake. Then shouted loud Terser at seeing Machaon in the dust. Far thence he stood, hard toiling in the fight, for on the center sore the battle lay. Foe after foe pressed on. Yet not for this was Terser heedless of the fallen grave, neither of Nereus lying hard thereby behind Machaon in the dust. He saw, and with a great voice, Raise the rescue cry. Charge, Argives! Flinch not from the charging foe, for shame unspeakable shall cover us if Trojan men held back to Ilium, noble Machaon, and Nereus godlike fair. Come, with a good heart let us face the foe to rescue these slain friends, or fall ourselves beside them. Duty bids that men defend friends, and to aliens leave them not a prey. Not without sweat of toil is glory won. Then were the Danians anguish stung. The earth round them tied they red with blood of slain, as foe fought foe in even balanced fight. By this to Polydarius tidings came, how that in dust his brother lay, struck down by woeful death. Beside the ships he sat, ministering to the hurts of men with spears stricken. In wrath for his brother's sake he rose, he clad him in his armor, in his breast dread battle prowess swelled. For conflict grim he panted, Boil the maddened blood round his heart. He leapt amidst the foemen, His swift hand swung the snake-headed javelin up, And hurled and slew with its winged speed Agamestor's son Clytius. A bright-haired nymph had given him birth Beside Parthenius, Whose quiet stream fleets smooth as oil Through green lands, Till it pours its shining ripples To the Oxine sea. Then by his warrior brother Lady Lolassus, whom Pronoe, fair as a goddess, bare beside Nymphaea's stream, hard by a cave, a wide and wondrous cave. Sacred it is, men say, unto the nymphs, even all that haunt the long reach Paphlagonian hills, and all that by full clustered Heraclea dwell. That cave is like the work of gods, of stone in manner marvellous moulded. Through it flows cold water, crystal clear. In niches round stand bowls of stone upon the rugged rock, seeming as though they were wrought by carver's hands. Statues of wood gods stand around, fair nymphs, looms, distaffs, all such things as mortal craft fashioneth. Wondrous seem they unto men which pass into that hollowed cave. It hath, up leading and down leading, doorways twain, facing the one, the wild north wind's shrilling blast and one the dank rain-burdened south. By this do mortals pass beneath the nymphs' wide caves. But that is the immortal's path. No man may tread it, for a chasm, deep and wide, down-reaching unto Hades, yawns between. This tract the blessed gods alone may behold. So died a host on either side that warred over Machaon and Goliath's son. But at the last, through desperate wrestle of fight, the Danians rescued them. Yet few were they which bare them to the ships. By bitter stress of conflict were the more part compassed round, and needs must still abide the battle's brunt. 
But when full many had filled up the measure of fate, mid tumult, blood and agony, then to their ships did many Argives flee, pressed by Eurypylus hard, an avalanche of havoc. Yet few abode the strife round Aeas and the Atreidae, rallying. Haply these had perished all, beset by throngs on throngs of foes on every hand, had not only a son stabbed with his spear twixt shoulder and breast, or wise Polydamus. Forth gushed the blood, and he recoiled a space. Then Menelaus pierced the Iphibus by the right breast, that with swift feet he fled, and many of that slaughter-breathing throng were slain by Agamemnon. Furiously he rushed on God like Ithacus with the spear, but he shrank from the forefront back mid friends. Now when Eurypylus the battle stayed marked how the ranks of Troy gave back from fight, he turned him from the host that he had chased even to the ships, and rushed with eagle swoop on Atreus' strong sons and Oleus' seed, stout-hearted, who was passing fleet of foot, and in fight peerless. Swiftly he charged on these, grasping his spear long-shafted. At Iris' side charged Paris, charged Aeneas stout of heart, who hurled a stone exceeding huge that crashed on Aeas' helm, dashed to the dust he was, yet gave not up the ghost, whose day of doom was fate ordained amidst the Caphereus rocks on the voyage home. Now his valiant men, out of the foe's hands, snatched him, bare him thence, scarce drawing breath, to the Achaean ships. And now the Atriad kings, war-renowned, were left alone, and murder-breathing foes encompassed them, and hurled from every side, whate'er their hands might find, the deadly shafts some showered, some the stone, the javelin some. They in the midst eye turned this way and that, as boars or lions compassed round with pales on that day when kings gathered to the sport the people, and their pen the mighty beast within the toils of death. But these, although the walls ring round, yet tear with tusk and fang what luckless thrall soever draweth near. So these death-compassed heroes slew their foes, ever they pressed on. Yet had their might availed not for defence for all their will, had Tercer and Idomeneus strong of heart not come to help, with Thoas, Meriones, and godlike Thrasymedes. They which shrank erewhile before Eurypylus, yea, had fled unto the ships to scape the crushing doom. But that, in fear for Atreus' sons, they rallied against Eurypylus, deadly waxed the fight. Then Tercer, with a mighty spear thrust, smote Aeneas' shield, yet wounded not his flesh, for the great fourfold buckler warded him, yet feared he, and recoiled a little space. Leapt Meriones on Laophoon, the son of Paeon, born on Axis' flood of bright-haired Cleomede. Unto Troy with noble Asteropeus had he come to aid her folk. Him Meriones' keen spear stabbed neath the navel, and the lance head tore his bowels forth, swift sped his soul away into the shadow land. Alcimedes, the warrior friend of Aeas, only a son, shot mid the press of Trojans, for he sped with taunting shout a sharp stone from a sling into their battle's heart. They quelled in fear before the hum and onrush of the bolt. Fate winged its flight to the bold charioteer of Pamion, Hippasa's son. His brow it smote while yet he grasped the reins, and flung him stunned down from the chariot seat before the wheels. The rushing war wain whirled his wretched form twixt tires and heels of onward leaping steeds, and awful death in that hour swallowed him when whips and reins had flown from his nerveless hands. Then grief thrilled Pamion. Hard necessity made him both chariot-lord and charioteer. Now to his doom and death they had he bowed, had that a Trojan through that gory strife leapt, grasped the reins, and saved the prince, when now his strength failed neath the murderous hands of foes. As godlike Achimus charged, the stalwart son of Nestor thrust the spear above his knee, and with that wound saw anguish came on him. Back from the fight he drew, the deadly strife he left unto his comrades. Quenched now was his battle lust. Eurypylus' henchman smote a Chemion Thoas' friend amidst the fray, beneath the shoulder. Nigh his heart the spear passed bitter biting, or his limbs break out mingled with blood, cold sweat of agony. He turned to flee. Eurypylus' giant might chased, caught him, cheering his heel tendons through. There where the blow fell, his reluctant feet stayed, and the spirit left his mortal frame. Thoas pricked Paris with a quick thrusting spear on the right thigh. Backward a space he ran for his death-speeding bow, which had been left to rearward of the fight. Idomeneus upheaved the stone, huge as his hands could swing, and dashed it on Eurypylus' arm. To earth fell his death-dealing spear. 
backward he stepped to grasp another, since from out his hand the first was smitten. So had Atreus' sons a moment breathing space from stress of war. But swiftly drew Eurypylus' henchmen near, bearing a stubborn shafted lance, wherewith he brake the strength of many. In stormy night then charged he on the foe, whom so he met he slew, and spread wide havoc through their ranks. Now neither Atreus' sons might steadfast stand, nor any valiant Danian beside, for ruinous panic suddenly gripped the hearts of all. For on them all Eurypylus rushed, flashing death in their faces, chased them, slew, cried to the Trojans and to his chariot lords, Friends, be of good heart. To these Danians let us deal slaughter and doom's darkness now. Lo, oh, how like scared sheep back to the ships they flee. Forget not your death-dealing battle lore, O ye that from your youth are men of war. Then charged they on the Argives as one man, and these in utter panic turned and fled the bitter battle. Those hard after them followed, as white-fanged hounds hold deer in chase up the long forest glens. Full many in dust dashed they down, howsoe'er they longed to escape the slaughter grim and great of that wild fray. Eurypylus had slain Bucolion, Nessus, and Chromion, and Atherphus. Twain in Mycenae dwelt, a goodly land, in Lacedaemon twain. Men of renown, albeit they were, he slew them. Then he smote a host unnumbered by the common throng. My strength should not suffice to sing their fate, how fain soe'er, though within my breast were iron lungs. Aeneas slew with all Atamachus and Phyrus, twain which left Crete with Idomeneus. Agenor smote Molius the princely, with King Stentilus he came from Argos, hurled from far behind a dart, new wetted as he fled from fight, piercing his right leg, and the eager shaft cut sheer through the broad sinew, shattering the bones with anguished pain. And so his doom met him, to die a death of agony. Then Paris' arrows laid focus low, and Mosinus, brethren both from Salamis, who came in Aeas' ships, and never more saw the homeland. Cleolus smote he next, Mega's stout henchman, for the arrow struck his left breast. Deadly night enwrapped him round, and his soul fleeted forth. His fainting heart still in his breast fluttering convulsively made the winged arrow shiver. Yet again did Paris shoot at bold Etion. Through his jaw leapt the sudden flashing brass. He groaned, and with his blood were mingled tears. So ever man slew man, till all the space was heaped with Argives each on other cast. Now had the Trojans burnt with fire the ships, had not night, trailing heavy folded mist uprisen. So Eurypylus drew back, and Troy's sons with him, from the ships aloof a little space by Samoa's outfall. There camped they exultant. But amid the ships, flung down upon the sands, the Argives wailed, heart anguish for the slain, so many of whom dark fate had overtaken and laid in dust. End of chapter 6Chapter 7 of The Fall of Troy by Smyrnanius Quintus Translated by Arthur S. Way Born 13 February 1847 Died 25 December 1930 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. When heaven hid his stars and dawn awoke, outspraying splendor, and night's darkness fled, then undismayed the Argives' warrior sons marched forth without the ships to meet in fight Eurypylus, save those that tarried still to render to Machaon midst the ships death dues, with Nereus, Nereus, who in grace and goodly head was like the deathless ones, yet was not strong in bodily might. The gods grant not perfection in all things to men, but evil still is blended with the good by some strange fate. To Nereus' winsome grace was linked a weakling's prowess. Yet the Greeks slighted him not, but gave him all death dues, and mourned above his grave with no less grief than for Machaon, whom they honored I for his deep wisdom as the immortal gods. One mound they swiftly heaped above these twain. Then in the plain once more did murderous war madden. The multitudinous clash and cry rose, as the shields were shattered by huge stones, were pierced with lances, 
so they toiled in fight. But all this while lay Polydorus, fasting in dust and groaning, leaving not his brother's tomb, and oft his heart was moved with his own hands to slay himself. And now he clutched his sword, and now amidst his herbs sought for a deadly drug, and still his friends essayed to stay his hand and comfort him with many pleadings. But he would not cease from grieving. Yea, his hands had spilt his life There on his brother's new-made tomb. But Nestor heard thereof, And sorrowed sore in his affliction. And he came on him, As now he flung him on that woeful grave, And now was casting dust upon his head, Beating his breast, And on his brother's name crying, While thralls and comrades round their lord Groaned, and affliction held them, one and all. Then gently spake he to that stricken one, Refrain from bitter moan and deadly grief, my son. It is not a wise man's honour to wail, As doth a woman, over the fallen. Thou shalt not bring him up to light again, Whose soul hath fleeted, vanishing into air, Whose body fire hath ravened up, Whose bones earth has received, his end was worthy his life. Endure thy sore grief, even as I endured who lost a son, slain by the hands of foes, a son not worse than thy Machaeon, good with spears in battle, good in counsel. None of all the youth so loved his sire as he loved me. He died for me, yea, died to save his father. Yet when he was slain, I did endure to taste food, and to see the light. Well knowing that all men must tread one path, Hades ward. And before all lies one goal, death's mournful goal. A mortal man must bear all joys, all griefs that God vouchsafes to send. Made answer that heart-stricken one, while still wet were his cheeks with ever-flowing tears. Father, mine heart is bowed neath crushing grief For a brother passing wise Who fostered me even as a son When to the heavens had passed our father In his arms he cradled me Gladly he taught me all his healing lore We shared one table In one bed we lay We had all things in common these And love My grief cannot forget nor I desire, now he is dead, to see the light of life. Then spake the old man to that stricken one. To all men fate assigns one same sad lot, bereavement. Earth shall cover all alike, albeit we tread not the same path of life, and none the path he chooseth. For on high good things and bad lie on the knees of gods unnumbered, indistinguishably blent. These no immortal seeth, they are veiled in mystic cloudfolds. Only fate puts forth her hands thereto, nor looks at what she takes, but casts them from Olympus down to earth. This way and that they are wafted, as it were by gust of wind. The good man oft is whelmed in suffering, wealth undeserved is heaped on the vile person. Blind is each man's life. Therefore he never walketh surely, oft he stumbleth, ever devious is his path, now sloping down to sorrow, mounting now to bliss. All happy is no living man, from the beginning to the end, but still the good and evil clash. Our life is short, beseems not then in grief to live, hope on, still hope for better days. Chain not to woe thine heart. There is a saying among men That to the heavens unperishing Mount the souls of good men, And to nether darkness sink the souls of the wicked. Both to God and man, Dear was thy brother, Good to brother men, And son of an immortal. Sure am I that to the company of gods He shall ascend by intercession of thy sire. Then raised he that reluctant mourner up with comfortable words, And from that dark grave drew him, Backward gazing oft with groans. To the ships they came, 
where Greeks and Trojan men had bitter travail of rekindled war. Eurypolis there, in dauntless spirit like the war-god, with mad raging spear and hands resistless, smote down hosts of foes. The earth was clogged with dead men, slain on either side. On he strode midst the corpses. Awlessly he fought, with blood bespattered hands and feet. Never a moment from grim strife he ceased. Benelios the mighty-hearted came against him in the pitiless fray. He fell before Eurypolis' spear. Yea, many more fell round him. Seized not those destroying hands, but wrathful on the Argives still he pressed, as when of old on Philoe's long-reached heights among the centaurs, terrible Hercules rushed, storming in might, and slew them, passing swift and strong, and battle-cunning though they were. So rushed he on, and smote down the array, one after other of Danian spears, heaps upon heaps, here, there, in throngs they fell, strewn in the dust. As when a river in flood comes thundering down, banks crumble on either side to drifting sand, on seaward rolls the surge, tossing wild crest, while cliffs on every hand ring crashing echoes, as their brows break down beneath long leaping roaring waterfalls, and dikes are swept away. So fell in dust the war-famed Argives by Eurypolis slain, such as he overtook in that red rout. Some few escaped, whom strength of fleeing feet delivered. Yet in that sore strait they drew Penelios from the shrieking tumult forth, and bare to the ships, though with swift feet themselves were fleeing from ghastly death and pitiless doom. Behind the rampart of the ships they fled, in huddled rout. They had no heart to stand before Eurypolis, for Hercules to crown with glory his stalwart son thrilled them with panic. There behind their wall they cowered, as goats to leeward of a hill shrink before the wild cold rushing of the wind that bringeth snow and heavy sleet and haft. No longing for the pasture tempteth them over the brow to step and face the blast, but huddling screened by rock wall and ravine, they abide the storm and crop the scanty grass under dim copses thronging till the gust of that ill wind shall lull. So by their towers screened did the trembling Danians abide Telephus' mighty son. Yea, he had burnt the ships, and all that host that he destroyed, had not Athena at the last inspired the Argive men with courage. Ceaselessly from the high rampart hurled they at the foe with bitter biting darts, and slew them fast, and all the walls were splashed with reeking gore, and I went up a moan of smitten men. So fought they, night long, day long fought they on, Cetaeans, Trojans, battle-biding Greeks, fought, now before the ships, and now again round the steep wall, with fury unutterable. Yet even so, for two days did they cease from murderous fight, for to Eurypolis came a Danian embassage, saying, From the war forbear we, while we give unto the flames the battle-slain. So hearkened he to them, from ruinous reeking strife forbore the host, and so their dead they buried, who in dust had fallen. Chiefly the Achaeans mourned Penelios. O'er the mighty dead they heaped a barrow broad and high, a sign for men of days to be. But in a several place the multitude of heroes slain they laid, mourning with stricken hearts. On one great pyre they burnt them all, and buried in one grave. So likewise, far from thence, the sons of Troy buried their slain. Yet murderous strife slept not, but roused again Eurypolis' dauntless might to meet the foe. He turned not from the ships, but there abode, and fanned the fury of war. Meanwhile the black ships on to Skyros ran, and those twain found before his palace gate Achilles' son, now hurling dart and lance, now in his chariot driving fleet-foot steeds. Glad were they to behold him practicing the deeds of war, albeit his heart was sad for his slain sire, of whom had tidings come ere this. With reverent eyes of awe they went to meet him, for that goodly form and face seemed even as Achilles unto them. But he, or ever they had spoken, cried, All hail, ye strangers, unto this mine house! Say whence ye are, and who, and what the need that hither brings you over barren seas. So spake he, and Odysseus answered him, 
Friends are we of Achilles, lord of war, To whom of Diadamia thou wast born. Yea, when we look on thee, we seem to see that hero's self, And like the immortal ones was he. Of Ithaca am I, this man of Argos, nurse of horses, If perchance thou hast heard the name of Tydeus' warrior's son, Or of the wise Odysseus. Lo, I stand before thee, sent by voice of prophecy, I pray thee, pity us, come thou to Troy and help us. Only so unto the war an end shall be. Gifts beyond words to thee the Achaean king shall give. Yea, I myself will give to thee thy godlike father's arms, And great shall be thy joy in bearing them. For these be like no mortal's battle gear, But splendid as the very war-god's arms. Over their marvellous blazonry hath gold been lavished. Yea, in heaven Hephaestus self rejoiced in fashioning that work divine, The which thine eyes shall marvel to behold. For earth and heaven and sea upon the shield are wrought, And in its wondrous compass are creatures that seem to live and move, A wonder even to the immortals. Never hath man seen their like, nor any man hath worn, Save thy sire only, whom the Achaeans all honoured as Zeus himself. I chiefly as from mine heart loved him, and when he was slain, to many a foe I dealt a ruthless doom, and through them all bare back to the ships his course. Therefore his glorious arms did Thetis give to me. These, though I prize them well, to thee I will gladly give when thou comest to Troy. Yea, also, when we have smitten Priam's towns, and unto Hellas in our ships return, shall Menelaus give thee, and thou wilt, his princess child to wife, for love of thee, and with his bright-haired daughter shall bestow rich dower of gold and treasure, even all that meet is to attend a wealthy king. So spake he, and replied Achilles' son, If bidden of oracles the Achaean men summon me, let us with to-morrow's dawn fare forth upon the broad depths of the sea, if so to longing Danians I may prove a light of help. Now pass we to mine halls, and to such guest fare as befits to set before the stranger. For my marriage day, to this the gods in time to come shall see. To the forecourt when they came of that great mansion, found they there the queen Diatamia, in her soul of sorrow grief wasted as when snow from mountainsides before the sun and east wind waste away, so pined she for that princely hero slain. Then came to her amidst her grief the kings, and greeted her in courteous wise. Her son drew near, and told their lineage and their names. But that for which they came he left untold until the morrow, lest unto her woe there should be added grief and floods of tears, and lest her prayers should hold him from the path whereon his heart was set. Straight feasted these, and comforted their hearts with sleep, Even all which dwelt in sea-ring Skyros. Night long lulled by long low thunder of the girdling deep, Of waves Aegean breaking on her shores. But not on Diadamia fell the hands of kindly sleep, She bore in mind the names of crafty Odysseus, And of Diomed the godlike, How these twain had widowed her of battle fain Achilles, how their words had won his aweless heart to fare with them, To meet the war-cry where stern fate met him, Shattered his hope of home return, And laid measureless grief on Peleus and on her. Therefore an awful dread oppressed her soul, Lest her son too to tumult of war should speed, And grief be added to her grief. Dawn climbed the wide-arched heaven, Straightway they rose from their beds. Then Diadamia knew, and on her son's broad breast she cast herself, and bitterly wailed. Her crying thrilled through the air, as when a cow loud lowing mid the hills seeks through the glens her calf, and all round echo long ridges of mountain steep. So on all sides, from dim recesses, rang the hall, and in her misery she cried, Child, wherefore is thy soul on the wing to follow strangers unto Ilium, the fount of tears, where perish many in fight, yea, cunning men in war and battle grim? 
and thou art but a youth, and hast not learned the ways of war, which save men in the day of peril. Hearken thou to me, abide here in thine home, lest evil tidings come from Troy unto my ears, that thou in fight hast perished, for mine heart saith, Never thou hitherward shalt from battle toil return. Not even thy sire escaped the doom of death. He, mightier than thou, mightier than all heroes on earth, yea, and a goddess son, but was in battle slain. All through the wiles and crafty counsels of these very men, who now to woeful war be kindling thee. Therefore mine heart is full of shuddering fear, lest, son, my lot should be to live bereaved of thee, and to endure dishonour and pain. For never heavier blow on woman falls than when her lord hath perished, and her sons die also, and her house is left her desolate. Straightway evil men remove her landmarks, yea, and rob her of all, setting the right at naught. There is no lot more woeful and more helpless than is hers who is left a widow in a desolate home. Loud wailing spake she, but her son replied, Be of good cheer, my mother. Put from thee evil foreboding. No man in war is beyond his destiny slain. If my weird be to die in my country's cause, then let me die when I have done deeds worthy of my sire. Then to his side old Lycomedes came, and to his battle-eager grandson spake, O valiant-hearted son, so like thy sire, I know thee strong and valorous, yet, O oh, yet for thee I fear the bitter war, I fear the terrible sea surge. Shipmen evermore hang on destruction's brink, beware, my child, perils of water when thou sailest back from Troy on other shores, such as beset full oft times the voyagers that ride the long sea ridges, when the sun hath left the archer star and meets the misty goat, when the wild blasts drive on the lowering storm, or when Orion to the darkling west slopes into ocean's river sinking low. Beware the time of equal days and nights, when blasts that o'er the sea's abysses rush, none knoweth whence, in fury of battle clash. Beware the Pleiades setting, when the sea maddens beneath their power, nor these alone, but other stars, Terrors of hapless men, as o'er the wide sea gulf they set or rise. Then kissed he him, nor sought to stay the feet of him who panted for the clamour of war, who smiled for pleasure and for eagerness to haste to the ship. Yet were his hurrying feet stayed by his mother's pleading, and her tears still in those halls a while. As some swift horses reined in by his rider, when he strains unto the race course, and he neighs and champs the curving bit, Dashing his chest with foam, and his eager feet for the course are still never, his restless hooves are clattering eye, his mane is a stormy cloud, he tosses high his head with snortings, and his lord is glad. So reigned his mother back the glorious son of battle stay Achilles, so his feet were restless, so the mother's loving pride joyed in her son, despite her heartsick pain. A thousand times he kissed her, then at last left her alone with her own grief and moan, there in her father's halls. As o'er her nest they swallow in her anguish cries aloud for her lost nestlings, which, mid piteous shrieks, a fearful serpent hath devoured, and wrung the mother's loving heart, and now above the empty cradle spreads her wings, and now flies round its porchway fashioned cunningly, lamenting piteously her little ones, so for her child the Adamia mourned. Now on her son's bed did she cast herself, crying aloud, against his doorpost now she leaned and wept. Now laid she in her lap those childhood toys, yet treasured in her bower, wherein his babe heart joyed long years agone. She saw a dart there left behind of him, and kissed it o'er and o'er, yea, whatso else her weeping eyes beheld that was her son's. Not heard he of her moans unutterable, but was afar, fast striding to the ship. He seemed, as his feet swiftly bare him on, like some all-radiant star, and at his side, with tidiest son, war-wise Odysseus went, and with them twenty gallant-hearted men, who Diadamia chose as trustiest of all her household, and unto her son gave them for henchmen, swift to do his will. 
and these attended Achilles' valiant son, as through the city to the ships he sped. On with glad laughter in their midst he strode, and Thetis and the Nereids joyed thereat. Yea, glad was even the raven-haired lord of all the sea, beholding that brave son of princely Achilles, marking how he longed for battle. Beardless boy, albeit he was, his prowess and his might were inward spurs to him. He hastened forth his fatherland, like to the war-god, when to gory strife he speedeth, wroth with foes, when maddeneth his heart, and grim his frown is, and his eyes flash levin flame around him, and his face is clothed with glory of beauty terriblet, as on he rusheth, quell the very gods. So seemed Achilles' goodly son, and prayers went up through all the city unto heaven to bring their noble prince safe back from war, and the gods hearkened to them. High he towered above the stateliest men which followed him. So they came to the heavy plunging sea, and found the rowers in the smooth-wrought ship, handling the tackle, fixing mast and sail. Straightway they went aboard. The shipmen cast the hawsers loose, and heaved the anchor stones, the strength and stay of ships in time of need. Then did the Sea Queen's lord grant voyage fair to these with gracious mind, for his heart yearned o'er the Achaeans, by the Trojan men and mighty souled Eurypylus hard bestead. On either side of Neoptolemus sat those heroes, gladdening his soul with tales of his sire's mighty deeds, of all he wrought in sea raids and in valiant Telephus' land, and how he smote round Priam's burg the men of Troy for glory unto Atreus' sons. His heart glowed, fain to grasp his heritage, his aweless father's honour and renown. In her bower, sorrowing for her son the while, the Adamia poured forth sighs and tears. With agony of soul her very heart melted in her, as over coal doth lead or wax, and never did her moaning cease, as o'er the wide sea her gaze followed him. I, for her son, a mother fretted still, though it be to a feast he hath gone by a friend bidden forth. But soon the sail of that good ship far-fleeting o'er the blue grew faint and fainter, melted in sea haze, but still she sighed, still day-long made her moan. On ran the ship before a following wind, seeming to skim the myriad surging sea, and crash the dark wave either side the prow. Swiftly across the abyss, unplumbed she sped. Night's darkness fell about her, but the breeze held, and the steersman's hand was sure. O'er gulfs of brine she flew, till dawn divine rose up to climb the sky. Then sighted they the peaks of Ida, Chrysa next, and Samynthia's fame, then the Sigean strand, and then the tomb of Aeacus' son. Yet would Laertes' seed, the man discreet of soul, not pointed out to Neoptolemus, lest the tide of grief too high should swell within his breast. They passed Calydna's isles, left Tenedos behind, and now was seen the fane of Ilius, where stands Protosilaus' tomb beneath the shade of Taucry elms, when soaring high above the plain their topmost boughs discern Troy, straightway wither all their highest sprays. Nigh Ilium now the ship by wind and oar was brought. They saw the long strand, fringed with keels of Argives, who endured sore travail of war, even then about the wall, the which themselves had reared to screen the ships and men in stress of battle, even now Eurypylus' hands to earth were like to dash it and destroy. But the quick eyes of Tydeus' strong son marked how rained the darts and stones along that long wall. Forth of the ship he sprang, and shouted loud with all the strength of his undaunted breast, Friends, on the Argive men is heaped this day sore travail. Let us don our flashing arms with speed, and to yon battle turmoil haste. For now upon our towers the warrior sons of Troy press hard, Nay, our cells shall fall before our due time, and shall lie in graves of Troyland, far from children and from wives. As one man down from the ship they leapt, for trembling seized on all for that grim sight, on all save all this Neoptolemus, whose might was like his father's, lust for war swept o'er him. To Odysseus' tent in haste they sped, for close it lay to where the ship touched land. 
About its walls there hung great store of change of armor, Of wise Odysseus some, and rescued some from gallant comrades slain. Then did the brave men put on goodly arms, But they in whose breast faintlier beat their hearts must don the worser. Odysseus stood arrayed in those which came with him from Ithaca. To Diomed he gave fair battle gear, stripped in time past for mighty Socus slain. But in his father's arms Achilles' son clad him, and lo, he seemed Achilles' self. Light on his limbs and lapping close they lay, so cunning was Hephaestus' workmanship, which for another had been a giant's arms. The massive helmet cumbered not his brows, yea, the great Pelian spear shaft burdened not his hand, but lightly swung he up on high the heavy and tall lance, thirsting still for blood. Of many Argives which beheld him then, might none draw nigh to him, how fain so e'er, so fast were they in that grim grapple locked with the wild war that raged all down the wall. But as when shipmen under a desolate isle mid the wide sea by stress of weather bound chafe, while afar from men the adverse blast prisoned them many a day, they pace the deck with sinking hearts, while scantlier grows their store of food, they weary, till a fair wind sings. So joyed the Archaean host, which theretofore were heavy of heart, when Neoptolemus came, joyed in the hope of breathing space from toil. Then, like the aweless lions, flashed his eyes, which mid the mountains leaps in furious mood to meet the hunters that draw nigh his cave, thinking to steal his cubs, there left alone in the dark-shadowed glen. But for the height the beast hath spied, and on the spoilers leaps with grim jaws, terribly roaring. Even so that glorious child of Aeacus all this sudden against the Trojan warriors burned in wrath. Thither his eagle swoop descended first, while loudest from the plain uproared the fight. There weakest he divined must be the wall, the battlements lowest, since the surge of foes break heaviest there. Charged at his side the rest, breathing the battle spirit. There they found Eurypylus, mighty of heart, and all his men, scaling a tower, exultant, in hope of tearing down the walls, of slaughtering the Argives in one holocaust. No mind the gods had to accomplish their desire. But now Odysseus, Diomed the strong, Leontius, and Neoptolemus, as a god in strength and beauty, held their javelins down and thrust them from the wall. As dogs and shepherds by shouting and hard fighting drive away strong lions from his steading, rushing forth from all sides, and the brutes with glaring eyes pace to and fro, with savage lusts for blood of calves and kind their jaws are slavering. Yet must their onrush give back from the hounds and fearless onset of the shepherd folk. So from these new defenders shrank the foe a little, as far as one may hurl a stone exceeding great. For still Eurypylus suffered them not to flee far from the ships, but cheered them on to buy the brunt, till the ships be won and all the Argives slain. For Zeus with measureless might thrilled all his frame. Then seized he a rugged stone and huge, and leapt and hurled it full against the high-built wall. It crashed! Terribly boomed that rampart steep to its foundations. Terror gripped the Greeks, as though the wall had crumbled down in dust. Yet from the deadly conflict flinched they not, but stood fast, like to jackals or to wolves, bold robbers of the sheep, when mid the hills hunter and hound would drive them forth their caves, being grimly purposed there to slay their whelps. Yet these, albeit tormented by the darts, flee not, but for their cubs' sake bide and fight, so for the ship's sake they abode and fought, and for their own lives. But Eurypylus, a front of all the ships, stood taunting them. Coward and dastard souls! No darts of yours had given me pause, nor thrust back from your ships, had not your rampart stayed mine onset rush. Ye are like to dogs that in the forest flinched before a lion, sulking there within ye are fighting. Nay, are shrinking back from death. But if ye dare come forth on Trojan ground, as once, when ye were eager for the fray, none shall from the ghastly death deliver you. Slain by my hand ye all shall lie in dust. So did he shout a prophecy unfulfilled, nor heard doom's chariot wheels fast rolling near, bearing swift death at Neoptolemus' hands, nor saw death gleaming from his glittering spear. Ay, and that hero paused not now from fight, but from the rampart smote the Trojans' eye. 
from that death leaping from above they quelled in tumult round eurypolis deadly fear gripped all their hearts as little children cower about a father's knees when thunder of zeus crashes from cloud to cloud when all the air shudders and groans so did the sons of troy with those Cetaeans round their great king cower ever as prince neoptolemus hurled for death rode upon all he cast and bare his wrath straight rushing down upon the heads of foes now in their hearts those wildered trojans said that once more they beheld achilles self gigantic in his armour yet they hid that horror in their breast lest panic fear should pass from them to the Cetaean host and king eurypolis on every side they wavered twixt the stress of their hearts straight and that blood-curdling dread twixt shame and fear as when men treading a precipitous path look up and see adown the mountain slope a torrent rushing on them thundering down the rocks and dare not meet its clamorous flood but hurry shuddering on with death in sight holding as not the perils of the path so stayed the trojans spite of their desire to flee the imminent death that waited them beneath the wall god like your ripolis i cheered them on to fight he trusted still that this new mighty foe would weary at last with toil of slaughter but he wearied not that desperate battle travail pallas saw and left the halls of heaven incense sweet and flew on mountain crest her hurrying feet touched not the earth borne by the air divine in form of cloud wreaths swifter than the wind she came to troy she stayed her feet upon sigium's windy ness she looked forth thence over the ringing battle of dauntless men and gave the achaeans glory achilles son beyond the rest was filled with valour and strength which win renown for men in whom they meet peerless was he in both the blood of zeus gave strength to his father's valour was he heir so by those towers he smote down many a foe and as a fisher on the darkling sea to lure the fish to their destruction takes within his boat the strength of fire his breath kindles it to a flame till round the boat glareth its splendour and from the black sea dart up the fish all eager to behold the radiance for the last time for the barbs of his three-pointed spear as up they leap slay them his heart rejoices o'er the prey so that war-king achilles glorious son slew host of onward rushing foes around that wall of stone well fought the achaeans all here there adown the ramparts rang again the wide strand the ships the battered walls groaned ever men with weary ache of toil fainted on either side sinews and might of strong men were unstrung but o'er the son of battle stay achilles weariness crept not his battle-eager spirit high was tireless never touched by palsying fear he fought on as with the triumphant strength of an ever-flowing river though it rolled twixt blazing forest though the maddening blast rolls stormy seas of flame it feareth not for at its brink faint grows the fervent heat the strong flood turns its might to impotence so weariness nor fear could bow the knees of hero achilles gallant-hearted son still as he fought still cheered his comrades on of myriad shafts sped at him none might touch his flesh but even as snowflakes on a rock fell vainly ever wholly screened was he by broad shield and strong helmet gifts of a god in these exulting did the achaean son stride along the wall with ringing shouts cheering the dauntless argives to the fray being their mightiest far bearing a soul insatiate of the awful onset cry burning with one strong purpose to avenge his father's death the myrmidons and their king exulted roared the battle round the wall two sons he slew of megas rich in gold scion of damas sons of high renown cunning to hurl the dart to drive the steed in war and deftly cast the lance afar born at one birth beside sancarius banks a periboia to him celtus one and eubius the other but not long his boundless wealth enjoyed they for the fates spanned them a thread of life exceeding brief as on one day they saw the light they died on one day by the same hand to the heart of one neoptolemus sped a javelin one he smote down with a massy stone that crashed through his strong helmet shattered all its ridge and dashed his brains to earth 
Around them fell foes many, a host untold. The war god's work waxed ever mightier till the even tide, till fell the light celestial. Then the host of brave Eurypylus from the ships drew back a little. They that held those leaguered towers had a short breathing space. The sons of Troy had respite from deadly choking strife from that hard rampart battle. Verily, all the Argives had beside their ships been slain, had not Achilles' strong son on that day withstood the host of foes and their great chief Eurypylus. Came to that young hero's side Phoenix the old, and marvelling gazed on the image of Pleiades. Tides of joy and grief swept o'er him, grief for memories of that swift-footed father, joy for sight of such a son. He for sheer gladness wept, for never without tears the tribes of men live. Nay, not mid the transports of delight. He clasped him round as father claspeth son, Whom, after long and troublous wanderings, The gods bring home to gladden a father's heart. So kissed he Neoptolemus' head and breast, Clasping him round, and cried in rapture of joy, Hail, goodly son of that Achilles, Whom I nursed a little one, In mine own arms with a glad heart. By heaven's high providence, like a strong sapling, waxed he in his stature fast, and daily I rejoiced to see his form and prowess, my life's blessing, honoring him as though he were the son of mine old age, for like a father did he honor me. I was indeed his father, he my son, in spirit. Thou hadst deemed us of one blood who were in heart one, but of nobler mould was he by far, in form and strength a god thou art wholly like him yea i seem to see alive amid the argives him for whom sharp anguish shrouds me ever i waste away in sorrowful age oh that the grave had closed on me while yet he lived how blessed to be by loving hands of kinsmen laid to rest ah child my sorrowing heart will never more forget him Chide me not for this my grief. But now help thou the Myrmidons and Greeks in their sore strait. Wreck on thy foe thy wrath for thy brave sire. It shall be thy renown to slay this war insatiate Telephus' son, for mightier art thou, and shalt prove than he, as was thy father than his wretched sire. Made answer, golden-haired Achilles' son. Ancient are battle prowers mighty fate and the o'er-mastering war-god shall decide. But as he spake, he had fain on that same day forth of the gates have rushed in his sire's arms. But night, which bringeth men release from toil, rose from ocean veiled in sable pall. With honour, as of mighty Achilles' self, him mid the ships the glad Greeks hailed, who had won courage from his eager rush to war. With princely presence did they honor him, with priceless gifts, whereby his wealth increased. For some gave gold and silver, handmade some, brass without weight gave these, and iron those. Others in deep jars brought the ruddy wine, yea, fleet-foot steeds they gave, and battle gear, and raiment woven fair by women's hands, glowed Neoptolemus' heart for joy of these. A feast they made for him amidst the tents. And there extolled Achilles' godlike son with praise as the immortal heavenly ones. And joyful-voiced Agamemnon spake to him. Thou verily art the brave-souled Achaean's son, his very image thou in stalwart might, in beauty, stature, courage, and in soul. My heart burns in me seeing thee. I trust thine hands and spear shall smite yon host of foes, shall smite the city of Priam world-renowned. So like thy sire thou art. Methinks I see himself beside the ships, as when his shout of wrath for dead Patroclus shook the ranks of Troy. But he is with the immortal ones, yet bending from that heaven, sends thee to-day to save the Argives on destruction's brink. Answered Achilles' battle-eager son, would I might meet him living yet, O king, that so himself might see the son of his love 
not shaming his great father's name. I trust so it shall be, if the gods grant me life. So spake he in wisdom and modesty, and all there marveled at the godlike man. But when with meat and wine their hearts were filled, then rose Achilles' battle-eager son, and from the feast passed forth unto the tent that was his sire's. Much armor of heroes slain lay there, and here and there were captive maids, arraying that tent widowed of its lord, as though its king lived. When that son beheld those Trojan arms and handmade thralls, he groaned by passionate longing for his father seized. As when through dense oak groves and tangled glens comes to the shadowed cave a lion's whelp, whose grim sire by the hunters hath been slain, and looketh all around that empty den, and seeth heaps of bones of steeds, and kine slain theretofore, and grieveth for his sire, even so the heart of brave Pleiades' son with grief was numbed. The handmaids marvelling gazed. And fair Briseis' self, when she beheld Achilles' son, was now right glad at heart, and sorrowed now with memories of the dead, her soul was wildered all, as though indeed there stood the aweless Aeacid, living yet. Meanwhile, exultant Trojans camped aloof, extolled Eurypylus the fierce and strong, as erst they had praised Hector when he smote their foes, defending Troy and all her wealth. But when sweet sleep stole over mortal men, the sons of Troy and battle-biding Greeks all slumber heavy, slept unsentineled. End of chapter 7。Chapter 8 of the Fall of Troy by Smyrnanius Quintus, translated by Arthur S. Way, born 13 February 1847, died 25 December 1930. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. When from the far sea line, where is the cave of dawn, rose up the sun, and scattered light over the earth, then did the eager sons of Troy and of Archaea arm themselves, a thirst for battle. These Achilles' son cheered on to face the Trojans awlessly, and those the giant strength of Telephus' seed kindled. He trusted to dash down the wall to earth, and utterly destroy the ships with ravening fire, and slay the Argive host. Ah, but his hope was as the morning breeze delusive. Hard beside him stood the fates, laughing to scorn his vain imaginings. Then to the Myrmidon spake Achilles' son, the Aulus, to fight in kindling them. Hear me, mine henchmen! Take ye to your heart the spirit of war, that we may heal the wounds of Argos, and be ruined to her foes. Let no man fear, for mighty prowess is the child of courage. But fear slayeth strength and spirit. Gird yourselves with strength for war. Give foes no breathing space, that they may say that mid our ranks Achilles liveth yet. Then clad he in his father's flashing arms his shoulders. Then exulted Thetis' heart from the sea, when she saw the mighty strength of her son's son. Then forth with eagle spread, afront that high wall he rushed, his car drawn by the immortal horses of his sire. As from the ocean verge upsprings the sun in glory, flashing fire far over earth, fire when beside his radiant chariot team races the red star Sirius, scatterer of wofulest diseases over men, so flashed upon the eyes of Ilium's host that battle-eager hero, Achilles' son. Onward they whirled him, those immortal steeds, the which, when now he longed to chase the foe back from the ships, Automedon, who wont to reign them for his father, brought to him. With joy that pair bore battleward their lord, so like to Aeacus' son. Their deathless hearts held him no worse than Achilles' self. Laughing for glee, the Argives gathered round the might resistless of Neoptolemus, eager for fight as wasps whose woodland bower the axe hath shaken, who dart, swarming forth, furious to sting the woodmen. Round their nest-long eddying they torment all passers-by, 
so streamed they forth from galley and from wall burning for fight and that wide space was thronged and all the plain far blazed with armor sheen as shone from heaven's vault the sun thereon as flees the cloud rack through the welkin wide scourged onward by the north wind's titan blast when winter tide and snow are hard at hand and darkness overpalls the firmament so with the thronging squadrons was the earth covered before the ships to heaven uprolled dust hung on hovering wings men's armor clashed rattled a thousand chariots horses neighed on rushing to the fray each warrior's prowess kindled him with its trumpet call to war as leaped the long sea rollers onward hurled by two winds terribly o'er the broad sea flood roaring from viewless bournes with whirlwind blast crashing together when a ruining storm maddens along the wide gulfs of the deep and moans the sea queen with her anguished waves which sweep from every hand up towering like precipice mountains while the bitter squall ceaselessly fearing shrieks across the sea so clashed in strife those hosts from either hand with mad rage strife incarnate spurred them on and their own prowess crashed together these like thunder clouds out lightning thrilling the air with shattering trumpet challenge when the blasts are locked in frenzied wrestle with mad breath rending the clouds when zeus is wroth with men who travail with iniquity and flout his law so grappled they as spear with spear clashed shield with shield and man on man was hurled and first Achilles' war impetuous son struck out stout Menelaus and Alcidamus, sons of the warlord Alexinomus, who dwelt in Carnas' mountain cradle, nigh the clear lake shining at Tarbellus' feet, neat snow capped Imbrus. Menes, fleet foot son of King Cassandra, slew he, born to him by fair Creusa, where the lovely streams of Lindris meet the sea, beside the marches of battle biding Carians, and the heights of Lycia, the renowned. He slew with all Maurice the spearman, who from Phrygia came. Polybus and Hippomedion by his side he laid, this stabbed to the heart, that pierced between shoulder and neck. Man after man he slew. Earth groaned neath Trojan corpses. Rank on rank crumbled before him, even as parts break sink down before the blast of ravening fire when the north wind of latter summer blows, so ruining squadrons fell before his charge. Meanwhile, Aeneas slew Aristocles, crashing a great stone down on his head. It brake helmet and skull together, and fled his life. Fleet for Eumaeus Diomed slew. He dwelt in craggy darkness, where the bride bed is, whereon Anchises clasped the queen of love. Agamemnon smote down Stratus, unto Thrace returned he not from war, but died far off from his dear fatherland. And Moronis struck Clemnus down, Piacinor's son, the friend of godlike Glaucus and his comrade Leal, who by Laramus outfall dwelt. The folk honored him as their king, when reigned no more Glaucus in battle slain. All who abode around Phaeonice's towers, and by the crest of Massititis and Camara's glen. So man slew man in fight, but more than all Eurypolis hurled doom on many a foe. First he slew battle by the Eurytus, Minotius of the glancing Taslet next, Elephino's godlike comrades. Fell these with Harpalus, wise Odysseus' warrior friend. But in the fight afar that hero toiled, and might not aid his fallen henchmen. Yet fierce Antiphus for that slain man was wroth, and hurled his spear against Eurypolis, yet touched him not. The strong shaft glanced aside, and pierced Melanion, battle staunch, the son of Cleate, lovely faced, Euralus' bride, who bare him where Caiacus meets the sea. Wroth for his comrade slain, Eurypolis rushed upon Antiphus, but terror winged he plunged amid his comrades. So the spear of the avenger slew him not, whose doom was one day wretchedly to be devoured by the man-slaying Cyclops. So it pleased stern fate, I know not why. Elsewhither sped Eurypolis, and I, as he rushed on, fell neath his spear a multitude untold as tall trees smitten by the strength of steel in mountain forest fill the dark ravines heaped on the earth confusedly so fell the achaeans neath eurypolis flying spears till heart uplifted met him face to face achilles son the long spears in their hands they twain swung up each hot to smite his foe 
But first Eurypylus cried the challenge cry. Who art thou? Whence hast come to brave me here? To Hades' merciless fate is bearing thee, For in grim fight hath none escaped mine hands. But whoso, eager for the fray, have come hither, On all have I hurled anguished death. By Xanthus streams have dogs devoured their flesh And gnawed their bones. Answer me, who art thou? Whose be the steeds that bear thee exultant on? Answer Achilles' battle-eager son. Wherefore, when I am hurrying to the fray, Thus thou, a foe, put question thus to me, As might a friend, touching my lineage, which many know. Achilles' son am I, son of the man Whose long spear smote thy sire, and made him flee. Yea, and the ruthless fates of death had seized him, But my father's self healed him upon the brink of woeful death. The steeds which bear me were my godlike sires, these the west wind begat, the harpy bear. Over the barren sea their feet can race, skimming its crest. In speed they match the winds. Since then thou knowest the lineage of my steeds and mine, now put thou to the test the might of my strong spear. Born on steep Pelion's crest, who hath left his father's stock and forest there. He spake, and from the chariot sprang to earth that glorious man, he swung the long spear up, but in his brawny hand his foe hath seized a monstrous stone. Full at the golden shield of Neoptolemus he sped its flight. But, no whit staggered by its whirlwind rush, he like a giant mountain foreland stood, which all the banded fury of river floods cannot stir, rooted in the eternal hills. So stood unshaken still Achilles' son. Yet not for this Eurypylus' dauntless might shrank from Achilles' son invincible spurred on by his own hardihood and by fate their hearts like cauldrons seethed o'er the fires of wrath their glancing armour flashed about their limbs like terrible lions each on other rushed which fight amid the mountains famine stung writhing and leaping in the strain of strife for a slain ox or stag while all the glens ring with their conflict so they grappled so clashed they in pitiless strife on either hand long lines of warriors Greek and Trojan toiled in combat. Round them roared up the flames of war. Like mighty rushing winds they hurled together, with eager spears for blood of life athirst. Hard by them stood Eno, spurred them on ceaselessly. Never paused they from the strife. Now hewed they each other's shield, and now thrust at the greaves, now at the crested helms. Reckless of wounds in that grim toil pressed on those aweless heroes, Strife incarnate watched and gloated o'er them. Ran the sweat in streams from either. Straining hard they stood their ground, For both were of the seed of blessed ones. From heaven, with hearts at variance, God looked down, For some gave glory to Achilles' son, Some to Eurypylus the godlike. Still on they fought, Giving ground no more than rock, Of granite mountains. Rang from side to side spear-smitten shields, at last the Pelian lance, sped onward by a mighty thrust, hath passed clear through your ribbonless throat. Forth poured the blood, torrent-like. Through the portal of the wound the soul from the body flew. Darkness of death dropped o'er his eyes. To earth in clanging arms he fell, like stately pine or silver fir uprooted by the fury of Boreas. Such space of earth Eurypylus' giant frame covered in falling, Rang again the floor in plains of Troyland. Grey death pallor swept over the corpse, And all the flush of life faded away. With a triumphant laugh shouted the mighty hero over him. Eurypylus, thou saidst thou wouldst destroy the Danian ships and men, Wouldst slay us all wretchedly, But the gods would not fulfill thy wish. For all thy might invincible, My father's massy spear hath now subdued thee under me. That spear no man shall scape, though he be brass all through, who faceth me. He spake, and tore the long lance from the course, while shrank the Trojans back in dread at sight of that strong-hearted man. Straightway he stripped the armor from the dead, for friends to bear fast to the ships Achaean. But himself to the swift chariot and tireless steeds sprang, and sped onward like a thunderbolt that lightning girded, Leaped through the wide air from Zeus's hand unconquerable, 
the bolt before whose downrush all the immortals quell save only zeus it rusheth down to earth it rendeth trees and rugged mountain tops so rushed he on the trojans flashing doom before their eyes dashed to the earth they fell before the charge of those immortal steeds the earth was heaped with slain was dyed with gore as when in mountain glens the unnumbered leaves downstreaming thick and fast hide all the ground so host of troy untold on earth was strewn by neoptolemus and fierce-hearted greeks shed by whose hands the blood in torrents ran neath the feet of men and horses chariot rails were dashed with blood spray whirling up from the tires now had the trojans fled within their gates as calves that flee a lion or as swine flee a storm but murderous ares came unmarked of other gods down from the heavens eager to help the warrior sons of troy red fire and flame tumult and panic fear his car steeds bear him down into the fight the coursers which to roaring boreas grim-eyed erenes bear coursers that breathe life blasting flame groaned all the shivering air as battle where they sped swiftly he came to troy loud rang the earth beneath the feet of that wild team into the battle's heart tossing his massy spear he came with a shout he cheered the trojans on to face the foe they heard and marvelled at that wondrous cry not seeing the gods immortal form nor steeds veiled in dense mist but the wise prophet soul of hellenus knew the voice divine that leapt unto the trojans ears they knew not whence and with glad heart to the fleeing host he cried o cravens wherefore fear achilles son though ne'er so brave he is mortal even as we his strength is not as airy strength who was come a very present help in our sore need that was his shout far pealing bidding us to fight on against the argives let your hearts be strong o friends let courage fill your breast no mightier battle helper can draw nigh to troy than he who is of more avail for war than ares when he aideth men hard fighting lo to our help he cometh now on to the fight cast to the winds your fears they fled no more they faced the argive men as hounds that mid the copses fled at first then turned them about to face and fight the wolf spurred on by the chiding of their shepherd lord so turned the sons of troy again to war casting away their fear man leapt on man valiantly fighting how their armor clasped smitten with swords with lances and with darts spears plunged into men's flesh dread ares drank his full of blood struck down fell man on man as greek and trojan fought in level poise the battle balance hung as when men in hot haste prune a vineyard with the steel and each keeps pace with each in rivalry since all in strength and age be equal matched so did the awful scales of battle hang level all trojan hearts beat high and firm stood they in trust on aweless ares might while the greeks trusted in achilles son ever they slew and slew stalked through the midst deadly eno her shoulders and her hands blood splashed a fearful sweat streamed from her limbs reveling in equal fight she aided none lest thetis or the war god's wrath be stirred then neoptolemus slew one far renowned perimedes who had dwelt by simintheus grove next cestrus died phalaris battle staunch perilassus the strong Penelcus, lord of spears whom Ipha Anasia bare by the haunted foot of Scylla to the cunning craftsman Medon. In the homeland afar his sire abode, and never kissed his son's returning head. For that fair home and all his cunning works did far-off kinsmen wrangle o'er his grave. Diphobus slew Lycon, battle-staunch. The lance had pierced him close above the groin, and round the long spear all his bowels gushed out. Aeneas smote down Timus, who erewhile in Aulis dwelt, and followed into Troy Arcesilaus, and saw never more the dear homeland. Euryalus hurled a dart, and threw as the ray as breast the death winged point flew, shearing through the breathways of man's life, and all that lay within was trenched with blood. And hard thereby great Solagenor slew Hippomenes, hero Tursa's comrade staunch, with one swift thrust twixt shoulder and neck. His soul rushed forth in blood death's night swept over him 
grief for his comrade slain on Tursa fell. He strained his bow, a swift winged shaft he sped, but smote him not, for lightly Agenor swerved. Yet nigh him Diaphontes stood, the shaft into his left eye plunged, passed through the ball, and out through his right ear, because the fates, whither they will, thrust on the bitter barbs. Even as in agony he leapt full height, yet once again the archer's arrow hissed, it pierced his throat, through the neck sinews cleft unswerving, and his hard doom came on him. So man to man dealt death, and joyed the fates and doom, and fell strife in her maddened glee shouted aloud, and Ares terribly shouted in answer, and with courage thrilled the Trojans, and with panic fear the Greeks, and shook their reeling squadrons. But one man he scared not, even Achilles' son, he abode and fought undaunted, slaying foes on foes, as when a young lad sweeps his hand around flies swarming over milk, and nigh the bowl here and there they lie, struck dead by that light touch, and gleefully the child still plies the work. So stern Achilles' glorious Scion joyed over the slain, and recked not of the god who spurred the Trojans on. Man after man tasted his vengeance of their charging host. Even as a giant mountain peak withstands on rushing hurricane blast, so he abode unquailing. Ares, at his eager mood, grew wroth, and would have cast his veil of cloud away, and met him face to face in fight. But now Athena from Olympus swooped to forest mantled Ida. Quaked the earth in Xanthus' murmuring streams, so mightily she shook them. Terror stricken were the souls of all the nymphs, a dread for Priam's town. From her immortal armor flashed round hovering lightnings. Fearful serpents breathed fire from her shield invincible. The crest of her great helmet swept the clouds, and now she was at point to close in sudden fight with Ares. But the mighty will of Zeus daunted them both. From high heaven thundering his terrors, Ares drew back from the war, for manifest to him was Zeus's wrath. To wintry Thrace he passed, his haughty heart reeked no more of the Trojans. In the plain of Troy no more stayed Pallas. She was gone to hallowed Athens. But the army still strove in the deadly fray, and fainted now the Trojans' prowess. But all battle fain the Argives pressed on these as they gave ground. As winds chase ships that fly with straining sails on to the out sea, as on the forest breaks leapeth the fury of flame, as swift hounds drive deer through the mountains eager for the prey, so did the Argives chase them. Achilles' son still cheered them on, still slew with that great spear, whom so he overtook. On, on they fled, till into stately-gated Troy they poured. Then had the Argives a short breathing space from war, when they had penned the host of Troy in Priam's burg, as shepherds pen up lambs upon a lonely steading, as when, after hard strain, a breathing space is given to oxen, that, quick panting neath the yoke, up a steep hill have dragged a load, so breathed a while the Achaeans after toil in arms. Then once more hot for the fray did they beset the city towers, but now with gates fast barred the Trojans from the walls withstood the assault, as when within their steading shepherd folk abide the lowering tempest, when a day of storm hath dawned, with fury of lightnings, rain, and heavy drifting snow, and dare not haste forth to the pasture, howsoever fain, till the great storm abate, and rivers wide with rushing floods again be passable. So trembling on their walls they abode the rage of foes against their ramparts surging fast. And as when daws or starlings drop in clouds down upon an orchard close, full fain to feast upon its pleasant fruits, and take no heed of men that shout to scare them thence away, until the reckless hunger be appeased that makes them bold, so poured round Priam's burg the furious Danians. Against the gates they hurled themselves, they strove to batter down the mighty soul earth-shaker's work divine. Yet did the Troy folk not, despite their fear, flinch from the fight. They manned their towers, they toiled unresting, ever from the fair-built walls, let arrows, stones, and fleet-winged javelins down amidst the thronging foes. For Phoebus thrilled their souls with steadfast hardihood. Fain was he to save them still, though Hector was no more. Then Mariona shot with a deadly shaft, and smote Philodemus, Polita's friend beneath the jaw. The arrow pierced his throat. 
Down fell he like a vulture from rock By Fowler's barbed arrow shot and slain. So from the high tower swiftly down he fell. His life fled, clanged his armor o'er the corpse. With laughter of triumph stalwart Molus' son a second arrow sped, With strong desire to smite Politus, ill-starred Priam's son. But with the deadly side swerve did he escape the death, Nor did the arrow touch his flesh. As when a shipman, as his bark flies on o'er sea gulfs, Spies amid the rushing tide a rock, And to escape it swiftly puts the helm about, And turns aside the ship even as he listeth, That a little strength averts a great disaster, so did he foresee and shun the deadly shaft of doom. Ever they fought on, walls, towers, battlements were blood besprent, wherever Trojans fell, slain by the arrows of the stalwart Greeks. Yet these escaped not scatheless, many of them dyed the earth red. I waxed the havoc of death, as friends and foes were stricken, o'er the strife shouted for glee Eno, sister of war. Now had the Argives burst the gates, had breached the walls of Troy, for boundless was their might. But Ganymedes saw from heaven, and cried, anguished with fear for his own fatherland. O oh, father Zeus, if of thy seed I am, if at thine hest I left far famous Troy for immortality with deathless gods, hear me now, whose soul is anguished thrilled. I cannot bear to see my father's town in flames, my kindred in disastrous strife perishing. Bitter a sorrow is there none. Oh, if thine heart is fixed to do this thing, let me be far hence. Less shall be mine grief if I behold it not with these mine eyes. That is the depth of horror and of shame to see one's country wrecked by hands of foes. With groans and tears so pleaded Ganymede. Then Zeus himself with one vast pall of cloud veiled all the city of Priam world-renowned and all the murderous fight was drowned in mist. And like a vanished phantom was the wall, in vapours heavy hung no eye could pierce. And all around, crashing thunders, lightnings flamed from heaven. The Danians heard Zeus' clarion peal, awestruck, and nearly a son cried unto them. Far famous lords of Argives, all our strength palsied shall be, while Zeus protecteth thus our foes. A great tide of calamity on us is rolling. Haste we then to the ships. Cease we awhile from bitter toil of strife, lest the fire of his wrath consume us all. Submit we to his portents. Needs must all obey him ever, who is mightier far than all strong gods, all weakling sons of men. On the presumptuous titans once in wrath he poured down fire from heaven, then burned all earth beneath, an ocean's world engulfing flood boiled from its depths, yea, to its utmost bounds. Far flowing mighty rivers were dried up, perished all broods of life sustaining earth, all fosterlings of the boundless sea, and all dwellers in the rivers. Smoke and ashes veiled the air, earth fainted in the fervent heat. Therefore, this day I dread the might of Zeus. Now pass we to the ships since for to-day he helpeth Troy. To us too shall he grant glory hereafter. For the dawn on men, though whiles it frown, anon shall smile. Not yet, but soon shall fate lead us to smite yon town. If true indeed was Calchas' prophecy, spoken aforetime to the assembled Greeks, that in the tenth year Priam's burg should fall. Then left they that far famous town, and turned from war, in awe of Zeus's threatenings, hearkening to one with ancient wisdom wise. Yet they forgot not friends in battle slain, but bare them from the field and buried them. These the mist hid not, but the town alone, and its unscalable wall, around which fell Trojans and Argives many in battle slain. So came they to the ships, and put from them their battle gear, and strode into the waves of Hellespont, fair flowing, and washed away all stain of dust and sweat, and clotted gore. The sun drave down his never-wearying steeds into the dark west. Night streamed o'er the earth, bidding men to cease from toil. The Argives then acclaimed Achilles' valiant son with praise high as his father's. Mid triumphant mirth he feasted in king's tents, 
no battle toil had wearied him for thetis from his limbs had charmed all ache of travail making him as one whom labour had no power to tire when his strong heart was satisfied with meat he passed to his father's tent and over him sleep's dews were poured the greeks slept in the plain before the ships by ever-changing guards watched for they dreaded lest the host of troy or of her staunch allies should kindle flame upon the ships and from them all cut off their home return in priam's burg the while by gate and wall men watched and slept in turn a dread to hear the argives onset shout End of chapter 8Chapter 9 of The Fall of Troy by Smyrnanius Quintus Translated by Arthur S. Way Born 13 February 1847 Died 25 December 1930 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain When ended was night's darkness and the dawn rose from the world's verge, and the wide air glowed with splendor. Then did Argos warrior sons gaze o'er the plain, and lo, all cloudless clear stood Ilium's towers. The marvel of yesterday seemed a strange dream. No thought the Trojans had of standing forth to fight without the wall. A great fear held them thralls. The awful thought that yet alive was Peleus' glorious son. But to the king of heaven Antenor cried, Zeus! Lord of Ida in the starry sky, hearken to my prayer. O oh, turn back from our town that battle-eager murderous-hearted man, be he Achilles who hath not passed down to Hades or some other like to him. For now in heaven descended Priam's burg by thousands are her people perishing. No respite cometh from calamity. Murder and havoc evermore increase. O oh, Father Zeus, thou carest not though we be slaughtered of our foes. Thou helpest them, forgetting thy son godlike darkness. But if this be the purpose of thine heart, that Argive shall destroy us wretchedly, now do it, draw not out our agony. In passionate prayer he cried, and Zeus from heaven hearkened, and hastened on the end of all, which else he had delayed. He granted him this awful boon, that myriads of Troy's sons should with their children perish. But that prayer he granted not, to turn Achilles' son back from the wide wayed town, nay, all the more he enkindled him to war, for he would now give grace and glory to the Nered queen. So purposed he, of all gods the mightiest. But now between the city and the Hellespont were Greeks and Trojans, burning men and steeds in battle slain, while paused the murderous strife. For Priam sent his herald Menotheus forth to Agamemnon and the Achaean chiefs, asking a truce wherein to burn the dead. And they, of reverence for the slain, gave ear. For wrath pursueth not the dead. And when they had lain their slain on those close thronging pyres, then did the Argives to their tents return, and unto Priam's gold abounding halls the Trojans, for Eurypylus sorrowing sore. For even as Priam's sons they honored him. Therefore, apart from all the other slain, before the gate Dardinian, where the streams of Eddian Xanthos down from Ida flow, fed by the veins of heaven, they buried him. Aweless Achilles' son the while went forth to his sire's huge tomb. Outpouring tears, he kissed the tall memorial pillar of the dead, and groaning clasped it round, and thus he cried, Hail, father, though beneath the earth thou lie in Hades' halls, I shall forget thee not. Oh, to have met thee living mid the host! Then of each other had our souls had joy, then of her wealth had we spoiled Ilium, but now... Thou hast not seen thy child, nor I seen thee, who yearn to look on thee in life. Yet, though thou be afar amidst the dead, thy spear, thy son, have made thy foes to quail. And Danians, with exceeding joy, behold, one like to thee in stature, fame and deeds. He spake, and wiped the hot tears from his face, and to his father's ships passed swiftly thence. With him went Myrmidon warriors two and ten, and white-haired phoenix followed on these, woefully sighing for the glorious dead. Night rose o'er earth, the stars flashed out in heaven. So these break red, and slept till woke the dawn. Then the Greeks donned their armor, 
flashed afar its splendor up to the very firmament. Forth of the gates in one great throng they poured, like snowflakes thick and fast, which drift adown heavily from the clouds in winter's cold. So streamed they forth before the wall, and rose their dread shout, groaned the deep earth beneath their tramp. The Trojans heard that shout, and saw the host, and marveled. Crushed with fear were all their hearts foreboding doom. For like a huge cloud seemed that throng of foes, with clashing arms they came. Volumed and vast the dust rose beneath their feet. Then either did some god with hardihood thrill the Iphibus heart, and make it void of fear, or his own spirit spurred him on to fight, to drive with thrust of spear that terrible host of foemen from the city of his birth. So there in Troy he cried with heartening speech, O oh, friends, be stout of heart to play the men. Remember all the agonies that war brings in the end to them that yield to foes. Ye wrestle not for Alexander alone, nor Helen, but for home, for your own lives, for wives, for little ones, for parents gray, for all the grace of life, for all ye have, for this dear land. Oh, may she shroud me o'er, slain in battle, ere I see her lie neath foemen's spears. My country! I know not a bitterer pang than this for hapless men. Oh, be ye strong for battle! Forth to fight with me, and thrust this horror far away. Think not Achilles liveth still to war against us. Him the ravening fire consumed. Some other Archaean was it who so late enkindled them to war. Oh, shame it were if men who fight for fatherland should fear Achilles' self, or any Greek beside. Let us not flinch from war toil. Have we not endured much battle travail hitheretofore? What? Know ye not that you men sorely tried prosperity and joyance follow toil? So, after scourging winds and ruining storm, Zeus brings to men a morn of balmy air. After disease, new strength comes. After war, peace. All things know time's changeless law of change. Then, all eager for war, they armed themselves in haste. All through the town rang clangor of arms, as for grim fight strong men arrayed their limbs. Here stood a wife, shuddering with dread of war, yet piling as she wept her husband's arms before his feet. There little children brought to a father his war gear with eager haste. And now his heart was wrung to hear their sobs, and now he smiled on those small ministers, and stronger waxed his heart's resolve to fight to the last gasps for these, the near and dear. Yonder again, with hands that had not lost old cunning, a grey father for the fray girded a son, and murmured once and again, Dear boy, yield thou to no man in the war, and showed his son the old scars on his breast, proud memories of fights fought long ago. So when they all stood mailed in battle gear, forth of the gates they poured all eager soul for war. Against the chariots of the Greeks, their chariots charged, their ranks of footmen pressed to meet the footmen of the foe. The earth rang to the tramp of onset, pealed the cheer from man to man, swift closed the fronts of war. Loud clashed their arms all round. From either side war cries were mingled in one awful roar. Swift winged full many a dart and arrow flew from host to host. Loud clanged the smitten shield neath thrusting spears, neath javelin point and sword. Men hewed with axes lightning down. Crimson armor ran with the blood of men. And all this while Troy's wives and daughters watched from high walls that grim battle of the strong. All trembled as they prayed for husbands, sons, and brothers, white-haired sires amidst them sat and gazed, while anguished fear for sons devoured their hearts. But Helen in her bower abode amidst her maids, there held by utter shame. So without pause before the wall they fought, while death exulted o'er them, Deadly strife shrieked out a long wild cry from host to host. With blood of slain men dust became red mire. Here, there, fast fell the warriors mid the fray. Then slew to Iphibus the charioteer of Nestor. Hippos' son, from that high car, down fell he amidst the dead. Fear seized his lord, lest, while his hands were cumbered with the reins, he too by Priam's strong son might be slain. Melanthius marked his plate. Swift he sprang upon the car, he urged the horses on, shaking the reins, goading them with his spear, seeing the scourge was lost. But Priam's son left these, and plunged them in a throng of foes. For there upon many he brought the day of doom. For like a ruining tempest on he stormed through reeling ranks, his mighty hands struck down foes numberless. The plain was heaped with dead. 
as when a woodman on the long ridged hills plunges amid the forest deeps and hews with might and main and fells sap laden trees to make him store of charcoal for the heaps of billets over turfed and set afire the trunks on all sides fallen strew the slopes while o'er his work the man exulteth so before deiphobus swift death-dealing hands in heaps the achaeans each on other fell the charging lines of troy swept over some some fled to xanthos stream the Iphibus chased into the flood yet more, and slew and slew. As when on fish abounding Hellespont's strand, the fishermen hard straining drag a net forth of the depths to land, but while it trails yet through the sea, one leaps amid the waves, grasping in hand the sinuous headed spear to deal the swordfish death, and here and there, fast as he meets them, slays them, and with blood the waves are reddened. So were Xanthos streams enfurled by his hands, and choked with dead yet not without sore loss the Trojans fought. For all this while Pleiades' fierce heart son of other ranks made havoc. Thetis gazed rejoicing in her son's son with a joy as great as was her grief for Achilles slain. For a great host beneath his spear were hurled down to the dust, steeds, warriors slaughter blent. And still he chased, and still he slew. He smote Hermades, war-renowned, who on his steed bore down on him, but of his horsemanship small profit won. The bright spear pierced him through, from navel unto spine, and all his bowels gushed out, and deadly doom laid hold on him, even as he fell beside his horse's feet. Ascanius and Oenopes next he slew. Under the fifth rib of one he drave his spear, the other stabbed he neath the throat, where a wound bringeth surest doom to man. Whom so he met besides he slew, the names what man could tell of all that day of Neoptolemus died. Never his limbs waxed weary, as some brawny laborer, with strong hands toiling in a fruitful field the live-long day, rains down to earth the fruit of olives, swiftly beating with his pole, and with a downfall covers all the ground. So fast fell neath his hands the thronging foe. Elsewhere did Agamemnon, Tydeus' son, and other chieftains of the Danians toil with fury in the fight never quell the mighty men of Troy. With heart and soul they also fought, and ever stayed from flight such as gave back. But many heeded not their chiefs, but fled, cowered by the Achaeans' might. Now at last Achilles' strong son marked how fast besides commander's outfall Greeks were perishing. Those Troyward fleeing foes whom he had followed slaying left he now, and bade Automedon thither drive, where hosts were falling of the Achaeans. Straightway he hearkened, and scourged the steeds immortal on to that wild fray. Bearing their lord, they flew swiftly o'er the battle highways paved with death. As Ares' chariot borne to murderous war fares forth, and round his onrush quakes the ground, while on the gods' breasts clashed celestial arms, outflashing fire, so charged Achilles' son against the Iphibus. Clouds of dust upsoared about his horse's feet. Automedon marked the Trojan chief and knew him. To his lord straightway he named that hero war-renowned. My king, this is the Iphibus array, the man who from thy father fled in fear. Some god or fiend with courage fills him now. Nought answered Neoptolemus, save to bid drive on the steed yet faster, that with speed he might have heard grim death from perishing friends. But when to each other now nigh full they drew, the Iphibus, despite his battle lust, stayed, as a ravening fire stays when he beats water. He marvelled, seeing Achilles' steeds and that gigantic son, huge as his sire, and his heart wavered, choosing now to flee, and now to face that hero, man to man. As when a mountain boar from his young brood chases the jackals, then a lion leaps from hidden ambush into view. The boar halts in his furious onset, loath to advance, loath to retreat, while foam his jaws about his wetted tusk. So halted Priam's sons, car steeds, and car, perplexed, while quivered his hands about the lance. Shouted Achilles' son, Ho, Priam's son, why thus so mad to smite those weaker Argives, who have feared thy wrath, and fled thine onset, so thou deemest thyself far mightiest, if thine heart be brave indeed, of my spear now make trial in the strife. On rushed he, as a lion against a stag, borne by the steed and chariot of his sire. And now, full soon his lance had slain his foe, him and his charioteer. But Phoebus poured a dense cloud round him from the viewless heights of heaven, and snatched him from the deadly fray, and set him down in Troy, amid the rout of fleeing Trojans. So did Peleus' son stab but empty air, and loud he cried, Dog, thou hast escaped my wrath. 
no might of thine save thee, though ne'er so fain. Some god cast night's veil o'er thee, and snatch thee from thy death. Then Cronos' son dispersed that dense dark cloud, mist like it thinned and vanished into air. Straightway the plain and all the land were seen. Then far away about the Scaean gate he saw the Trojans. Seeming like his sire, he sped against them. They at his coming quelled. As shipmen tremble when a wild wave bears down on their bark, wind heaved until it swings broad, mountain high above them, when the sea is mad with tempest. So, as on he came, terror clad all those Trojans as a cloak. The while he shouted, cheering on his men, Here, friends, fill full your hearts with dauntless courage, the strength that well beseemeth mighty men who thirst to win them glorious victory, to win renown from battle's tumult. Come, brave hearts, now strive we even beyond our strength till we smite Troy's proud city, till we win our heart's desire. Foul shame it were to abide long deedless here and strengthless, womanlike. Ere I be called war blencher, let me die. Then unto Ares' work their spirits flamed. Down on the Trojans charged they, yea, and these fought with high courage, round their city now, and now from wall and gate towers. Never lulled the rage of war, while Trojan hearts were hot to hurl the foemen back, and the strong Greeks to smite the town. Grim havoc compassed all. Then, eager for the Trojans' help, swooped down out of Olympus, cloaked about with clouds, the son of Leto. Mighty rushing winds bare him in golden armor clad, and gleamed with lightning splendor of his descent the long highways of air. His quiver clashed, loud rang the welkin. The earth re-echoed as he set his tireless feet by Xanthos, pealed his shout dreadly, with courage filling them of Troy. Scaring their foes from biding the red fray. But of all this the mighty shaker of the earth was where He breathed into the fainting Greeks' fierce valor, And the fight waxed murderous through those immortals' clashing wills. Then died host numberless on either side. In wrath Apollo thought to smite Achilles' son In the same place where erst he smote his sire. But birds of boding streamed to left to stay his mood, And other signs from heaven were sent. Yet was his wrath not minded to obey these portents. Swiftly drew Earthshaker nigh, in mist celestial cloaked. About his feet quaked the dark earth, as came the sea-king on. Then to stay Phoebus' hand he cried to him, Refrain thy wrath! Achilles' giant son slay not! Olympus' lord himself shall be wroth for his death, And bitter grief shall light on me and all the sea-gods, As erstwhile for Achilles' sake. Nay, get thee back to height celestial, lest thou kindle me to wrath, and so I cleave a sudden chasm in earth, and Ilium, and all her walls go down to darkness. Thine own soul were vexed thereat. Then, overawed by the brother of his sire, and fearing for Troy's fate and for her folk, to heaven went back Apollo, to the sea Poseidon. For the sons of men fought on, and slew, and strife incarnate gloating watched. At last by Calchas' counsel, Achaea's sons drew back to the ships, and put them from the thought of battle, seeing it was not foreordained that Ilium should fall into the might of war-wise Philoctetus came to aid the Achaean host. This had the prophet learned from birds of prosperous omen, or had read in hearts of victims. Wise in prophecy lore was he, and like a god knew things to be. Trusting in him, the sons of Atreus stayed awhile the war, and unto Lemnos' land of stately mansions they sent Tydeus' son, and battle-staunch Odysseus over sea. Fast by the fire-god city sped they on, over the broad flood of the Aegean Sea, to vine-clad Lemnos, where in far-off days the wives wreaked murderous vengeance on their lords, in fierce wrath that they gave them not their due, but couched beside the handmade thralls of Thrace, the captives of their spears when they had laid waste the land of warrior Thracians. Then these wives, their hearts with fiery jealousy's fever filled, murdered in every home with merciless hands their husbands. No compassion would they show to their own wedded lords. Such madness shakes the hearts of man or woman when it burns with jealousy's fever, stung by torturing pangs. So with souls filled with desperate hardihood, in one night did they slaughter all their lords, 
and on a widowed nation rose the sun. To hallowed Lemnos came those heroes twain. They marked the rocky cave where lay the son of princely Poias. Horror came on them when they beheld the hero of their quest, groaning with bitter pangs on the hard earth lying, with many feathers round him strewn, and others round his body rudely sewn into a cloak, a screen from winter's cold. For oft, as famine stung him, would he shoot the shaft that missed no foul his aim had doomed. Their flesh he ate, their feathers vestured him, and there lay herbs and healing leaves, the which spread on his deadly wound assuaged its pangs. While tangled elf-locks hung about his head, he seemed a wild beast that hath set its foot prowling by night upon a hidden trap, and so hath been constrained in agony to bite with fierce teeth through the prisoned limb, ere it could win back to its cave. And there, in hunger and torturing pains, it languisheth. So in that wide cave, suffering crushed the man, and all his frame was wasted, not but skin covered his bones. Unwashen, there he crouched with famine-haggard cheeks, with sunken eyes, glaring his misery neath cavernous brows. Never his groaning ceased, for evermore the ulcerous black wound, eating to the bone, festered with thrills of agonizing pain, as when a beetling cliff, by seething seas I buffeted, is carved and underscooped, for all its stubborn strength, by tireless waves, till, scourged by winds, and lashed by tempest flails, the sea into deep caves hath gnawed its base, so greater neath his foot grew evermore the festering wound, dealt when the envenomed fangs tear him of that fell water-snake, which men say dealeth ghastly wounds incurable, when the hot sun hath parched it as it crawls over the sands, and so that mightiest man lay faint, and wasted his cureless pain. And from the ulcerous wound I streamed to earth, fetid corruption, fouling all the floor of that wide cave, a marvel to be heard of men unborn. Beside his stony bed lay a long quiver full of arrows, some for hunting, some to smite his foes withal, with deadly venom of that fell water-snake with ease besmeared. Before it, nigh to his hand, lay the great bow, with curving tips of horn, wrought by the mighty hands of Hercules. Now when that solitary spied these twain draw nigh to his cave, he sprang to his bow, he laid the deadly arrow on the string, for now fierce memory of his wrongs awoke against these, who had left him years agone, in pain, groaning on the desolate seashore. Yet, and his heart's stern will had he swiftly wrought, but even as upon that godlike twain he gazed, Athena caused his bitter wrath to melt away. Then drew they nigh to him, with looks of sad compassion, and sat down on either hand beside him in the cave, and of his deadly wound and grievous pangs asked. And he told them all his sufferings, and they spake hope and comfort. And they said, Thy woeful wound, thine anguish shall be healed, if thou but come with us to Achaea's host the host that now is sorrowing after thee with all its kings, and no man of them all was cause of thine affliction, but the fates, the cruel ones, whom none that walk the earth escape. But I, they visit hapless men unseen, and day by day with pitiless hearts, now they afflict men, now again exalt to honour. None knows why. For all the woes and all the joys of men do these devise after their pleasure. Hearkening he sat to Odysseus and to godlike Diomede, and all the hoarded wrath for olden wrongs, and all the torturing rage melted away. Straight to the strand dull thundering, and the ship, laughing for joy, they bare him with his bow. There washed they all his body in that foul wound with sponges, and with plenteous water bathed. So was his soul refreshed. Then hastened they, and made meat ready for the famished man and in the galley supped with him. Then came the balmy night, and sleep slid down on them. Till rose the dawn they tarried by the strand of sea-girt Lemnos, but with the day-spring cast the hawsers loose, and heaved the anchor-stones out of the deep. Athena sent a breeze, blowing behind the galley taper-proud. They strained the sail with either stern sheet taut. Seaward they pointed the stout girded ship, o'er the broad flood she leapt before the wind, broken to right and left the dark waves side, 
and seething all around was hoary foam. While thronging dolphins raced on either hand, flashing along the paths of silver sea. Full soon to fish fraught Hellespont they came, and the far stretching ships. Glad were the Greeks to see the longed for faces. Forth the ships with joy they stepped. And Peoeus' valiant son on those two heroes leaned thin, wasted hands, who bare him painfully halting to the shore, staying his weight upon their brawny arms. As seems mid mountain breaks, an oak or pine by strength of woodcutter half hewn through, which for a little stands on what was left of smooth trunk by him who hewed thereat hard by the roots, that its slow smouldering wood might yield him pitch. Now, like one in pain, it groans, in weakness borne down by the wind. It is upstayed upon its leafy boughs, which from the earth bear up its helpless weight. So by pain unendurable bowed down, he leaned on those brave heroes, and was borne unto the war-host. Men beheld, and all compassionated that great archer, crushed by anguish of his hurt. But one drew near, Podalirius, godlike in his power to heal. Swifter than thought he made him whole and sound, for deftly on the wound he spread his salves, calling on his physician father's name. And soon the Achaeans shouted all for joy, all praising with one voice Asclepius' son. Lovingly they bathed him, and with oil anointed. All his heaviness of cheer and misery vanished by the immortal's will, and glad at heart were all that looked on him. And from affliction he awoke to joy. Over the bloodless face the flush of health glowed, and for wretched weakness mighty strength thrilled through him. Goodly and great waxed all his limbs, as when a field of corn revives again, which erst had drooped by rains of ruining storm down beaten flat, but by warm summer winds requickened, o'er the laboured land it smiles. So Philoctetus erstwhile wasted frame was all requickened. In the galley's hold he seemed to have left all cares that crushed his soul. And Atreus' sons beheld him, marvelling, as one re-risen from the dead. It seemed the works of hands immortal. And indeed so it was verily, as their hearts divined. For twas the glorious Trito born that shed stature and grace upon him. Suddenly he seemed as when of old mid Argive men he stood, before calamity struck him down. Then unto wealthy Agamemnon's tent did all their mightiest men bring Peoeus' son, and set him chief in honour at the feast, extolling him. When all with meat and drink were filled, spake Agamemnon, lord of spears, Dear friend, since by the will of heaven our souls were once perverted, that in sea-girt Lemnos we left thee, harbour not within thine heart fierce wrath for this. By the blessed gods constrained we did it, and, I trow, the immortals will to bring much evil on us bereft of thee, who art of all men skilfulest to quell with shafts of death all foes that face thee in fight. For all the tangled paths of human life by land and sea are by the will of fate hid from our eyes, in many and devious tracks are cleft apart, in wandering mazes lost. Along them men by fortune's dooming drift like unto leaves that drive before the wind. Oft on an evil path the good man's feet stumble, the brave finds not a prosperous path, and none of earth-born men can shun the fates, and of his own will none can choose his way. So then doth it behoove the wise of heart, though on a troublous track the winds of fate sweep him away, to suffer and be strong. Since we were blinded then, and erred herein, with rich gifts will we make amends to thee hereafter, when we take the stately towers of Troy. But now receive thou handmaiden seven, fleet steeds two score, victors in a chariot race, and tripods twelve, wherein thine heart may joy through all thy days, and always in my tent shall royal honour at the feast be thine. He spake, and gave the hero those fair gifts. Then answered Poeas, mighty-hearted son, Friend, I forgive thee freely, and all beside who so against me haply hath transgressed. I know how good men's minds sometimes be warped. Nor meet is it that one be obdurate ever, and nurse mean rancors. Sternest wrath must yield anon unto the melting mood. Now pass we to our rest, for better is sleep than feasting late for him who longs to fight. 
He spake, and rose, and came to his comrade's tent. Then swiftly for their war-fain king they dight the couch, while laughed their hearts for very joy. Gladly he laid him down to sleep till dawn. So passed the night divine, till flushed the hills in the sun's light, and men awoke to toil. Then, all athirst for war, the Argive men gan wet the spear smooth-shafted, or the dart, or javelin, and they break the bread of dawn, and foddered all their horses. Then to these spake Peoea's son with battle-kindling speech, Up, let us make ready for the war. Let no man linger mid the galleys, ere the glorious walls of Ilium's stately tower be shattered, and her palaces be burned. Then at his words, each heart and spirit glowed. They donned their armor, they grasped their shields. Forth of the ships in one huge mass they poured, arrayed in bullhide bucklers, ashen spears, and gallant crested helms. Through all their ranks, shoulder to shoulder, they marched. Thou hadst seen no gap twixt man and man as on they charged. So close they thronged, so dense was their array. End of chapter 9Chapter 10 of The Fall of Troy by Smyrnanius Quintus Translated by Arthur S. Way Born 13 February 1847 Died 25 December 1930 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Now were the Trojans without the wall of Priam armor-clad, With battle-cars and chariot-steeds, For still they burnt their dead. And still they feared lest the Achaean men should fall on them. They looked, and saw them come with furious speed against the walls. In haste they cast a hurried earth mound o'er the slain, For greatly trembled they to see their foes. Then in their sore disquiet spake to them Polydamus, A wise and prudent chief. Friends, unendurably against us now maddens the war. Go to... Let us devise how we may find deliverance from our strait. Still by the Danians here, still gather strength. Now, therefore, let us man our stately towers, and thence withstand them, fighting night and day, until yon Danians weary and return to Sparta, or, renownless lingering here beside the wall, lose heart. No strength of her shall breach the long walls, howsoe'er they strive. For in the imperishable work of gods, weakness is none. Food, drink we shall not lack. For in Priam's gold-abounding halls is stored abundant food that shall suffice for many more than we through many years. Though thrice so great a host that our desire should gather, eager to maintain our cause. Then chode with him Anchises' valiant son, Polydamus, wherefore do they call thee wise, who biddest suffer endless tribulations cooped within walls? Never, howe'er so long the Achaeans tarry here, will they lose heart. But when they see us sulking from the field, more fiercely will press on. So ours shall be the sufferance, perishing in our native home, if for long season they beleaguer us. No food, if we be pent within our walls, shall Thebes send us, nor may I only a wine, but wretchedly by famine shall we die, though the great wall stand firm. Nay, Though our lot should be to scape that evil death and doom, and not by famine miserably to die, yet rather let us fight in armor clad for children and grave fathers. Haply Zeus will help us yet. Of his high blood are we. Nay, even though we be abhorred of him, better straightway to perish gloriously, fighting unto the last for fatherland, than to die a death of lingering agony. Shouted they all who heard that gallant reed, Swiftly with helms and shields and spears they stood in close array. The eyes of mighty Zeus from heaven beheld the Trojans armed for fight against the Danians. Then did he awake courage in these and those, that there might be strain of unflinching fight twixt host and host. That day was Paris doomed, for Helen's sake fighting, by Philoctetes' hands to die. In one place strife incarnate drew them all, the fearful battle queen beheld of none, but cloaked in clouds blood raining. On she stalked, swelling the mighty roar of battle. Now rushed through Troy's squadrons, 
through Achaea's now. Panic and fear still waited on her steps to make their father's sister glorious. From small to huge that fury stature grew, her arms of adamant were blood besprent. The deadly lance she brandished reached the sky. Earth quaked beneath her feet. Dread blast of fire flamed from her mouth. Her voice pealed thunder-like, kindling strong men. Swift closed the fronts of fight, drawn by a dread power to the mighty work. Loud as the shriek of winds that madly blow in early spring, when the tall woodland trees put forth their leaves, loud as the roar of fire blazing through the sun-scorched breaks, loud as the voice of many waters, when the wide sea raves beneath the howling blast, with thunderous crash of waves, when shake the fearful shipmen's knees, so thundered earth beneath their charging feet. Strife swooped on them. Foe hurled himself on foe. First did Aeneas of the Danians slay Harpalion, Arizelus Scion, born in far Boethia of Aphomenoe, who came to Troy to help the Argive men with godlike Prothonia. Neath his waist Aeneas stabbed him and left sweet life from him. Dead upon him he cast Thersander's son, for the barbed javelin pierced through Hylas' throat, whom Aretheus by Lathaeus bare in Crete. Sore grieved Idomeneus for his fall. By this, Pleiades' son had swiftly slain twelve Trojan warriors with his father's spear. First Cebrus fell, Harmon, Pasithius then, Hysminius, Chedus, and Imbrasius, Phagus, Manessus, Enomus, Amphinous, Phasus, Calnus last, who had his home by Gargas' steep, a mighty warrior he among Troy's mightiest. With a countless host to Troy he came, for Priam, Dardanus' son, promised him many gifts and passing fair. Ah, fool! His own doom he never foresaw, whose weird was suddenly to fall in fight, ere he bore home King Priam's glorious gifts. Doom, the destroyer, against the Argives sped valiant Aeneas' friend Eurymenes. Wild courage spurred him on, that he might slay many, and then fill death's cup for himself. Man after man he slew like some fierce beast, and foes shrank from the terrible rage that burned on his life's verge, nor recked of imminent doom. Yea, peerless deeds in that fight had he done. Had not his hands grown weary, his spearhead bent utterly, his sword availed him not, snapped at the hilt by fate. Then Megas' dart smote neath his ribs, blood spurted from his mouth, and in death's agony doom stood at his side. Even as he fell, Epeius henchmen twain, Dileon and Amphion, rushed to strip his armor, but Aeneas, brave and strong, chilled their hot hearts in death beside the dead, as one in latter summer mid his vines kills wasps that dart about his ripening grapes, and so, ere they may taste the fruit they die, so smote he them, ere they could seize the arms. Menon and Amphius Tydeus slew, both goodly men, Paris slew Hippasus' son Demoleon, who in Lycia's land beside the outfall of Eurotas dwelt, the stream deep flowing. And to Troy came with Menelaus. Under his right breast the shaft of Paris smote him unto death, driving his soul forth like a scattering breath. Cursor slew Zechus, Medon's war-famed son, who dwelt in Phrygia, land of myriad flocks, below that haunted cave of fair-haired nymphs, where, as Endymion slept beside his kind, divine Selina watched him from on high, and slid from heaven to earth, for passionate love drew down the immortal stainless queen of night. And a memorial of her couch abides still neath the oaks, for mid the copses round was poured out milk of kind, and still do men marvelling behold its whiteness. Thou wouldst say far off that this was milk indeed, which is a wellspring of white water, if thou draw a little nigher, lo, the stream is fringed as though with ice, for white stone rims it round. Rushed on Alcasius Megas, Phileus' son, and drave his spear beneath his fluttering heart. Loosed were the cords of sweet life suddenly, and his sad parents longed in vain to greet that son returning from the woeful war to Margassus and Phyllis, lovely girt, dwellers by loosened streams of Harpasus who pours the full blood of his clamorous flow into Meander, madly rushing eye. With Glaucus' warrior comrade Scalacius, 
Oleus's son closed in the fight, and stabbed over the shield rim, and the cruel spear passed through his shoulder, and drenched his shield with blood. Howbeit he slew him not, whose day of doom awaited him far beside the wall of his own city. For when Ilium's towers were brought low by that swift avenging host, fleeing the war to Lycia, then he came alone. And when he drew nigh to the town, the thronging women met and questioned him touching their sons and husbands, and he told how all were dead. They compassed him about and stoned the man with great stones that he died. So he had no joy of his winning home, but the stones muffled up his dying groans, and of the same his ghastly tomb was reared beside Bellerophon's grave and holy place in Talos, nigh that far-famed Camara's crag. Yet though he thus fulfilled his day of doom, as a god afterward men worshipped him by Phoebus' hest, and never his honour fades. Now Poeas son of the wild slew the Ionas, and the Machus, and Tenor's warrior son. Yea, a great host of strong men he laid low, on, like the war-god, through his foes he rushed, or as a river roaring in full flood breaks down long dikes, when, maddening round its rocks, down from the mountain swelled by rain it pours, an ever-flowing mighty rushing stream, whose foaming crest over its foreland sweep. So none who saw him, even from afar, dared meet renowned Peoeas, valiant son, whose breast with battle-fury was filled, whose limbs were clad in mighty Hercules' arms of cunning workmanship. For on the belt gleamed bears most grim and savage, jackals fell, and panthers, in whose eyes seemed to lurk a deadly smile. There were fierce-hearted wolves, and boars with flashing tusks, and mighty lions, all seeming strangely alive, and there portrayed all through its breath were battles, murder rife, with all these mortals covered was the belt, and with yet more the quiver was adorned. There Hermes was, storm-footed son of Zeus, slaying huge Argus, nigh to Anacus' streams, Argus, whose sentinel eyes in turn took sleep. And there was Phaethon, from the sun-car hurled into Eridanus. Earth verily seemed ablaze, and black smoke hovered on the air, there Perseus slew Medusa, gorgon-eyed by the stars' baths and utmost bounds of earth, and fountains of deep-flowing ocean, where night in the far west meets the setting sun. There was the titan, Lepatus' great son, hung from the beetling crag of Caucasus in bonds of adamant, and the eagle tear his liver unconsumed. He seemed to groan. All these Hephaestus cunning hands had wrought for Hercules, and these to Poeas' son, most near of friends and dear he gave to bear. So, glorying in those arms, he smote the foe. But Paris at the last to meet him sprang fearlessly, bearing in his hands the bow and deadly arrows. But his latest day now met himself. A flying shaft he sped forth from the string, which sang as leapt the dart, which flew not vainly, yet the very mark it missed. For Philoctetus swerved aside a hairbreadth, and it smote above the breast Cleodorus, war-renowned, and cleft a path clear through his shoulder, for he had not now the buckler broad which wore to fence from death its bearer, but was falling back from fight, being shieldless, for Polydamus' massy lance had cleft the shoulder-belt whereby his targe hung, and he gave back, therefore, fighting still with stubborn spear. But now the arrow of death fell on him, as from ambush leaping forth, so fate will thy trow to bring dread doom on noble-hearted Lernus Scion, born of Amphiali, in Rhodes the fertile land. But soon as Peoeas, battle-eager son, marked him by Paris' deadly arrow slain, swiftly he strained his bow, shouting aloud, Tog, I will give thee death, will speed thee down to the unseen land, who darest to brave me. And so shall they have rest, who travail now for thy vile sake. Destruction shall have end when thou art dead, the author of our bane. Then to his breast he drew the plated cord. The great bow arched, the merciless shaft was aimed straight, and the terrible point a little peered above the bow in that constraining grip. Loud sang the string as the death-hissing shaft leapt, and missed not, yet was Paris' heart not stilled. 
but his spirit yet was strong within him, for that first arrow was not winged with death. It did but graze the fair flesh by his wrist. Then once again the avenger drew the bow, and the barbed shaft of Peoria's son had plunged ere he could swerve, twixt flank and groin. No more he abode the fight, but swiftly hasted back, as haste a dog, which on a lion rushed at first, then fleeth, terror-stricken back. So he, his very heart with agony thrilled, fled from the war. Still clashed the grappling host, man slaying man. Ay, bloodlier waxed the fray as rained the blows. Corpse on corpse was flung confusedly, like thunder drops or flakes of snow, or hailstones by wintry blast that Zeus behest strewn over the long hills and forest boughs. So by a pitiless doom slain, friends and foes in heaps on heaps were strown. Sorely groaned Paris. With torturing wound fainted his spirit. Leeches sought to allay his frenzy of pain. But now drew back to Troy the Trojans, and the Danians to their ships swiftly returned. For dark night put an end to strife, and stole from men's limbs weariness, pouring upon their eyes pain-healing sleep. But through the live-long night no sleep laid hold of Paris, for his help no leech availed, though ne'er so willing by his salves. His weird was only by Oenoe's hands to escape death's doom, if so she willed. Now he obeyed the prophecy, and he went exceeding loath, but grim necessity forced him thence to face the wife forsaken. Evil boding fowl shrieked o'er his head, or darted past to left still as he went. Now as he looked at them his heart sank, but hope whispered, haply vain their bodings are. But on their wings were borne visions of doom that blended with his pain. Into Oenoe's presence thus he came. Amazed her thronging handmaids looked on him, as at the nymph's feet that pale suppliant fell, faint with the anguish of his wound, whose pangs stabbed him through brain and heart. Yea, quivered through his very bones, for that fierce venom crawled through all his innards with corrupting fangs, and his life fainted in him, agony thrilled. As one with sickness and tormenting thirst consumed lies parched, with heart quick shuddering, with liver seething in flame, the soul scarce conscious, fluttering at his burning lips, longing for life, for water longing sore, so was his breast one fire of torturing pain. Then in exceeding feebleness he spake. O oh, reverenced wife, turn not from me in hate, for that I left thee widowed long ago. Not of my will I did it. The strong fates dragged me to Helen. O oh, that I had died ere I embraced her, and thine arms had died. Ah, by the gods, I pray, the lords of heaven, by all the memories of our wedded love, be merciful. Banish my bitter pain. Lay on my deadly wound those healing salves, which only can, by fate's decree, remove this torment if thou wilt. Thine heart must speak my sentence, to be saved from death or no. Pity me, oh, make haste to pity me. This venom's might is swiftly bringing death. Heal me, while life yet lingers in my limbs. Remember not those pangs of jealousy, nor leave me to a cruel doom to die. Lo, fallen at thy feet, this should offend the prayers, the daughters of the thunderer Zeus, whose anger followeth unrelenting pride with vengeance, and the Orenus executes their wrath. My queen, I sinned, in folly sinned, Yet from death save me, O oh, make haste to save. So prayed he, but her darkly boding heart was stilled, and her words mocked his agony. Thou comest unto me, thou who didst leave a while a wailing wife in a desolate home, didst leave her for thy tender darling. Go, lie laughing in her arms for bliss. She is better than thy true wife, is, rumour saith, immortal. Make haste to kneel to her, but not to me. Weep not to me, nor whimper pitiful prayers. Oh, that mine heart beat with a tigress strength, 
that I might tear thy flesh and lap thy blood for all the pain thy folly brought on me. Vile wretch! Where now is love's queen glory crowned? Hath Zeus forgotten his daughter's paramour? Have them for thy deliverers. Get thee hence, far from my dwelling, curse of gods and men. Yea, for through thee, thou, miscreant, sorrow came on deathless gods, for sons and sons' sons slain. Hence from my threshold, to thy Helen go. Agonize day and night beside her bed. There, whimper, pierced through the heart with cruel pangs, until she heal thee of thy grievous pain. So from her door she drave that groaning man. Ah, fool, not knowing her own doom, whose weird was straightway after him to tread the path of death. So fate had spun her destiny thread. Then, as he stumbled down through Ida's brakes, where doom on his death path was leading him, painfully halting, Packed with heart-sick pain, Hera beheld him with rejoicing soul, throned in the Olympian palace court of Zeus. And seated at her side were handmaidens four, whom radiant face Selene bare to the sun to be unwearying ministers in heaven, in form and office, diverse each from each. For of the seasons one was summer's queen, and one of winter and his stormy star, of spring the third, of autumn tide the fourth, so in four portions parted is man's year, ruled by these queens in turn. But of all this be Zeus himself the overseer in heaven. And of those issues now he spake with her, which baleful fate in her all-ruining heart was shaping to the birth, the new espousals of Helen, fatal to Deiphobus, the wrath of Helenus, who hoped in vain for that fair bride, and how when he had fled, wroth with the Trojans, to the mountain height, Achaea's sons would seize him, and would hail unto their ships, how by his counselling strong Tydeus' son should with Odysseus scale the great wall, and should slay Alcathous the temple warder, and should bear away Pallas the Gracious with her free consent, whose image was the sure defence of Troy. Yea, for not even a god, how wroth so e'er, had power to lay the city of Priam waste, while that immortal shape stood water there. No man had carven that celestial form, but Cronos' son himself had cast it down from heaven to Priam's gold-abounding burg. Of these things with her handmaidens did the queen of heaven hold converse, and of many such. But Paris, while they talked, gave up the ghost on Ida. Never Helen saw him more. Loud well the nymphs around him, for they still remembered how their nursling wont to lisp his childish prattle, compassed with their smiles. And with them mourned the neat herds, light of foot, sorrowful hearted, moaned the mountain glens. Then unto travail burdened Priam's queen, a herdsman told the dread doom of her son. Wildly her trembling heart leapt when she heard, with failing limbs she sank to earth and wailed, Dead, thou dead, O oh, dear child, grief heaped on grief thou hast bequeathed me, grief eternal. Best of all my sons, save Hector alone, wast thou. While beats my heart, my grief shall weep for thee. The hand of heaven is in our sufferings. Some fate devised our ruin. Oh, that I had lived not to endure it, but had died in wealthy days of peace. But now I see woes upon woes, and ever look to see worse things. My children slain, my city sacked and burned with fire by stony-hearted foes daughters sons wives all trojan women held into captivity with our little ones so well she but the king heard not thereof but weeping ever sat by hector's grave for most of all his sons he honoured him his mightiest the defender of his land nothing of paris knew that pierced heart but long and loud lamented Helen. Yet those wails were but for Trojan ears. Her soul with other thoughts was busy, as she cried, Husband to me, to Troy, and to thyself a bitter blow, is this thy woeful death? 
in misery hast thou left me and i look to see calamities more deadly yet oh that the spirits of storm had snatched me from the earth when first i fared with thee drawn by baleful fate it might not be the gods have met in ruin to thee and me with shuddering horror all men look on me all hate me place of refuge is there none for me for if to the daddy and host i fly with torments will they greet me if i stay troy's daughters and sons will here compass me and rend me earth shall not cover my corpse but dogs and fowl of raven shall devour oh had fate slain me ere i saw these woes so cried she but for him far less she mourned than for herself remembering her own sin yea and troy's daughters but in semblance well for him of other woes their hearts were full some thought on parents some on husbands slain these on sons on honoured kinsmen those only one heart was pierced with grief unfeigned o enoe not with them of troy she well but far away within that desolate home moaning she lay on her lost husband's bed as when the copses on high mountains stand white veiled with frozen snow which o'er the glens the west wind blast have strown but now the sun in east wind melted fast and the long heights with watercourses stream and down the glades slide as they thaw the heavy sheets to swell the rushing waters of an ice-cold spring so melted she in tears of anguished pain and for her own husband agonized and cried to her heart with miserable moans woe for my wickedness oh hateful life i loved mine hapless husband dreamed with him to pace to eld's bright threshold hand in hand heart in heart the gods ordained not so oh had the black fates snatched me from the earth ere i from paris turned away in hate my living love hath left me yet will i dare to die with him for i loathe the light so cried she weeping weeping piteously remembering him whom death had swallowed up wasting as melteth wax before the flame yet secretly being fearful lest her sire should mark it or her handmaidens till the night rose from broad ocean flooding all the earth with darkness bringing men release from toil then while her father and maidens slept slid she the bolts back of the outer doors and rushed forth like a storm blast fast she ran as when a heifer mid the mountains speeds her heart with passion stung to meet her mate and madly races with flying feet and fears not in her frenzy of desire the herdsman as her wild rush bears her on so she but find her mate amid the woods so down the long tracks flew our enemy's feet seeking the awful pyre to leap thereon no weariness she knew as upon wings her feet flew faster ever onward spurred by fell fate and the cyperian queen she feared no shaggy beast that met her in the dark who erst had feared them sorely rugged rock and precipice of tangled mountain slope she trod them all on stumbling torrent bed she leapt the white moon goddess from on high looked on her and remembered her own love princely endemion and she pitied her in that wild race and shining overhead in her full brightness made the long tracks plain through mountain gorges so she won to wear wild other nymphs round alexander's corpse roared up about him a great wall of fire for from the mountains far and near had come shepherds and heaped the death bell broad and high for loves and sorrows latest service done to one of old their comrade and their king sore weeping stood they round she raised no well broken-hearted when she saw him there but in her mantle muffling up her face leapt on the pyre loud well that multitude there burned she clasping paris all the nymphs marvelled beholding her beside her lord flung down and heart to heart speak whispering 
verily evil-hearted Paris was, who left a leal true wife, and took for bride a wanton to himself, and Troy a curse. Ah, fool, who recked not of the broken heart of a most virtuous wife, who more than life loved him who turned from her and loved her not. So in their hearts the nymphs spake, but they twain burned on the pyre, never to hail again the dayspring. Wandering shepherds stood around, as once the thronging Argives marvelling saw Evadne clasping mid the fire her lord Capaneus, slain by Zeus' dread thunderbolt. But when the blast of devouring fire had made twain one, O Enoe and Paris, now one little heap of ashes, then with wine quenched they the embers, and they laid their bones in a wide golden vase, and round them piled the earth mound, and they set two pillars there that each from other ever turn away, for the old jealousy in the marble lives. End of chapter 10Chapter 11 of The Fall of Troy by Smyrnanius Quintus Translated by Arthur S. Way Born 13 February 1847 Died 25 December 1930 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Troy's daughters mourned within her walls. Might none go forth to Paris' tomb, For far away from high-built Troy it lay. But the young men without the city toiled unceasingly in fight, wherein from slaughter rest was none, though dead was Paris. For the Achaeans pressed hard on the Trojans, even unto Troy. Yet these charged forth, they could not choose but so, for strife and deadly Eno in their midst stalked, like the fellow Aeneas to behold, breathing destruction from their lips like flame. Beside them raged the ruthless hearted fates, fiercely. Here panic fear, and Ares there stirred up the host. Hard after followed dread with slaughter's gore besprent, that in one host men might see and be strong, in the other fear. And all around were javelins, spears, and darts. Murder athirst thirst from this side, that side showered. Aye, as they hurled together, armor clashed, as foe with foe grappled in murderous fight. There Neoptolemus slew Laomedas, whom Lycaon nurtured by fair Xanthos' stream. The stream revealed to men by Leto, pride of Thunderer Zeus, when Lycaon's stormy plain was by her hand uptorn mid agonies of travail throes, wherein she brought to light mid bitter pangs those babes of birth divine. Tyrus upon him laid he dead, the spear crashed through his jaw, and clear through mouth and tongue passed. On the lance's irresistible point shrieking he was paled, Flooded with gore his mouth was, as he cried. The cruel shaft sped on by that strong hand, Dashed him to the earth in throes of death. Even or next he smote above the flank, And onward drave the spear into his liver. Swiftly anguished death came upon him. If it he on next he slew, He quelled Hippodamion, Hippasus' bold son, Whom Ocyone the nymph had borne Beside Sangarius' river flow. Ne'er welcomed she her son's returning face, But ruthless fate with anguish thrilled her Of her child relieved. Paramon Aeneas slew, And Adromachus of Knossus this, Of hallowed Lycus that, On one spot both from their swift chariots fell. This gasped for death, His throat by the long spear transfixed, That other by a massy stone Sped from a strong hand on the temple struck, breathed out his life, and black doom shrouded him. The startled steeds, bereft of charioteers, fleeing mid all those corpses, were confused, and princely Aeneas' henchmen seized on them, with hearts exulting in the goodly spoil. There Philoctetes with his deadly shaft smote Pyrrhasus in act to flee the war. The tendons trained behind the knee it snapped, and palsied all his speed. A Danian marked, 
and leapt on that maimed man with sweep of sword, shearing his neck through. On the breast of earth the headless body fell, the head far flung, when rolling with lips parted as to shriek, and swiftly fleeted thence the homeless soul. Palidamus struck down Eurymachus, and Cleon with his spear. From Seme came, with Nereus following these. Cunning were both in craft of fisher folk, to cast the hook baited with guile, to drop into the sea the net. From the boat's prow with deftest hands, swiftly and straight to plunge the three forked spear. But not from bane their sea craft save them now. Eurypylus, battle staunch, laid Hellas low, whom Cleato bare beside Gagea's mare, Cleato the fair cheek. Face down in the dust outstretched he lay, shorn by the cruel sword from his strong shoulder, fell the arm that held his long spear. Still its muscles twitched, as though fain to uplift the lance for fight, in vain. For the man's will no longer stirred therein, but aimlessly it quivered, even as leaps the severed tail of a snake malignant eyed, which cannot chase the man who dealt the wound. So the right hand of that strong-hearted man, with impotent grip, still clutched the spear for fight. Anus and Polydorus Odysseus slew. Cetaeans both, this perished by his spear, that by his sword death-dealing. Stantilus smote godlike Albus with a javelin cast. On through his throat and shuddering nape it rushed. Stopped were his heartbeats, all his limbs collapsed. Tydeus slew Laodocus. Meleus fell by Agamemnon's hand. Deiphobus smote Halcimus and Dryas. Hippasus, how war-renowned so e'er a Gino slew, far from Peneus' river. Crushed by fate, love's nursing debt to parents ne'er he paid. Lamus and stalwart Lyncus Thoas smote, and Meronius slew Lycon. Menelaus laid low Archelochus. Upon his home looked down Corycia's ridge, and that great rock of the wise fire-god, marvellous in men's eyes. For thereon, night-long, day-long, unto him fire blazes, tireless and unquenchable. Laden with fruit around its palm-trees grow, while mid the stones fire plays about their roots. God's work is this, a wonder to all time. By Tursa, princely Hippomedion's son was slain. Menoites, as the archer drew on him, rushed he to smite him, but already hand and eye and bowcraft keen were aiming straight on the arching horn of the shaft. Swiftly released, they leapt on the hapless man, while sang the string. Stricken full front, he heaved one choking gasp, because the fates on the arrow riding flew right to his heart, the throne of thought and strength for men, whence the short path is unto death. Far from his brawny hand, Euryalus hurled a massy stone, and shook the ranks of Troy, as when in anger against long screaming cranes a watcher in the fields leaps from the ground, with swift hand whirling round his head the sling, and speeds the stone against them, Scattering before its hum their ranks far down the wind outspread, And they in huddled panic dart with wild cries, This way and that, who theretofore swept on in ordered lines. So shrank the foe to left and right From that dread bolt of doom hurled by Euryalus. Not in vain it flew, fate-winged, It shattered Mila's helm and head down to the eyes, So met him ghastly death. Still man slew man, and earth groaned all around, as when a mighty wind scourges the land, and this way and that, under its shrieking blasts through the wide woodland bow the roots and fall great trees, while all the earth is thundering round. So fell they in the dust, so clanged their arms, so crashed the earth around. Still hot were they for fell fight, still dealt pain unto their foes. Nigh unto Aeneas Apollo came, and to Eurymachus, brave Antenor's son. For these against the mighty Achaeans fought shoulder to shoulder, as two strong oxen, matched in age, yoked to a wain, nor ever ceased from battling. Suddenly spake the god to these in Polymestor's shape. The seer his mother by Xanthus bare to the far daughter's priest. Eurymachus, Aeneas! Seed of gods, to a shame if ye should flinch from the Argives. 
Nay, not Ares' self should joy to counter you, And ye were to face him in the fray. For fate hath spun long destiny threads for thee and thee. He spake and vanished, mingling with the winds. But their hearts felt the gods' power. Suddenly flooded with boundless courage were their frames. Maddened their spirits. On the foe they leapt like furious wasp that in the storm of rage swoop on bees, beholding them draw nigh in latter summer to the mellowing grapes, or from their highs forth streaming thitherward. So fiercely leapt these sons of Troy to meet war-hardened Greeks. The black fates joyed to see their conflict. Ares laughed. Eno yelled horribly. Loud their glancing armor clanged. They stabbed. They hewed down hosts of foes untold with irresistible hands. The reeling ranks fell as the swath falls in the harvest heat when the swift-handed reapers ranged adown the fields long furrows ply the sickle fast. So fell before their hands ranks numberless. With corpses earth was heaped, with torrent blood was streaming. Strife incarnate o'er the slain gloated. They paused not from the awful toil, but I pressed on, like lions chasing sheep. Then turned the Greeks to craven flight. All feet unmaimed as yet fled from the murderous war. I followed on Anchises' warrior son, smiting foes' backs with his avenging spear. On pressed Eurymachus, while glowed the heart of healer Apollo, watching from on high. As when a man descries a herd of swine draw nigh his ripening corn, before the sheaves fall neath the reaper's hands, and hearkeneth on against them his strong dogs. As down they rush, the spoilers see and quake. No more they think of feasting, but they turn in panic flight, huddling. Fast followed at their heels the hounds, biting remorselessly, while long and loud squealing they flee, and joys the harvest lord. So rejoiced Phoebus, seeing from the war fleeing the mighty Argive host. No more they cared for the deeds of men, but cried to the gods for swift feet, in whose feet alone was hope to escape Eurymachus and Aeneas' spears, which lightened ever along their rear. But one Greek, overtrusting his strength, or by fate's malice to destruction drawn, curb did mid-flight from war's turmoil his steed and strove to wheel him round into the fight to face the foe. But fierce Agenor thrust ere he was ware, his two-edged partisan sure through the shoulder. Yea, the very bone of that gashed arm was cloven by the steel. The tendons parted, the veins spirited blood. Down by his horse's neck he slid, and straight fell mid the dead. But still the strong arm hung with rigid fingers, locked about the reins like a live man's. Weird marvel was that sight. The bloody hand down hanging from the rein scared the foes yet more by Ares' will. Thou hadst said, it craveth still for horsemanship. So bear the steed that sign of his slain lord. Aeneas hurled his spear. It found the waist of Anthalus' son. It pierced the navel through, dragging the innards with it. Stretched in the dust, clutching with agonized hand at steel and bowels, horribly shrieked he. Tore with his teeth the earth, groaning, till life and pain forsook the man. Scared were the Argives, like a startled team of oxen neath the yoke pan, straining hard, what time the sharp fanged gadfly stings their flanks, a thirst for blood. And they, in frenzy of pain, start from the furrow, and sore disquieted the hind is for marred work, and for their sake lest haply the recoiling plowshare light on their leg sinews and hamstring his team. So were the Danians scared, so feared for them Achilles' son, and shouted, thunder-voiced, Cravens, why flee, like starlings nothing worth, scared by a hawk that swoopeth down on them. Come, play the men. Better it is far to die in war than choose unmanly flight. Then to his cry they hearkened, and straightway were of good heart. Mighty of mood, he leapt upon the Trojans, swinging in his hand the lightning spear. Swept after him his host of Myrmidons, with hearts swelled with the strength resistless of a tempest. So the Greeks won a breathing space. 
with fury like his sires one on other slew he of the foe recoiling back they fell as waves on rolled by boreas foaming from the deep to the strand are caught by another blast that whirlwind like leaps in a short lull of the north wind forth smites them full face and hurls them back from the shore so them that erewhile on the danians pressed god like achilles son now backward hurled a short space only brave aeneas spirit let him not flee but made him bide the fight fearlessly and eno level held the battle scales yet not against aeneas achilles son upraised his father's spear but else whither turned his fury in reverence for aphrodite that his splendour veiled Turn from that man her mighty son's son's rage and giant strength on other host of foes. There he slew many a Trojan, while the ranks of Greeks were ravaged by Aeneas' hand. Over the battle slain the vultures joyed, hungry to rend the hearts and flesh of men. But all the nymphs were wailing, daughters born of Xanthus and fair flowing Samoas. So toiled they in the fight. The wind's breath rolled huge dust clouds up. The illimitable air was one thick haze, as with a sudden mist earth disappeared. Faces were blotted out, yet still they fought on. Each man whom so he met ruthlessly slew him, though his very friend it might be. In that turmoil none could tell who met him, friend or foe. Blind Wildermid enmeshed the host, and now had all been blent confusedly, had perished miserably all falling by their fellows' murderous swords. Had not Cronian from Olympus helped their sore strait, he swept aside the dust of conflict, he calmed those deadly winds. Yet still the host fought on, but lighter far their battle travail was, who now discerned whom in the fray to smite and whom to spare. The Danians now forced back the Trojan host, the Trojans now the Danian ranks, as swayed the dread fight to and fro. From either side darts leapt and fell like snowflakes. Far away shepherds from Ida trembling watched the strife, and to the heaven abiders lifted hands of supplication, praying that all their foes might perish, and that from woeful war Troy might win breathing space, and see at last the day of freedom. The gods hearkened not. Far other issues fate devised, nor wrecked of Zeus the Almighty, nor of none beside of the immortals, her unpitying soul cares not what doom she spinneth with her thread inevitable be it for men new-born or cities all things wax and wane through her so by her hest the battle travail swelled twixt trojan chariot lords and greeks that closed in grapple of fight they dealt each other death ruthlessly no man quelled but stout of heart fought on for courage thrust men into war but now, when many had perished in the dust, then did the Argive might prevail at last, by stern decree of Pallas, for she came into the heart of battle, hot to help the Greeks to lay waste Priam's glorious town. Then Aphrodite, who lamented sore for Paris slain, snatched suddenly away renowned Aeneas from the deadly strife, and poured thick mist about him. Fate forbade that hero any longer to contend with Argive foes without the high-built wall. Yea, and his mother sorely feared the wrath of Pallas, passing wise, whose heart was keen to help the Danians now. Yea, feared lest she might slay him, even beyond his doom, who spared not Ares' self, a mightier far than he. No more the Trojans now abode the edge of fight, but all disheartened backward drew. For like fierce ravening beasts the Argive men leapt on them, mad with murderous rage of war, Choked with their slain the river channels were. Heaped was the field, in red dust thousands fell. Horses and men, and chariots overturned, were strewn there. Blood was streaming all around like rain, for deadly doom raised through the fray. Men stabbed with swords, and men impaled on spears lay confusedly, like scattered beams, when on the strand of low thundering sea men from great girders of a tall ship's hull strike out with bolts and clamps, and scatter wide long planks and timbers, till the whole broad beach is paved with beams, or plashed with darkling surge. So lay in dust and blood those slaughtered men, 
rapture in pain of fight forgotten now. A remnant from the piteous strife escaped, entered their stronghold, scarce eluding doom. Children and wives from their limbs blood besprent received their arms bedabbed with foul gore, and baths for all were heated. Leeches ran through all the town in hot haste to the homes of wounded men to minister to their hurts. Here wives and daughters moaned round men come back from war. There cried on many who came not here. Here men stung to the soul by bitter pangs groaned upon beds of pain. There toil-spent men turned them to suffer. Whinnied the swift steeds and neighed or mangers heaped. By tent and ships far off the Greeks did even as they of Troy. When o'er the streams of ocean dawn drove up with her splendor flashing steeds, and earth's tribes waked, then the strong Argives' battle-eager sons marched against Priam's city lofty towered. Save some that mid the tents by wounded men tarried, lest haply raiders on the ships might fall to help the Trojans, while these fought the foe from towers, while rose the flame of war. Before the Scaean gate fought Capaeasius' son, and godlike Diogenes, high above the Iphibus battle staunch, and strong Politus, with many comrades, stealthily held them back with arrows and huge stones. Clanged evermore the smitten helms and shield that fenced strong men from bitter doom and unrelenting fate. Before the gate, I day and Achilles' son set in array the fight. Around him toiled his host of battle cunning Myrmidons. Helenus and Agenor, gallant souled, down hailing darts against them held the wall, I cheering on their men. No spurring these needed to fight hard for their country's walls. Odysseus and Eurypylus made assault unresting on the gates that faced the plain and looked to the swift ships. From wall and tower with huge stones brave Aeneas made defense. In battle stressed by Samoas, Tursa toiled. Each endured hardness at his several post. Then round war wise Odysseus' men renowned, by that great captain's battle-cunning ruled, locked shields together, raised them o'er their heads, ranged side by side, that many were made of one. Thou hadst said it was a great hall, solid roof, which no tempestuous wind blast misty wet can pierce, nor rain from heaven in torrents poured. So fenced about with shields firm stood the ranks of Argives, one in heart for fight, and one in that array close welded. From above, the Trojans hailed great stones, as from a rock rolled these to earth. Full many a spear and dart, and galling javelin in the pierced shield stood. Some in earth stood, many glanced away, with bent points falling, baffled from the shields, battered on all sides. But that clangorous din none feared, none flinched, as pattering drops of rain they heard it. Upon the rampart's foot they marched, none hung back, Shoulder to shoulder on they came, like a long lurid cloud that o'er the sky Cronian trails in wild midwinter tide. On that battalion moved with thunderous tread of tramping feet. A little above the earth rose up the dust. The breeze swept it aside, drifting away behind the men. There went a sound confused of voices with them, like the hum of bees that murmur round the hives and multitudinous panting and the gasping of men hard breathing exceedingly glad the sons of atreus glorying in them saw that wall unwavering of doom denouncing war in one tense mass against the city gate they hurled themselves with tribills strove to breach the long walls from their hinges to upheave the gates and dash to earth the pulse of hope beat strong in those proud hearts but naught availed targes nor levers when Aeneas might swung in his hands a stone like a thunderbolt, hurled it with uttermost strength, and dashed to death all whom caught it beneath the shields, as when a mountain's precipice edge breaks off and falls on pasturing goats, and all that graze thereby tremble. So were those Danians dazed with dread. Stone after stone he hurled on the reeling ranks, as when amid the hills Olympian Zeus with thunderbolts and blazing lightning rends from their foundations crags that rim up peak. This way and that he sends them hurtling down, then flocks tremble, scattering in wild flight. So quell the Achaeans when Aeneas dashed to sudden fragments all that battle wall, 
moulded of adamant shields, because a god gave more than human strength. No man of them could lift his eyes unto him in that fight, because the arms that lapped his sinewy limbs flashed like heaven-born lightnings. At his side stood all his form divine in darkness cloaked, Ares the Terrible, and winged the flight of what bare down to the Argive's tomb or tread. He fought as when Olympian Zeus himself from heaven in wrath smote down the insolent bands of giants grim, and shook the boundless earth and sea, and ocean and heavens, when reeled the knees of Atlas neath the rush of Zeus. So crumbled down neath Aeneas' bolts the Argive squadrons. All along the wall, wroth with foemen, rushed he. From his hands, whatso he lighted on in onset haste, hurled he. For many a battle-slaying bolt lay on the walls of those staunch darting men. With such Aeneas stormed in giant might, with such drave back the thronging foes. All round the Trojans played the men. Sore travail in pain had folk round the city. Many fell, Argives and Trojans, rang the battle cries. Aeneas cheered the war feigned Trojans on to fight for home, for wives, and their own souls with good heart. War staunch Achilles' son shouted, Flinch not ye Argives from the walls till Troy be taken and sink down in flames. And round these twain an awful measureless roar rang day long as they fought. No breathing space came from the war to them whose spirits burned. These to smite Ilium, those to guard her safe. But from Aeneas valiant soul the far fought Aeas, speeding midst the men of Troy, winged death. For now his arrows straight through air flew, now his deadly dart, and smote them down, one after one. Yet others cowered away before his peerless prowess, and abode the fight no more, but fenceless left the wall. Then one of all the Locrians the mightiest, fierce-souled Alcimedon, trusting in his prince and his own might and valor of his youth, all battle-eager on a ladder set swift feet, to pay for friends a death-strewn path into the town. Above his head he raised the screening shield. Up that dread path he went, hardening his heart from trembling, in his hand now shook the threatening spear, now upward climbed, Fast high in air he trod the perilous way. Now on the Trojans had disaster come. But even as above the parapet his head rose, and for the first time, and the last from her high rampart, he looked down on Troy, and he asked, who had marked, albeit from afar, that bold assault rushed on him, dashed on his head so huge a stone that that hero's mighty strength shattered the ladder. Down from on high he rushed as arrow from the string, Death followed him as whirling round he fell. With air was blent his lost life ere he crashed through the stony ground. Strong spear, broad shield, in mid-fall flew from his hands, and from his head the helm. His corslet came alone with him to earth. The Locrian men groaned, seeing their champion quelled by evil doom, for all his hair and all the stones around were blood bespattered, all his bones were crushed, and his once active limbs besprent with gore. Then godlike Peoeus' war triumphed son marked where Aeneas stormed along the wall in lion-like strength, and straightway shot a shaft aimed at that glorious hero, neither missed the man. Yet not through his unyielding targe to that fair-fleshed one, being turned aside by Cytheria and the shield, but grazed the buckler lightly. Yet not all in vain fell earthward, but between the targe and helm smote Medon. From the tower he fell, as falls a wild goat from a crag, the hunter's shaft deep in his heart. So nerveless flung he fell, and fled away from him the precious life. Wrought for his friend, a stone Aeneas hurled, and Philoctetes' stalwart comrade slew, Toactimus. For he shattered his head, and crushed helmet and skull bones and his noble heart was stilled. Loud shouted princely Peoeus' son, Aeneas, thou forsooth dost deem thyself a mighty champion, fighting from a tower, whence craven women war with foes. If now thou be a man, come forth without the wall in battle harness, and so learn to know in spearcraft and in bowcraft Peoeus' son. So cried he, 
but Anchises' valiant seed, how fain soe'er, not answered, for the stress and desperate conflict round that wall and burg ceaselessly raging. Pause from fight was none. Yea, for a long time no respite hath there been for the war-weary from that endless toil. End of chapter 11